<clears throat> it's 10 o'clock, Chris, so whenever you're... We're live now. Good morning. Welcome to the Gambling Harms Topic Group of Hertfordshire County Council. Uh, because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, this meeting is being held electronically. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Uh, members of this meeting are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak, and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking, and to indicate a wish to speak, members should request to do so using the chat function rather than the hand function. Officers and witnesses in attendance will keep their cameras and microphones switched off unless called to speak. And there are breaks which will be incorporated in the meeting as appropriate. It's a very tight timetable, but I will try and stick to it as closely as I can. Um, item one is appointment of chairman. Just to note that I, Chris White, uh, a county councillor, have been appointed chairman of the topic group for the duration of its work, including particularly today. If I can ask the other members of the topic group to introduce themselves now, please. Just nip in. Uh, good morning, now I'm County Councillor Nigel Bell, uh, representing West Watford. Thank you. Um. I'm Maureen Mackay and I'm uh, from Stevenage Borough Council. County Councillor D Hart, I represent uh, the Wolfham Cross Division Borough of Broxbourne. Thank you. Uh, Jan Madden, uh, County Councillor for Hemel Hempstead South East. And is that all? Okay, good. Um, do we have any apologies? There are no apologies, Chris. Okay. Um, and in terms of the management of today's meeting, uh, this is a councillor led activity. All questions will be raised by the members, the councillors. Um, and um, it's important that questions and responses align with key lines of inquiry on the scope. And Natalie will remind us of these shortly. It's a one day scrutiny and members will take all evidence over the course of this meeting. Uh, while there is some flexibility built into the timing of the programme, it is crucial that we hear from all the witnesses and so we do need to make sure the questions and the answers are succinct. At the end of the scrutiny recommendations will be formulated and a short report will be produced. Uh, the implementation of the recommendations will be monitored by a county council body known as the Impact of Scrutiny Subcommittee. This is a, we'll look at it in about six months time. Uh, and to assist members, the head of scrutiny will summarise the contributions and the conclusions reached by members after the input from witnesses during the programme. Uh, this is a public scrutiny, uh, and so any evidence provided will be available to the public. Issues of a confidential nature, casework for instance, uh, should be framed to protect a patient or client's anonymity. Um, okay, uh, again, cameras off if you're not um, speaking at the moment, we'll be grateful. Um, I will proceed on the basis that members have read all the papers, including particularly item two, uh, the work of a topic group, all reasonably experienced anyway. Um, so um, now moving to agenda item three, uh, the remit of the topic group is where I bring in uh, the key officer for scrutiny, Natalie Rotherham, head of scrutiny. So if I just quickly take people through um, the objectives of the scrutiny, um, just, to, just to ensure that um, the, the focus is very clear, because as Chris has already said, there is an awful lot to cover today. So it's really important that we're able to make maximum use of time. So the objectives are to identify how partners in Hertfordshire are working to address gambling harms and to formulate cross-sector cross -sector solutions to collect, to, to address, um, ta ta oh, sorry, losing my place here, to uh, cross sector solutions to collectively tackle gambling harms. And there were three elements to the objectives. So, um, and this is 
one of the priorities for today's scrutiny is to assess the current Hertfordshire wide strategy, what is already um, happening, um, to undertake a scrutiny that sets out how a sector wide approach to tackling gambling harms uh, and the, can be improved in the future, and to formulate a set of uh, uh, draft local actions that all key stakeholders are involved with and responsible for. So, in pursuit of that, the members' three key lines of inquiries. Uh, that they will be uh, asking of witnesses is what opportunities and barriers currently exist that can help or hinder the local authority to influence the reduction of gambling harms? What is the contribution of partners, that's local authorities, NHS, police, etc., to reduce gambling harms? And the third key line of inquiry is how effective is the partnership working in Hertfordshire across organisations to tackle heart gambling harms at the moment? And the impact or outcome of the scrutiny that members will be seeking is that there is a buy into an agreed multi agency approach and plan to address gambling harm in Hertfordshire with measurable miles, milestones um, so, and those impacts are in place. Um, that, that's me concluded, uh, Chris. OK, and I've got um, Ed Hammond down as, as, as um, an introducer. Um, rather than as a witness at this particular point. So Ed is from the um, Centre for Governance and Scrutiny. And uh, this um, uh, topic group is, is partly their suggestion. So w welcome, Ed. I've um, been working with you in a completely different and unrelated um, capacity uh, throughout last year. So good to see you in this capacity. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I, I'm the Acting Chief Executive of the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny. We are um, currently carrying out a, um, a, a piece of work funded by the Gambling Commission, um, which is seeking to investigate the opportunities for overview and scrutiny functions in local authorities to investigate and provide solutions on uh, gambling harm. Uh, as part of that, we're uh, preparing some practical guidance for local authorities, which is informed by the experience of a number of a number of councils, which are conducting these kinds of inquiry days at the moment. Uh, that report is going to be published in the next couple of months, um, and uh, I'm here principally today to uh, observe um, uh, as, as part of that research. Thank you very much. Um, OK, I think we can move straight on to witnesses because um, this may be the last time which we make up time. Uh, the first witness I uh, have in front of me is uh, Maurice Bright. Uh, Maurice has a number of capacities in Hertfordshire, but uh, he's with us today particularly as the Executive Member uh, for Community Protection and Public Health, uh, as well as Deputy Leader of the County Council. So welcome, Maurice. Uh, we'll, we'll allocate you five minutes or so, and then there may be questions from the panel. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chris, uh, and as well as those roles, I previously was the uh, vice chairman of the Safer and Stronger Communities panel at the Local Government Association, uh, and I gave evidence to the cross-party parliamentary group in relation to the damage being caused by the fixed odds betting terminals. You may have heard about that at the time, that we're in betting shops, uh, and we um, managed to affect change. Very important to say, first of all, that I personally am not against gambling. Uh, I'm not anti-gambling. Um, but the evidence that's set out in the recent Public Health England report, uh, the Director of Public Health summary report for this, this scrutiny and the initial Hertfordshire needs assessment suggests that whilst around 40% of Hertfordshire residents have gambled in recent times and that while many and the majority, the vast majority do so safely, that are just under 5,000 or around half a percent of our population reach the threshold of what sh what's known as problem gambling, where it causes disruption or harm to them, uh, their family or their lives or, and their lives. Uh, that's 35,870 residents or so, or, th or just under 4% of the population could be at risk at negative consequences of gambling. Now, those uh, estimates are in line with national estimates, but as a county, we do want people to be able to gamble safely uh, and without harm and to get help when they need it. Um, and the harm costs a great deal to society, both financially and in terms of emotions, emotional and physical stress uh, and health care as well. Now, whilst it tends to be concentrated uh, in areas of high deprivation, gambling problems do exist across all strata and levels of society. But the data shows, though, that if you have a gambling problem, you're clearly more likely to be drinking harmfully as well. 
you may have some depression um, or other uh, health, mental health issues. We also know that the impacts on families where one member has problems with gambling often means debt, uh, relationship problems, mental health problems, loss of employment, safeguarding, referrals and so on. There is an enormous avoidable cost to people uh, and to the public purse. So preventing harm where possible and intervening early needs to be a key aim for us. Along with ensuring people can get support for mental health, for debt, for alcohol or other issues as part of enabling them to be as healthy and independent as possible. As we continue to work through and hopefully exit this pandemic, I have several key public health priorities in mind. The application of public health approaches to key societal problems, which harm is one of these. And I say this for two reasons. There's been a rise in people being harmed from alcohol, from drugs, mental health and gambling, which started before the pandemic. All of these issues have complex factors behind them, and all of them are situations where some people are fine and others are not. Equally, all of them are situations where the harms happen not just to the person, but to others like families, other halves, spouses, children, as well as the wider picture of the economy too. We as a county are very good at uh, taking public health system-wide approaches. Our tobacco work and our drug and alcohol work are very good examples of that. And the strong partnership between public health and community safety is another. That's one of the reasons we've put the two together now uh, under one cabinet portfolio. We can and we should continue that. So I want a public health approach to gambling harm. For me, the key elements of a public health approach are understanding the multiple ways gambling or any issue affects our residents, identifying how we prevent harm, and identifying which agencies should do what. The benefits of this scrutiny is that it will, one, help us to quantify our problem, two, help understand the causal factors and the interventions which can prevent harm, three, share good practice from other areas, four, put these sets of perspectives uh, together to identify what good looks like in Hertfordshire so we can get on and deliver it. And within that, how do we regulate for safety? What does this mean about the proliferation of gambling shops on our high streets and so on? And how do we help people getting into problems with online gambling? District and borough councils have important regulatory and policy roles and also benefit roles. Voluntary agencies, the NHS, public health have important treatment and support roles. My ambition is that the best of these are combined, but most importantly, I want policies that stop people getting into problem gambling in the first place where possible. The national regulatory and policy framework isn't perfect. It feels fragmented, but we do need to do what we can locally while lobbying for greater join up at all levels. And I hope scrutiny will help us identify what good it looks like and what actions we need to take. We want to be a county where everyone thrives in terms of health and in terms of economic well-being. Healthy and sustainable economies need healthy people. People being harmed cannot be sustained because the harm to them stops thriving and costs us and it costs them. Nobody wants to stop people enjoying their gambling. We should only want people to be able to do it safely. So finally, Mr Chairman, reviewing local policies and creating a framework for a system-wide response are two of the things that need to come out of this scrutiny. But helping us achieve our ambition for everyone and our economy to thrive sustainably needs to be a goal to which a response to gambling must contribute. Uh, thank you. Those are my opening comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Nigel Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and and thanks, Morris, to um, you know that well comprehensive um, argument and and presentation. Actually, I was I put my question in early, and then you've gone through a lot of things. But I just wanted to say looking at our first key line of inquiry, what would you think as council leader in all your experience on this subject is maybe the main barrier that you think that that is kind of preventing us coming together or getting the best outcome here? Do you think there's one main thing that should, should come out of this or that you have noticed as as a council leader on what you've done that, that could, we could speak away? I think it's it's less as a council leader, perhaps more as, a, as the cabinet member, but also a, as a councillor and 
uh, as a resident. I think the issues we're facing now um, is is around the physical, uh, the physicality of where people gamble. So um, yes, there were the major concerns around fixed odds betting terminals in the high street betting shops. The effect that could have on people if they lost large sums as they left and on, on, on other people, but as well as, their, well as their families. But you will know as well as I did that we are now being bombarded by advertisements for a gambling, whether that be on uh, on shows on television, uh, a peak period, uh, like help, help I'm a Celeb to get me out of here. The apps that they want, uh, they encourage people to use, including young people uh, to vote on, have also got gambling adverts on. Yeah. And, and a lot of the uh, the apps for football scores and everything have got that too. The problem is it's going virtual, it's going, uh, it's going online. And yeah. that causes a hidden problem with, 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 with personal debt gambling. And I know two people um, who've had that. Uh, and one of them sadly ended up in prison after, um, after losing vast sums of money from online gambling that mm -hmm. no one even knew they were doing. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks Morris, you said uh, right at the top that you're not anti-gambling, uh, and then you went through uh, yes. a, a lot of a lot of um, uh, persuasive issues that are of concern to you and no doubt to others. Um, one of the tensions that we have in, in looking at this is between uh, an approach at one end, I guess, of the spectrum, mm -hmm. saying, "Look, it, it's it's a few vulnerable people who we need somehow to protect and treat." And at the other end of the spectrum, that this is actually potentially threatening to any of us. Well, where are you on that uh, uh, spectrum, if, if that is actually even a valid way of looking at it? I'm not sh It's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, no, I'm not, I, I, I don't drink, but I'm not anti-alcohol mm. um, I, 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 for the same reasons. Um, very, very much, in fact, that often it was the only way to keep um, relatives in the house happy, making sure we had some in the house. But I don't actually drink myself. Um, and it's the same with gambling. Occasionally, I'll have a go on the lottery. It's about there are naturally people who have who are, who are compulsive um, by inclination. It's not necessarily their fault. It might ju it's just their character. They get compulsive, which whatever they do, whether they do alcohol, whether they do drugs, whatever they're introduced to that gives them a buzz. And and gambling is one of those things. And I say, look at the figures. You're talking about half a percent of the population. Would you stop all gambling because half a percent have an issue? Or do you say, how can we assist those half people, half a percent of people in advance or if they've started to get off and to help them. Same with drugs. Obviously, drugs is not is not uh, officially uh, allowed. But as I say, alcohol is the same thing. I, I don't want to be a person that says we should stop everything. I mean, in fairness, it's the same thing with, 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 with some might say around obesity and about sugar cravings and food cravings. You can't stop everything, um, but you can find ways of assisting and, in, and, and, and interjecting and helping uh, and making sure people have the help they need. So, uh, no, I'm not against gambling. Um, if people want to go and have a good time and enjoy themselves, that's fine. But unfortunately, there are too many that that, that have an issue and it rolls on. It's not in it. That individual is not in themselves at half a percent. It's a knock on effect to families and other people uh, and jobs and so on that, that troubled yeah. me. And that's where I think there needs to be some help. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I'm not in the half percent, uh, but I do drink. Um, and I'm conscious talking to my doctor that that, that that could be on, always on a slippery slope. I mean, ask very alarming questions by my doctors about whether I remember what I did yesterday type thing. And as I said, no, I've never had that problem, thankfully. Uh, but it has other harmful effects. Um, so in a way, our, our policy towards alcohol is to protect everybody from going down the slippery slope. Is that is that what you would see as the right policy for gambling? Is to no. Make sure no, no, because okay. because because you say protecting them going down the slippery slope, but it doesn't say stop drinking. Yeah. You're still okay. drinking because if you want to protect you don't, that what we're saying is, look, the vast majority we know are OK. Um, it's identifying people that may have that type of behaviour um, and that can be done yeah. through with GPs and on their own admission. And it's all very well these adverts saying, well, you can set your own limits, etc. But that's very odd for someone. It's a bit like an alcoholic saying, there you go, got 12 bottles, decide how much you want to drink. You can't say set your own your own limits because if you're if you're compulsive, you won't want to set a limit in case you're losing, you'll want to keep going. And, okay. and the difference is a lot of people who gamble, gamble to lose, even when they're winning, um, the stats will tell you, the vast majority of people who gamble are up um, in the first few minutes of gambling, but they haven't had the buzz. And so yeah. they keep going until they lose. So there's a different, I think there's a different psychology, but it's still obsessive behaviour um, mm -hmm. is, is what we need to be looking out for. Okay, D Hart. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, Maurice, do you think um, 
going by what you've just spoken about, um, do you think the best way forward would be to see a limit on betting shops opening hours, a ban on gambling companies giving away free spins and bets, which encourage gambling and maybe increase powers for the Gambling Commission going forward? There's a very good question. And there's a few actually within that. The proliferation of betting shops, I actually believe that it's hit its maximum. And if anything, it will start to go down. And that's because of now our online gambling, which is taking over. Um, you could try and, and, and close a betting shop, but all you'd ha have is the person going and having a bet on that particular football match or that particular tennis game from another country, they go online to do it. It's very sophisticated now. You can bet on literally quite anything. You can bet on one service of one tennis match uh, in another country saying uh, it, that it's that quick. So I'm not entirely convinced about that. I do think uh, uh, that giving away free spins uh, and I do think the uh, offers, some of the outrageous offers that are given, if if Arsenal score in the first 10 minutes, we give you 10 to 1, which is quite obvious not what the odds are, but it's trying to attract you in. I don't think that that's, that's healthy. I don't think that you should, I think you should play the same odds, say on a roulette wheel, say you've got 36 to 1 or whatever it is. Um, it should be the same odds. It shouldn't be, if you come and play roulette now and you get the first, we'll give you 70 to 1, because I think that's trying to entice people in. And I, and I think for those people who might be in inclined to take it over the top they would be very quick to do that so um I, as i said i think for me the biggest fear is less about gambling shops now uh particularly as they've got cameras and security and then people and more about what people do online and the proliferation of online gambling and advertisements oh, that's 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 very important thank you thank you um right i'm going to take jan madden to ask the last question to tomorrow's because we're already needing to move on jan Oh, thank you. Um, just just to recap, really, um, Morris, you, uh, I, I just want you to um, repeat something that you said, if that's all right. Um, you said something about 4% of the population. Was that that you were saying that 4% that of the population is at risk of gambling harm? No, it's 4% could be. In other words, it's half a percent who are. Uh, which is about four th just under 5,000 people, but 4% could be uh, as a consequence either of of their own there, there's some people who haven't got an addiction but could be could move towards addiction um, uh, and or people who are affected as a consequence of the people who have got the gambling harm. So the father that, or the mother, whoever it is that comes in, has just spent the weekly salary uh, in a betting shop and there's no food and there's anger, the shouting, the screaming and that kind of stuff. So those are the people we need to look at. And very briefly before I finish, let's remember that the fixed odds betting terminals were allowing people to put £100 down on a spin, one spin, and they could do three spins a minute. Right, you're talking about three hundred yeah. pounds. You could lose in a minute. That went down eventually to two pounds. So, so there can be work that can be done that allows people to continue gambling, but we, but takes away some of the big scares that could cause the major problems. Can't do it on our own, but I'm I'm really grateful that Hertfordshire are doing this. I think we could lead by example, and anything I can do to assist uh, in the future as well, I'd be delighted to do. So, I'd like to thank this scrutiny uh, topic group because I think it can be a lot of good done here for our people. Thank well, um, I'd like to uh, thank you. Uh, for coming along and being a witness um, and, uh, and have a profitable and no doubt busy day. And um, we'll move yes, on to the next meeting at the LGA today. Thanks, yeah. I can't <laughs> stay too long, sorry. All right then. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, we've now got uh, three witnesses, um, Steve Watts, Anna Hemmings and Ronnie Ajay. Um, and what I'm going to do is going to take them all to, uh, one after the other in, in the order I've just specified. They get five minutes each and then uh, won't take questions until they've all spoken. So in each case, I'd uh, like obviously to uh, introduce yourself and indeed your organisation and uh, uh, who is behind it, what's behind it and so forth, and then speak for five minutes and then I'll nudge on to the next one once you've done it. So starting with Steve. Welcome, Steve. Hi, yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor White. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting us on today and uh, just to come in and share our story, our experience and, and what GAMFAM's about. But just before I start, I'd just like to sort of just pick up on that. You know, I'm not anti-gambling. Um, I run a charity called GAMFAM, but I'm not anti-gambling. I've in the past um, enjoyed a bet um, myself. Um, but when I see the figure that, you know, 5% of uh, people provide 60% of profit for, for gambling operators, and then if you take it online, that 5% becomes 80%. I'm, you know, I'm not anti-gambling, I am anti-gambling harms, is what I would say. And I think there are things that, that the gambling industry and, and the Gambling Commission and those uh, those involved, the stakeholders, need to address. But again, that's a, that's a different um, discussion. So a bit about me. My name is Steve Watts. I'm the founder of a, a charity called GAMFAM. 
Uh, we've been a charity since September 2020. Um, I set that up following my son's um, battle with a gambling disorder. And uh, previous to that, I worked in education for uh, for 20 years and the last eight years as a deputy head teacher in a secondary school in Essex. Uh, and during that time, I was also head of sixth form. Uh, and during my time in education, um, we never ever did anything in terms of having gambling arms on our curriculum, in our PSHE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, delighted to say that as of today, my son is uh, now almost three years in recovery. He went from excessive gamer, so he was uh, played a lot of uh, online games when he was uh, in, his, in his younger years, and that pro progressed to uh, uh, an aggressive online gambling addiction. I guess at 16, when he came to me and asked me about how football accumulators worked, well, I thought he'd be a chip off the old block. And uh, he had a, a sort of a, a passion of football and thought he understood what was going on. I think I even put his first bet on for him, £5 for a, a five or six team football accumulator, which won £40 or £50. Pound, and I guess he thought that it was uh, that was a, a easy money for him. As parents, we were aware of the dangers of things such as tobacco, drugs and alcohol, but never had any idea that gambling could be so harmful to, to our family. So my son, he went from low stakes football betting to high stakes online casinos and slots. His particular game uh, was roulette. He, he played the highly addictive, addictive slots, virtuals in play and, and also the fob tees in, in the betting shops as well. So our journey, um, when my son, you know, when we realised we lived with it for probably three or four years, when we, when we realised um, that it, it was an issue, um, we had nowhere, no idea where to go, who to speak to, and we went to the probably the traditional frontline services. We went to the doctors. He was prescribed tablets for anxiety. We had the uh, unfortunate need to call the police out on three or four occasions, um, and whilst they were great when they when they arrived at our house, there was there was no no further support apart from just making sure he was safe and we were safe. Uh, it would have been fantastic if they could have signposted us to some organisations. I'm not saying that would have solved our problems, but it might have helped us join up the dots a little bit quicker. We went to Citizens Advice, spoke to a lovely gentleman there, but all he was able to do was give me a, a leaflet on debt management. And my son had counselling. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the person he went to with counselling was a drug and alcohol um, expert and had no real expertise in gambling. So for us, it wasn't until we went to Gammonon, uh, which is the, the family uh, version of, of GEA and spoke to like minded people that we started to have a better understanding of, of what gambling harms was. And that peer support is something that has, has saved our lives and saved our family. And that's something we'd be forever grateful for. Interestingly, uh, for every Gammonon um, in the UK, there's four to five GAs. So for, for, for the gamblers and for and as um, as Morris said earlier, there's a lot more people that are affected by gambling. They say that there's a, at least six to ten people affected uh, by somebody else's gambling. So you'd think there would be more gammonons than there are GAs, but that's just not the case. And for those people, those people affected by someone else's gambling, affected others, there isn't any support out there, we felt, apart from gammonon for us. So with my uh, education background, I started visiting schools, talking to parents and carers about the uh, the subject of gaming and gambling harms, very much on the 10 things to look for, 10 things to do approach. And in the background, I started to write uh, a peer support program called GRASP, the GAM Fan Recovery and Support Program, a five stage peer support program. And the plan was that we would deliver that in our local areas of Essex and Suffolk. And um, and, and and that that was our plan. But then COVID struck in March 2020. so stopped going into schools. Uh, no one wanted me to come into their school during that time. And obviously our face to face meetings um, had to be abandoned. So we had a bit of a light bulb moment and we moved our groups online. Um, we set up a pilot group for working online uh, and, and it's just it's just gone from strength to strength from there. We now work with about 100 um, families now um, offering that peer support, that sort of a medium to long term support beyond initial counselling and therapy. Um, we started as an affected others group um, and we were working with parents, uh, partners, um, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. But we then noticed that uh, their, their loved ones were not accessing, accessing any support. So we're now delighted to say that we now run uh, groups for gamblers in recovery, too. Um, and we've got plans to set up a women's program um, going going forward. So. I would love to come back if there's a chance to, to present our GRASP program in more detail. Obviously, today is not the day, but but why does peer support work for us? Um, 
for, for us, once you've had your, your initial six to eight sessions of counselling, it's that longer term support that people need, particularly families as well. Um, and, and why does it work? Well, it gives you that safe space where you can you can talk to people who understand what you've gone through. It gives you hope. You see people further down the line in their recovery. You can get some practical help, information, advice from one another. Um, when you talk, it, it, you're not judged in anything that you say. And I think probably the thing that really, really is, is that empathy that you get from one another. Talking to people who truly understand what you're going through, uh, rather than that insincere, insincere sympathy that you get. And someone a lot wiser than me said when we first started going to our, our support groups, give it up one night a week gives you six, what, six nights back. So when my son was gambling, we had no nights. Our whole world was chaotic. We was, we was arguing, we were resentful, we was angry. We never really understood what he was going through. And it's only now, probably took me a year to realise and, and have that genuine empathy for what he was going through um, and, and how he would become addicted to, to online slots, online casinos. Um, and it, and it means that you don't have to talk about it every minute of every single day. So you can come onto your group and you can um, you can get the support. Gamma Fam is also, I don't know how I'm doing for time, Councillor. Uh, right? uh, really just about another minute, I think. Yeah, another then, minute. Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up quickly then. Yeah. Um, at Gamma Fam, we're also working at the moment just uh, um, with Greater Manchester Combined Authorities, um, along with another charity called Gamlan, and we're coordinating the lived experience uh, network group. Um, and I'm just sort of, you know, Delighted that, um, that Natalie contacted us to, to be part of this and delighted that, you know, Hertfordshire County Council are asking uh, lived experience to be at the part, heart of what you're doing. And I would suggest to, to anyone, any stakeholders today that, um, you know, please do involve lived experience in any of the decisions that you make, because our lived experience can help support others and hopefully that our journeys haven't been in vain. Thank you very much indeed. Anna Hemmings. Hi there, thanks very much for inviting me today. Um, I've got you, you, you're slightly, I don't know, maybe, to, oh, that's better, yeah. There we go. Um, I've got a couple of slides that I can share if, uh, if that's useful for people, but if not, I can just uh, talk. Do you have a preference? Um, generally speaking, we uh, prefer all uh, slides to be made available beforehand. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so if you could just talk. <laughs> no worries. So um, my name is Anna Hemmings. I'm the Chief Executive of GAMCARE and uh, we're the largest national charity working um, to reduce gambling harms through the provision of a range of services, which I'll touch on. Um, I was going to just touch on prevalence, but um, we've covered that um, somewhat earlier. So um, just to recap, prevalence in, in the UK is around 0.5% of the population have a gambling issue, which is around 350,000 people. Um, there are a range of studies though, and there are some other studies, for example, by GamblerWare that would place um, at risk and problem gambling at a slightly higher level than the public health um, research. So, um, although 0.5% sounds small, it's still a large number of people that are harmed by gambling, particularly when you take into account that, as Steve said, um, between 6 and 10 people around the gambler will also be impacted. So. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the services that GAMCARE offers and um, many of these are available free of charge to Hertfordshire residents so we'd really encourage you to be um, promoting and making the most of these services wherever possible. At GAMCARE we deliver our services um, in three main ways, so we deliver support and treatment, we deliver education and outreach programmes and we deliver um, training and standing, standard setting with, with relevant sectors. So on the help and support side, we deliver the National Gambling Helpline, which operates 24 hours a day, year round, on voice and live chat. And that's been really um, important. We, we used to uh, not quite be 24 hours, but the thing that we were aiming for was to match the availability of gambling. And of course, with online gambling, that is also available 24 hours a day. The helpline gets over 40,000 calls a year. Um, and we respond to callers as they present, and um, that might be it's mostly gamblers that phone, but also affected others can phone the helpline too and get advice and support about how to support their loved one. Um, if needed, the helpline will refer people on to treatment, and many people do want further support. So um, we deliver treatment around the country in, in 
many locations, over 160 locations. Some of those are in Hertfordshire and treatment is available locally. Treatment is sort of counselling style. It's informed by cognitive behavioural therapy, which is, has the best evidence base around treatment. And we see around 10,000 people a year in our treatment services. Other things that are available locally are some of our education and outreach programmes. So we do lots of work with young people in schools to deliver um, education sessions to them to make them aware. As Steve was saying earlier, lots of people aren't aware that gambling can be an issue, whether that's young people or parents. It doesn't seem to have the same parity as other risky issues like um, smoking or drug use. So we do lots of work in schools. We do lots of work with um, particular groups like uh, women, for example, lots of work around financial harms connected to gambling. So many of those are, are available in Hertfordshire as well. Um, the, the biggest impact we see of gambling on people's lives is, falls into three main areas. One is financial harms, which affects around three quarters of people we talk to. The other is relationship impacts. You know, that, the, the fallout for families, as Steve was touching on, is, is huge and people around the gambler are, are massively impacted. So about two thirds of people we speak to um, have those relationship impacts. And then the impact on mental health and well-being as well, um, which are also significant. So we, we're working really hard to, to address that with people, to give people the support they need and to do that in a range of ways. So alongside the helpline and treatment, we've got lots of online resources as well that people can use. We've got forums, chat rooms, um, self-help workbooks and so on that are all available via our website. So in terms of um, local information, about 9% of callers to the helpline are from, um, were from the east of England in 2020-21. And we are available, on, uh, we can on request provide more specific data for Hertfordshire on the number of callers, the number of people in treatment. We've got treatment um, available, services available. I mean, obviously everything's online at the moment, but when, when we're back face to face, we've got treatment locations in St Albans and Hitchin. Um, and then also um, nearby Milton Keynes, Dunstable and Luton. We've also worked in Hertfordshire to deliver an end-to-end -end piece of work in the criminal justice system focused on gambling. Um, the Police and Crime Commissioner David Lloyd uh, very kindly funded a couple of years of work for us to work um, across the criminal justice system and, and uh, our lead on that will present more information on it later. But that gave us some particular insights into um, how to develop services locally and what the need is as well, which is really interesting. Um, there is also local available information from our funder Gamble Aware. They have um, prevalence maps uh, available so you can look at specifically at the prevalence in Hertfordshire and the demand for treatment and that can also help in you know, planning out services. So I'll leave it there for now. I know we're short of time today, but happy yeah. to take any questions. Just very briefly, you're um, principally funded by the industry? We're principally funded through Gamble Aware, and Gamble Aware um, collect up donations, if you like, from the, from the gambling industry. That is the approved way of funding the majority of services at the moment. Um, there is not other funding available. There's no statutory funding available for gambling, apart from a very small investment in, in two different NHS services, one in London and, and one in the north of England. Um, so uh, it, it's a sort of, a, a, you know, a, a removed relationship in the sense that the funding is via Gamble Aware. But yes, it is an expectation of the gambling industry that they provide funding for services like ours. Thank you. Um, Ronnie Ajay. Hi everyone, uh, thank, thank you uh, for the invitation and um, just really pleased to be here and really pleased with what I'm hearing um, so far. Um, so I um, I think um, like Anna, I had a few slides, but I will just quickly uh, just run through a few, some of the key points uh, from my slides. And also I would like to focus uh, as a point of differentiation um, on the back of what Steve has said or what Anna has said, I thought it would be helpful for this panel, if I spoke to you about one of the projects we're working on, um, which really focuses on uh, uh, um, minority groups, really. Um, and um, what is really significant about this is that um, these groups, particularly the South Asian groups, the Black and African community, they are not reflected in a lot of the data that has been um, presented so far to you. Um, and I can confidently say that. So we are currently we currently got a project running um, 
in ARA. So I'm, my name is Ronnie and I work for ARA and we're based in Southwest Wales and, and also Cornwall. And we uh, partnered with um, a, 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 another um, gambling, um, uh, what you call it, um, agency in um, Liverpool called Beacon. And what we decided to do was really to really focus, um, have a project that focused on minority groups and also try to understand um, the harms experienced by these groups, because these are groups that do not and will not come forward for help. And that's why they are not reflected in the data. So what happened was we obviously this was actually birthed out of a, again, um, Steve uh, highlighted the significance of lived experience groups. This case was birthed out of um, our lived experience groups and we, where we realize there was a whole proportion, a whole population out there of people that was experiencing significant gambling harms, but really struggled to come forward. Why? Because of cultural sensitivities, because of the stigma and shame that surrounds um, um, gambling and um, they and it, so it was a real deal a real issue for them to come forward and so what we decided to do was we decided to um, identify uh, identify culturally appropriate early intervention pathways and to build trust in these communities to have a presence in these communities attend a lot of the culturally sensitive um um, what you call it, um, events that they hold, and also uh, put our case forward. And we call this whole project Breaking the Sharam, i.e. Breaking the Shame. So what do we do? So we hold, obviously, we have small informal chats with local imams, um, but significantly what we have been doing and what we've done successfully is create focus groups. Uh, so we, um, we uh, for instance, I, I recently, I was in a, um, a military barracks um, for a mental health um, affair, and um, on the back of my presentation in this um, in, the, in this um, um, event, I ha held a small focus group and a focus group, and this was made up of men and women from minority groups, a lot of Nepalese, a lot of Bangladeshi, a lot of Africans, and what they made very very clear um, is that they, even though they all experience experiencing significant gambling harms, um, it would take a lot for them to come forward to actually receive help. And this sentiment is reflected right through, right through a lot of the communities we engage with. We, um, we um, I, I have frequented a lot of faith establishments, a lot of mosques. Um, I've I recently um, spent some time with the chair of um, Bristol Association of Mosques, and they all agree this is a significant problem. The, um, and, and it's twofold. Yes, um, the congregants and yes, the members of the communities are suffering gambling harms. But the issue is breaking that ceiling, breaking that element of shame and stigma that is attached to it. And that is what they they um, they find really challenging. And, and that is why we are quite significant. We play a significant role in the conversation. And um, so breaking the breaking the Sharam, we've called it, has been uh, is doing quite well. And um, we've we've you know, we've been invited to several um, um, events, several cultural uh, events, several religious events um, to actually put the case forward. And we're still we're still pushing that case forward and we're still trying. And lastly, I'd like to end with this um, a lot of. Um, people in minority groups, um, particularly, um, uh, what you call it, um, that we have minority groups or migrant communities see gambling I initially, they always see it as an economic opportunity. So again, I was sat in the cafe talking to a group of taxi drivers, and they 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 spoke to me about how every Friday they have this dilemma of, do I I have not earned enough this week? What do I do with what I've got in my hands? Do I take it back to the family or do I um, um, pop into the local bookies and see if I can actually increase what I've got in my hands? And it always starts off as an economic opportunity for them, particularly from uh, people um, in, from these minor, uh, migrant communities. And then they begin to um, obviously experience gambling harms. And, and the issue is not, it doesn't just stay with that, as um, Steve has said and Anna has said and I think, um, Mr. Morris said earlier on, is that it's not just them that are impacted, then their families get are impacted, then the children are impacted. So um, it's a real, it's a serious issue. And I know in Hertfordshire, you've got 
um, a vibrant, a vibrant, um, what you call a South Asian community, and and I know that this is a quite a significant um, issue in those communities. Um, uh, what is very, very evident is that how this issue is increasing exponentially. So, um, when uh, particularly in our focus groups, they they made it known to us that um, years ago it could just be the neighbour across the road or their uncle who had an issue with gambling, but these days. They have multiple um, family members, multiple people in their families, even young um, and people that are currently um, suffering gambling harms. I'll, I'll, I'll just finish with that. And if you've got any questions, I'm, pro I'm sure I can answer them. Thank you very much. Um, I will start with you, actually, Ronnie. Um, I'm intrigued by this um, reluctance to come forward issue, which you uh, emphasise very strongly. Um, I mean, what, how much of that is not actually understanding that you actually have a problem at all? Um, or is it mainly shame? And how do so, I know I've got a problem? Just let's start with that. So um, it, it's it's a complex complex answer, but it's also a simple answer. It's it's very culturally sensitive. Um, me coming forward to you, I I am Ghanaian and I'm African, and if um, I went to my local pastor and I said I have just gambled my home away, if that what I'm literally saying is I'm not I'm not it's not the shame and the um it's not just limited to me. I'm not just talking about myself, I'm talking about my family, I'm talking about my friends. And this is the line they try and hold. It is that is the stigma and shame is crippling. And it's not necessarily about not understanding that the help that is out there is putting their heads above the parapet, is making making uh, um, known to their community. It's not just an individual, it's a community that they are actually experiencing a particular problem. So they would rather sit on the issue, they would rather um, not come forward for help um, um, than um, come forward and make their um, issues and problems known to the whole. So it's not when it's issues and problems are not limited to um, um, those they talk to. They feel it's actually it opens the door to the entire community of people knowing that they've got an issue. OK, um, not, that not, makes any sense. But no, it does. It does. It's very helpful. The other issue is, is, is I mean, your, your, your last example, um, a slightly generic example, but very useful is, is the Friday night. I could actually bring her more money. And there's a couple of things one reflects on, which is, of course, the odds are all stacked against you. I can't. I think it's the national lottery. You're more likely to be struck by lightning, aren't you, uh, than the, <laughs> the national lottery. Um, um, but 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 there is obviously the, the income thing. So it, it it is when does when is there a problem? So if I were, for instance, someone who uh, did the national lottery every week and also the grand national, and that was it, I don't I don't I don't smell a problem there. But I think I think what you're describing with the the taxi drivers is they've all got a problem because they've yeah. all got that hope against experience, haven't they, or hope against life. Um, and it, it's actually knowing knowing when uh, when you have a problem. And I guess I suppose the more important question for us is what is it that councils in Hertfordshire should do and other agencies to get across the message that the thing I described formally about just doing the Grand National and the thing you described in terms of hoping every uh, every weekend you're going to improve family income. How do you know that the former is not a problem, the latter is? How do we get that message across? Is, is the work we should be doing? I, I guess um, it's um, proper representation. I think, I don't know if I, I've answered that um, properly, but um, what one of the things we found in our focus groups, and this was said in quite a few groups, this was mentioned in quite a few groups, was this, that um, um, they did not feel, um, um, what you call it, that they, um, in, in terms of um, particular, uh, I'll, I'll go, let, let me uh, limit my answer to a specific example. Um, we 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 um, met with a group of um, affected artists. A lot of uh, it was a women's group uh, from a local mosque, and um, quite a, a number of them did say right there and then that their husbands are actually um, have um, are problem gamblers. But um, um, they were all very 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 clear that it would take a lot for them to actually come forward. Um, and, and what part of that is that they felt that if they do come forward and if they do um, make um, the issues in their families known, the level of support out there 
um, is not actually non-existent. And if there is, if it isn't, um, there is support out, out there. Did they do you not feel that um, uh, you know, um, part, um, uh, those in authority would have the cultural understanding, cultural sensitivity to actually give them the level of the type of support they need, um, really to actually, um, you know, um, um, to actually um, uh, get, um, help them really. So um, the, it, it's, it's multi-layered. They, one, they do not feel that if they come forward, there is support out. And if there's support, do those um, that are actually providing the support understand the cultural mm. uh, sensitivities that I, I am surrounded with? So it's really it was really um, heartbreaking for me to be surrounded by a group of women saying, my husband has lost a house, he lost a car. One of them has got, we're currently in temporary accommodation. Um, but mm. coming forward was, uh, a huge deal, a, a massive deal. Um, and because if they do make themselves vulnerable, who is, who's out there to understand them and who's out there to really understand their background? And, and, and like, like, I, I, I like to use myself as an example. There's a, there are a lot of cultural um, elements to my, my family, my community that is difficult to articulate unless you are yeah, actually so, part so. of that network. Well, I guess you'd, you'd also say that all that's true of the white population, but on top of that, there's a further layer of cultural worry yes. um, as well. OK, that, that's helpful. Uh, Nigel Bell, question to Ronnie. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ronnie, for your presentation. And yeah, it is interesting that you've raised the issue of uh, BAME and the BAME community, because obviously we on, in our reading, we obviously looked at Manchester and the Greater Manchester, the um, uh, what had been done there and the consultation. And there was, again, mention of the BAME community and again here generally, but it said, you know, we still have the main examples. Well, the main thing is if you're, going, if you're a white male, whatever it is, 24 to, 25 to 34, and that's the main issue. But it still was saying that there's an underlying issue, as you've just said, and clearly we now can see that there is much more of an underlying issue, which is hard to get into from our black and ethnic minority communities. And you're saying about the Muslim community there, and we need to try and somehow get in and break down those barriers with our, um, you know, the, the people that we know in, in our districts and across the county. And again, as you say, with the black African uh, communities, um, again, so I don't know if you, if, it'd be great for us to be able to work with you in future as to what you think is the best thing we can do to break to break that down as similar to what Chris has just said but it is important that you've come today to actually get this question this this across because in the reading beforehand we just got the feeling that yeah well there's a there's a bit of an issue with BAME but it's mainly as I say that the easy to say white male 35 whatever it is so it's really good that you came along to say that and I'm sure that we can try and use what you've told us today to, to realise there is much more of a um, an issue, underlying issue among our uh, ethnic communities, whether it's uh, the Muslim community in certain parts of the county and actually the black African communities uh, and whether we have to go through the churches or uh, mosques or other areas, that's what we need to look at. So, so thanks very much. Okay. Uh, Jan Madden, question to Steve this time. Uh, thank you. Um, Steve, you, your your talk um, really touched on me as well, actually, because um, I've got sons, one who's 21, one who's 22, and a lot of their friends are, are really into uh, get, getting into gambling to the point that one or two of them, um, it has definitely become a problem. Um, as a family, we, again, are not opposed to gambling. Um in fact, my boys have both got online accounts. My, my husband and I both um, do a little bit here and there as well. Um, I just was interested because you specifically were talking about how you started up and your son um, with, with his problems and, and so on. Um, do you see this as, a, as an issue um, which is increasing more rapidly in young people than, um, than the older sort of population um, because I, I, it, it really bothers me that for me it seems that it, it's becoming a bit of a cult thing for um, people who are literally just 18 19 20 years old that they're really getting into gambling because it's now so easy online to do that I just wondered what your thoughts are on it you you're clearly doing a lot with schools and things so you're obviously very conscious about it being um, about about trying to educate youngsters, and I just wondered where you um, 
where you found where you thought the biggest problems were? Yeah, definitely. Um, everything you're saying there, I think it has become normalised. I think lots of uh, we're talking young men, and it's not just a, to young men as well. There's a, a big demographic of, of female gamblers now that are, uh, are getting drawn into it. But it it is normalised, uh, as you say. Um, my son had to leave a WhatsApp group um, the other week on his football team because all they were doing were talking about betting all the time. And obviously it's too much of a, uh, and, and part of his recovery is going. Just incidentally as well, we attend um, our Gammonon and our GAs in Hertfordshire um, at Bishop Stalford. Um, so just to let you know, so our connection with Hertfordshire there as well. But it is, it is that cross-selling uh, of products. As I say, my son got into gambling through football betting because he had a particular interest. And then he was cross-sold, highly addictive um, products such as the online casinos and slots and I think Morris also mentioned these ridiculous odds that get offered you know 50 to 1 for England to beat Albania for example you know that's going to happen but as soon as you win that you then get these incentivized free bets and when you actually look at the small print you're only you're only going to get that in free bets you're not actually going to get that in physical money but once they've got your details they keep bombarding you with offers all the time and I think it is those highly addictive products that that are pushed um, the advertising, you know, you go to a football match and, you know, there's advertising everywhere. My, my worry is, and we, we presented to, uh, to DCMS with Minister Chris Phil, uh, part of the We Are The Evidence 2 um, uh, summary, which is based on lived experience. My, my worry is that part of, the, part of the review, all they will do will take the advertising off the football shirts, but then all they'll do is just make the advertising round the ground even, even bigger. We've got 16, 17-year-old footballers coming on, um, representing their clubs, and they've got gambling adverts on on their chest. But I think it is the advertising, the free bets, the incentives. Um, but I think our biggest challenge is, is is bringing this to an audience where people are not really that bothered about it or not if, if affected by it is our biggest challenge. I think things like the Paul Merson documentary was 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 a real gateway um, documentary. And if we can get more uh, of high profile people coming out and talking about um, how they've become sort of uh, affected by gambling harms. I think that's really, really key. And I think in schools, I think individual schools, you know, taking those decisions, it needs to come from the from the education authority. It needs to become an Ofsted agenda on a national basis. It's a bit like um, when I was in school, um, schools never really took county lines that seriously if you was in a in a well-to-do area until it become an Ofsted agenda. So we need we need people like Ofsted, we need the local authority, we need the uh, the education department to say, right, we need to make sure that we've got gambling harms on our education, part of our PSAG, but it's being delivered independent of industry influence as well. Yes, and I'd echo that. You. I'm sorry if I've, I've Rep- waffled on a bit there, Jan. No, 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 that's very that helpful. Great. I mean, uh, representing an extremely leafy division uh, where county lines became an explosive issue fairly recently, Definitely. massive police intervention. Um, Maureen Mackay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve um, and and Ronnie um, for the presentations. Um, Steve, this is a sort of personal question, um, but how did you actually manage to um, encourage your son to accept what you were doing? That, that's um, one question. What, what, in terms of the charity? Yes. Uh, well, well, look, when, when we started, we, we started supporting, uh, we started going for peer support before he did. Um, and what we realised as a, as a dad, I, uh, I made my son's gambling my problem. And when I couldn't solve it, I become frustrated. And it wasn't until I actually went to the peer support. We were going to Bishop Stortford Gammonon for probably four to five months before my son engaged in, in his support. And uh, he reached a point at which he reached out to his peer support. And unfortunately, um, fortunately, you know, he found some uh, some some common some common ground in there and some decent people that wanted to work with him. Um, it, it was a challenge um, at the start because obviously, you know, admitting to somebody that, you know, your son's got a gambling disorder, but the bigger secret you make something, the bigger it becomes. And we're fairly transparent. You know, I'm not going to share all of the details of what happened and what my son got into because that's his journey and that's his recovery. But he's fairly comfortable with it now. But he is now three years in recovery. But I did, you know, interestingly, Maureen, I did think at the start, anything I do, if it shines the light on him and affects his recovery, then I would stop what I'm doing. But he actively encourages me what I do now. And maybe in the future, you know, as a young man, he might help and support others. He works, he does the GA phone lines now and he supports people in their recovery. So he's given a bit back now. 
um, from the peer support to save him as well. So it's it's an important part of our life. And what we want to make sure is that our journeys haven't been in vain, as I said. But he's still he is still sort of living in those legacy harms, i.e. his credit rating and things. But we work together now and we work. And I think it's really important that families and their loved ones are on similar pages. And I think that's what we try to do is try to encourage the family and the person in recovery um, to, to, to work together as well. Because it's no good my son going to support, going to GA, coming home and finding his dad still the same angry, resentful person. It's important that, you know, we're grateful and uh, we've got that empathy for his recovery. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you're doing in secondary schools as a as a secondary school teacher or ex secondary school teacher and um, partly responsible for PSC. I really encourage what you're doing, particularly in gambling. Thank you. Thank you. I also um, also worked on the team that put the Gambling with Lives education programme together as well. So I would you know, definitely uh, look at look at that as well. But it would be good that if Hertfordshire sort of uh, yeah. local authority um, got behind yeah. uh, incentives like that. OK, um, we're more or less 11 o'clock. I just want to put a couple of words into your mouth, Steve, actually. I think what you're, you're, you're telling us is 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 uh, reaching out to to schools is, is, is absolutely vital. And the more of that you can do directly or indirectly, the better. I, I'm also you use the word normalised, and I think that's that's very powerful. I think you're almost saying that attempts to disrupt the normalisation are probably not going to work now. It's, it, we're too far down the track in terms of advertising and you know WhatsApp messaging and the conversation, peer to peer conversation. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think when you talk about talking to, to, to children as well, I think the other thing, the, the missing piece as well, is making sure that we include the parents and the carers. So okay. that we're not just, you know, you, you go into a, a child at 14, 15 and talk about the dangers of gaming. They're not really going to listen to you because, you know, that's a wonderful world they're moving in. However, that that monetization of gaming is really a gateway into gambling. You know, for our experience, my son was an excessive gamer, spent money in games. And then, you know, the natural ah. progression for him was to then start spending money online. And ah, that's, that's very interesting. Yes, that is very interesting. And everybody's got a casino in their pocket now, haven't they, on their phone? You know, yeah, that's, the, absolutely. that's the issue. OK, thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, very important presentations and Q's and A's. Uh, we have a break now, which allows um, coffee and other comforts. And we'll resume at 11.15 uh, for two further speakers before lunch. Thank you.
Hello, uh, welcome back. This is the Gambling Harms Scrutiny uh, Topic Group, and we've just had our break and are into the uh, late morning session. Uh, we have two speakers, um, and we will take them each in turn with questions. The first uh, is Professor Henrietta Bowden Jones, uh, who is the director of the National Centre for Behavioural Addictions, and then followed, following on is Greg Fell, who is the director of public health at Sheffield Council. So, uh, Professor Burden Jones, over to you. Uh, roughly ten minutes, and then ten minutes for questions. Thank you so much. It's it's been really wonderful, and I just want to share uh, my real appreciation for 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 Ronnie and Steve's uh, very personal in, uh, interventions this morning. I, I found them very moving. Um, so, just to give you a very brief uh, background, I'm a medical doctor a specialist in psychiatry, in particular in addiction psychiatry. I worked for many years uh, doing detoxes in central London in the NHS for alcohol and drugs. And then 15 years ago, gambling disorder became my field of expertise. Uh, why did it become that? Well, that's because as well as that, as the clinical side, I have a research side. I, I hold a doctorate in medicine in the field of neuroscience from Imperial College particularly in decision making and addictions. And you can see why decision making and gambling disorder are so inter interlinked. Um, just to give you um, very quickly uh, a list of the various bodies I'm linked with, I think that's very important for you to know, uh, as well as being the director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic, which is the first NHS clinic ever to have been set up in the country designated to gambling disorder treatment. In 2008, I also am director of the Young People's NHS Gambling Services set up two years ago uh, with NHS England Money, as well as the uh, National Centre for Gaming Disorders also set up in 2019 with the uh, part of the NHS England Long Term Plan. Uh, I'm spokesperson uh, on gambling disorder for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm president of psychiatry at the Royal Society of Medicine. I am an elected member of the Board of Science at the British Medical Association, and I sit on various uh, committees like the Crime and Problem Gambling Commission, led by Lord Goldsmith, and the Behavioural Insights Team Gambling Rated Harm Group. And I can go on, but I'll stop here, but I'm happy to answer any questions later. Um, what I've done today is I won't speak about my clinical work too much because I do have some really important gambling related harm topics I'd like you to consider as part of your remit today. So I've, I've made that uh, as much my aim today. But just briefly to tell you that in the last 15 years, thousands and thousands of people have come through my clinic. My clinic is now only part of a, a, a group of clinics that the NHS is um, setting up all over the country. And the aim is to have 15 by 2024. And um, I'm obviously one of the advisors on that uh, development strategy. Um, but what we are seeing is enormous amounts of debt uh, from very early on, even if you look at people under 25, the debts are, 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 are overwhelming. Um, we see a lot of mental health issues and we know there is bi-directionality. It is true that if you're you know, at home and low in mood and anxious, you might turn to gambling, but the majority of people are actually uh, suffering the consequence, consequences uh, of the negative impact on gambling and gambling losses um, through mental health issues by becoming depressed and anxious because of their inability to see a way out of these enormous, uh, disastrous uh, events that have led, um, that they've been led to by the gambling disorder. We see family breakdown regularly. We see high levels of domestic violence uh, linked to gambling disorder. We see a horrendous impact on spouses and children, uh, including lo loss of family home, including multiple moves of children's schools as the children um, 
uh, begin to really uh, develop their own mental health issues as they find themselves carted between homes as, as the fathers, usually the fathers, not always, um, are, are trying to get away from um, debt collectors and also trying to provide a roof over the children's head. We've seen land-based gambling becoming uh, uh, far less frequent. When I started the clinic, 80% of people were in bookmakers. There were long queues of people outside bookmakers at lunch times waiting to play the fixed odds betting terminals you heard about. Now it's it, it's really uh, mainly online. We see enormous suicidal ideation and intent and sadly planning uh, at times. Um, I can't begin to tell you the last couple of years, the amounts of suicidal ideation in men and women we've come across. And just to remind you, only about 3% of people with problems are actually in treatment in this country. Whatever statistic you're looking at, it is a very low uh, number. Um, so early um, identification is really key here, and I'm pleased to hear about all the plans um, other colleagues of mine earlier on have mentioned. Um, the treatment uh, we deliver in the NHS is a mix of uh, psychiatric, psychological, psychotherapeutic interventions, mainly cognitive behavioural, but we use medication as well. Now uh, online, uh, but group and individual settings. And again, I am happy to talk about that if you ask me later. Um, so gambling related harm impacts those with a disorder, uh, those at risk as already experiencing harmful consequences. So you've got a few million people already losing too much money, already um, experiencing uh, negative consequences, whether financial or personal, who are not being counted under the problem gambling, the gambling disorder bracket. You've got the family members I mentioned and society as a whole, as a whole because uh, whichever way you look at it, there are exorbitant figures attributed to uh, the cost to society. The importance of data is my next topic. We have spoken about prevalent surveys and uh, Public Health England quoting a figure, Gamble Aware quoting a figure. The reality is that there has been nothing high quality, at least for a decade. And even the one that took place over just over a decade ago as being the last one of a series, the British Gambling Prevalence Survey, even that didn't really uh, pick up. Um, as we were hearing, hearing earlier from Ronnie, there are whole populations, be they in prison, be they uh, in mental health settings, be they belonging to groups that may not necessarily come forward. Um, so, so we are in need of investing properly in a good, high quality prevalence survey. This has not happened. And I do feel uh, that, um, unfortunately, um, despite the money uh, being available in all sorts of ways through fines and through, you know, potential um, um, government uh, sources. I think it's been uh, maybe something that not everyone has wished us to go ahead with. And this brings me to the next point. Um, statutory levy, highly relevant because you need it to create an independent source of funds allocated uh, on both need and merit to both research, treatment provision, education and prevention measures. It will be impossible otherwise to provide the large scale intervention that is needed. I'll give you an example. People say, why do you all want to ban gambling adverts? There's no evidence, there's no clear causality to say that gambling adverts are uh, at the, uh, in, in, the cause of much of the um, gambling that is happening harmfully. But you see, if you don't invest in high quality research, it becomes very difficult to find the evidence when you are trying to uh, look at policy. So we need high quality research um, in order to inform policy, in order to support the great work that people like the APPG group on, uh, on gambling harms or the peers for gambling reform in the House of Lords are doing. Um, and uh, as well as that, I think it's highly important to fund treatment uh, adequately uh, with no geographical postcode lottery and to do it independently of industry. That is the, the biggest request for me, I think, at national level is that the NHS 
and indeed everyone else delivering treatment should not be receiving anything other than independent funds. Okay, so some things we have seen over the last 15 years have exact that have exacerbated harm are the increase in availability of gambling opportunities. As you as we've heard earlier, the 24-7 online world has increased opportunities. The mobile phones becoming widespread have caused enormous changes. We've seen it, we've tracked it through the years. The more people have smartphones, the more they will gamble. The more they'll gamble with a phone in their pocket, the harder it is for them to apply what we call stimulus control, which means you know, deciding they want to stop, deciding they've had enough, and then being able to follow through. Free money offers have led many of our patients to gamble money they did not have. These, off, these are same offers function as triggers to relapse in those attempting to abstain. We've heard about that. Speed of play, highly relevant. It's attracted many of our patients and driven those with vulnerabilities to lose more and more rapidly and then chase their losses. Multiple opportunities to bet within games is also added to sports being consumed uh, as a means of betting. So it's a sort of the gamblification of sport is how we see it. Inescapable gambling logos on shirts and all over the pitch are creating a, a firm link between sports and betting. And social media is ever more complicit by allowing young people to be exposed to their football teams, associations, to gambling accounts. And every day is a reminder. And I do believe the government really, really has to do something about it now. The less time between bets, the more addictive a product becomes. Many of our patients found FOBTs highly compulsive. Now many are playing roulette online because it's so fast. It is not the same as a weekly lottery draw where you have to wait seven days to find out. In match betting caused us many problems because people were watching a football match for the football. Now they watch it. They they then became excited about the bet inside the match rather than the who was going to win the match. Affordability is key. Have I got about four minutes left? Three minutes? Um, yes, I mean three. I think okay. otherwise we won't have too much time. So, Thank you. Affordability is key. Banks banks know what the percentage what percentage of their customers are spending 25% more of their income on gambling. Something should be done about that to protect these patients. No one can afford that much, that much money or the majority of people can't. So data sharing is key. Um, some good work has happened. The banks have done good work with blocks, Gamban, with software, and I can talk about that if you're interested. Unregulated sites must not be allowed to reach UK gamblers. Uh, I do not believe technology is unable to prevent this. I think there are financial interests here, and I think that should stop. If all gambling was regulated, if all sites shared data, if none by bypass blocks, the harm would be significantly lower. And just to finish a couple of points, there are 55,000 children who are gambling problematically. Many, many more are gambling. No child should be exposed to gambling adverts. We as a society are not protecting our children. I believe adverts must be banned from sporting events. Research shows advertising normalises gambling and makes children more likely to gamble. Uh, lastly, we need an ombudsman to redress wrongs. That's very important. And we need a classification of harm for products in order to be aware when a product is going to cause more addiction and in order to limit the numbers. I'd like to say that uh, the Peers for Gambling Reform, led by Lord, Lord Foster, have created a fantastic um, report with many recommendations and anyone interested should read it. There are more than 200 members of the House of Lords very, very concerned about what is happening now in this country in relation to gambling harm. And I've mentioned the APPG with people like Carolyn Harris, Ian Duncan Smith, Ronnie Cowan doing amazing work. Lastly, to finish, Chris Philp, our gambling minister, is referring to gambling related harm as a public health issue. This is welcome news indeed. Let us hope that the DCMS gambling review will reflect his current views and finally provide the country with a gambling act fit for a digital age. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nigel Bell. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Professor, for your um, very enlightening um, presentation in such a short time. You, you got so much in there. Um, I think it's important that one of the key things you seem to say there, I think you might say, is you said the most important thing was the funding of the treatment has got to be independent. Um, uh, and also, obviously, when the, 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 the treatment itself shouldn't be a postcode lottery, and I'm sure we all agree with that. And also your observation that Eight, you know, was it? I don't know how many years ago it would have been. Eighty percent of the uh, bookmakers would have had the FOBTs and people outside. Now that's caught off because that's now come down to two pound. Of course, it's now mainly all gone online. That's not that there isn't an issue in in uh, bookmakers, obviously. Uh, and then obviously your thing near the end, your point about the unregulated sites must not be able to reach gamblers. So clearly, there's a lot that needs to be done online. And I was also surprised, I wouldn't say astonished, but surprised that you said there hasn't really on data there hasn't really been a proper uh, a proper survey or proper g gathering of data for 10 years so that's clearly something that anything that we can help towards that and government we could got to encourage them to get let, let's get this proper data that can be uh you know uh, understood and by by everybody and taken on board uh, and again your issue about advertising i think that's a key thing that when um, th th this is where the data's got to come in, and, this, and 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 the fact that there's nothing's been done for ten years, because we need to, if there is, if we can get the evidence about shirt advertising and sport and general advertising in the street and advertising online, that that is a danger, that's a harm, then we've got to be able to use it. But that must be done, and and the worry is that there is the gambling companies that are, d that are spending all this money, spending money, I'm afraid, with some people in Parliament to stop. Uh, these kind of things going through that we need to bear anything we can cut, do to come out of here and use your experience to try and make sure that we get that then that would be uh, welcome but Thank again you. I just I just really wanted you to go over when you said mm -hmm. I, I, I hopefully I got it right when you said you thought the most important thing was that funding treatment being independent and obviously not being a postcode lottery mm -hmm. yes so thank you for picking up on those uh, let me just go back to the prevalence survey um it, it, for about uh, three rounds in the uh, you know, 2000, 2007, 2010, there was a British gambling prevalence survey um, or, uh, done by Natsen um, showing prevalences that went got reached just below 1%. Uh, that methodology was stopped suddenly. I was uh, one of the people sitting on the Responsible Gambling Strategy Board. I was very alarmed that as something was creeping up in terms of uh, percentages, it was suddenly stopped. Uh, I'm also, you know, unfortunately, I am alarmed that the Gambling Commission, they are trying their best, but they are regulators. And I don't think a regulator should be in charge of a prevalence survey to look at how badly or well something's doing, something they are Regulating. So I think there's an issue here in this country about who should be running the prevalence survey and mm. making sure that enough money is apportioned to the prevalence survey for it to do the, a good job. So to do better, than, better even than those original British gambling prevalence surveys, but building on that. Uh, remember, people who are experiencing gambling disorder are, are, have a lot of shame. They will not want to uh, often, not always, but many times they'll have shame, they'll have guilt and regret, and certainly they will want to hide their addiction frequently. And therefore, if they're highly unlikely to answer the door or speak on the phone, um, or indeed fill in forms with the rest of the family watching. So, so we are really needing to uh, revise the way we look at gambling disorder prevalence, and there should be uh, some work done on that. In relation to the treatment funding, absolutely, we need independence. We need to uh, apportion funds in relation to performance, in relation to outcomes, in relation to, we need to give money to what works, uh, but we need the right research, the right, the right randomized controlled trials as well to support the work. So all of that is, you know, we're doing, you know, we, we could do a lot better, but things have moved ahead pretty quickly in the last couple of years since NHS England got involved. And that is all positive. I don't want it to sound all negative. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Jan Madden. Thank you, Jan. Last question. Oh, many thanks. Um, wow, that was so much information. I was scribbling, scribbling away. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just would, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, prevalence survey um, uh, idea. If if we put, if a, if a survey was put out nationally, what do you think would be the uh, 
level of honesty and accuracy I mean I'm guessing that there's some kind of fancy formula that we know that only 10% of people or whatever are going to be honest about it so I'm just interested to know how accurate any data would be that you could get from that kind of thing I think that there are going to be ways uh, of using technology somehow and data sharing somehow to allow us to potentially assess accuracy. Um, uh, we do we do know people, um, uh, well, I can't tell you exactly, you know, this is just a hypothetical thing, uh, but uh, certainly uh, what I do feel is at the moment, um, because we're just, everything's online, isn't it? And we do have enormous amounts of information online. And in fact, there was a YouGov survey that showed a much, much higher prevalence because they used online data. Um, so I think we'll need to combine in a way in order to catch, or, you know, just because you play the lottery doesn't mean you might not have a problem. So we do need to catch land-based as well. Maybe off, off, you know, at another time, I'd be happy to give it more thought. And there are great experts in the field, like people like Heather Wardle, um, who have been working in this area for a very long time, and some good international experts as well that we would want to involve if we were moving ahead with a bigger, uh, you know, wider scale study. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, now moving on to Greg Fell from Sheffield Council. Welcome again, Greg. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, all councillors, for the opportunity. So uh, by way of brief introduction, my name is Greg Fell. I'm Director of Public Health in Sheffield, uh, recently elected Vice President of ADPH. So Jim is one of my many bosses, not the one that pays me, uh, but that's who the tie is in aid of. Um, uh, I shall talk briefly to uh, a, a long note I sent to the chair yesterday. I'm happy that that circulated if you want. It's kind of my, my, my reflections on this. Um, I don't have specific expertise around gambling. I'm a jobbing, jobbing public health professional um, uh, and I'll talk broadly about framing the issue who gambles and who is harmed we've heard some of that already um the the nature of the industry and the parallel to other other similar industries um and uh, the the approaches to reducing harm and specifically that are what we have done in sheffield on this to date which is um a uh, not quite finished story um i shall preface all of that by absolutely saying i'm not anti-gambling or anti-gambler um, i am anti-harm from gambling and there is some substantial harm from gambling as I'm sure as I'm sure councillors have already heard. So um framing first. Um ask 50 people how to frame problem gambling and it will be framed in 150 different ways. For anything from harmless leisure pursuit to urgent public health crisis. Um, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and it's fair to say that different stakeholders within and outside of government see how to frame gambling and the harm that comes from it um, in very, very different ways. And that's one of the interesting challenges. Um, we have seen a sort of 20 year, probably 20 year plus story of deregulation of gambling um, across lots of governments over, over that time period. And to an extent, we are seeing the consequences of some of that now. And we should reflect quite hard on that one. Um, I think it's fair to say that the discourse that I see on gambling aligns very closely with the interests of the gambling industry rather than the nature of the individuals, families and communities that are affected by the harms from gambling, social, mental health, economic, and other, and I shall come back onto that. Uh, and again, that's a, a, a tricky thing. Um, um, the, the narrative is definitely dominated by kind of individualized and pathologized understanding of gambling as an addiction and gambling as of a, a, a as of a thing that is to do with individuals rather than the context in which gambling sits um, and the social, economic and financial harm that that causes. And again, that's something that's really important think, thinking through how we how we frame um, gambling. Who gambles is the second point. Um, as, as Henrietta has said, the, the, the PHE evidence review is the best that we've probably got, but it, it has some imperfections and it, it's, it's, it, it has some flaws. Um, um, I think it's fair to say that both the PHE um, survey, there was a YouGov and ASH survey, uh, there have been various other surveys. The, the proportion of people who gamble is substantial. Even if you take the lottery, which is clearly a form of gambling, if you take the lottery out, there is still a sub substantial proportion of people who gamble regularly, um, including children. And I think as, already, as I've, I've heard already, there are in the order of nearly half a million 
um, 11 to 15 year old gamblers, of which 55,000 are addicted. Note, it's illegal till you're 18. So uh, so the, the, the number who gamble is substantial. The number um, who gamble who uh, shouldn't be gambling is substantial. Gambling harm um, is next. Um, estimates vary of the proportion of people that come to harm. Somewhere somewhere around 1% of people are harmed. 1% of the population are definitively harmed by gambling. Seems to be about the, the consensus. Uh, and as I've said, there are a substantial number of children who are engaged in problematic gambling that do, does does come to harm. Um, uh, we do need, I think, a better characterization of the harm and how that plays out across mental health, addiction, social and family problems, debt, suicide, and not in substantial proportion of people who take their life have gambling in the mix. Um, and I, I know full well there are a few examples of that in my town, but that won't be limited to my town. Um, gambling harm is obviously difficult to pin down and can span financial debt, mental health, relationship, addiction, mental illness. Um, our estimates in Sheffield, a, a population of about 600,000, is that about 3,000 3, people are problem gamblers. Um, um, and uh, one in uh, of those three of those 3,000 people um, that that also affects for each for each one of those 3000 it affects six more um it definitely an issue that's going up the risk radar of most directors of public health i know from a whole range of different perspectives um lots say we should focus on those that are very addicted and or the most vulnerable. Um, I've heard Henrietta speak about this, and I've heard one of Henrietta's colleagues speak about this very eloquently, Matt Gaskell, who's a psychiatrist in Leeds. It takes 20 years to reach that level of vulnerability. So yes, of course, we should support the most vulnerable, but we shouldn't neglect the pathway to the vulnerability over a long time period. Um, so the gambling industry, um, it is um, an industry with significant power. The tactics of the industry, and this is well documented by lots of academics in this space, are very similar to the tactics that have been adopted by other industries um, that, that, that sell us products that consume too much can be harmful. Tobacco, alcohol and food are the, the three obvious examples, but there are others. Um, I'd heard someone mention it already, the, the Paul Merson documentary that was broadcast no, October and November from memory, it's probably still available on iPlayer, is an exceptionally powerful and insightful watch. And I think it's well, it'd be well worth people watching. Um, I think industry has sought to and is seeking to frame problems in ways that, see, that shift attention away from the most impactful interventions in terms of reducing harm. I've seen that play out with food. I've seen that play out with alcohol and I've seen that play out with tobacco. The same playbook is being used here and we should reflect on that very carefully. Um, one thing that is odd in gambling is a large degree of industry pervasiveness into the field, research, policy, interventions. I don't think it's something we would tolerate in lots of other spaces. I wouldn't enter into a meeting to talk about tobacco control with Philip Morris in the room, but that does seem to happen in this space here. And I think, again, something to uh, reflect on. Routes to reducing harm threefold. Um, regulation, product advertising and sponsorship and availability, um, treatment and education. Um, uh, and lots talk about a public health approach to gambling harm. Um, very, very welcome. I think this is the first time it's been talked about significantly over, for, for as long as my time in public health. Um, but thinking through what a public health approach to actually means probably requires some very, very careful thought. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I might dwell on some of the answers to some of my answers to that question in the uh, in the, uh, the, the the responses. In terms of specifics, regulation is by far the most important and impactful thing, um, as is the case in other spaces, alcohol and tobacco, for instance. Um, um, it's way more important than, than other modalities of reducing harm. It sets the right context and the right environment in which individuals make choices. Um, Three broad approaches to regulation, making products safer, limiting access and restricting promotion and advertising. And I've heard other people talk, talk eloquently about some of the specifics within there. The Gambling, Harm Alliance, the Gambling Health Alliance recommendations on, uh, on regulation are exceptionally impactful. Locally, for, for a local authority, one of the things that I think would be most impactful would be public health as a fifth licensing objective, and within that specific thought given to cumulative impact um, of their. Second area for reducing harm is treatment. 
Um, a better treatment system, as Henrietta said, is absolutely necessary, but by itself, nowhere near sufficient. But we do need to have a better treatment system um, that is moving in the right direction. But as Henrietta has said, there's a long, long way to go. Um, um, the significant investment in treatment per se won't solve the problem, just as significant investment in smoking cessation um, is a spectacularly valuable thing to do, but doesn't shift the dial in terms of population prevalence. Um, and there's much to be said about modeling our approach based on similar addictions. And we have lots of expertise in every place up and down the country around addiction expertise. And we need to build that appropriately and build a system for, um, for, 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 for treatment. As Henrietta has said, it should be absolutely funded by statutory levy, absolutely owned by the NHS, and delivered to national nationally agreed quality standards and outcome framework. And for me on treatment, that's a very, very much a red line. Um, what we've got um, at the moment are a small number of really good specialist treatment centres. Henrietta uh, runs runs one. Uh, Matt, Matt Gaskill, one of my one of my um, colleagues in, in Yorkshire, runs another one. They're really, really good, but we need a whole system around some of those. Some of those. Um, education will be helpful, um, but personalises what can be characterised as a structural and societal problem. Um, three arms for me on education, raising awareness about the impact of gambling on individuals and society from a range of different entry and exit points to, to the harm that gambling can cause. Um, raising awareness of the tactics used by industry, um, I think there's very much, uh, ve very poor levels of awareness amongst the public about the tactics of industry, and then raising awareness about the nature of the nature of the product. And I'll come back then to the, the Paul Burson documentary. Locally in Sheffield, um, our starting point was an ask from the safeguarding exec and the Our Fair City uh, uh, board, which was a councillor-led um, board around fairness and inclusion, um, to, to get a handle for the city on what, what does gambling harm look like. That started in 2017 and it's ongoing. Um, a great deal has been achieved. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say a great deal has been achieved. And I think Sheffield is recognised as one of the local authorities that are taking a leading light in this space. Um, credit to my staff who've done all the work. Um, what have we done? Um, significant input to the statement, a review of the statement of principles of licensing. We've produced a fairly detailed chapter of the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, um, um, produced a uh, public health framework for gambling harm reduction toolkit, which has been widely adopted in, in lots of places, uh, provided lots of training um, and support to uh, staff from lots of different organisations, test purchasing um, uh, and uh, undertaken a what would a what would a treatment system look like as sort of a system specification, but we haven't yet funded a treatment system because lack of resource is an issue. Um, what do we need to move that one onwards to three things? Um, one, we do need a single focal point because gambling is one of those things that cuts across safeguarding, um, uh, licensing, uh, health and well-being, poverty, education. So we haven't yet quite got a single focal point. We haven't yet brought all of those things together into a single strategy. And that's this this year's job, assuming that we can find some time away from COVID. Um, and lastly, uh, we do need a, uh, a, a, a we, we do need a um, a fifth a fifth objective in the licensing act for um, gambling harm. Um, lastly, uh, I think this is uh, as I absolutely welcome the the review of the gambling act nationally. Um, absolutely welcome the focus that the minister and others have put on the public health approach to. We should reflect on what that actually means. It's very definitely an opportunity to reduce gambling harm both locally and nationally and get ahead of the curve, we should all take that opportunity. The nature of the product has changed massively in the last 20 years. Um, and I think our approaches to harm reduction need to keep up with the nature of the product as it continues to evolve. In the interest of time, Chair, I shall pause for breath there. Thank you. That's uh, most impressive of us indeed your paper, which obviously, uh, if it hasn't already been shared with colleagues, will be so during the course of this meeting. Um, uh, what I'm, I think I'm hearing uh, for your, your advice to a um, local government system which comprises one county council, which is the public health authority, and uh, 10 district councils, which have public health roles, but in particular licensing roles, is uh, have a single strategy and all work pointing yeah. in the same direction. I was I was struck very much by your 20-year uh, run-up to, to having a problem. Um, uh, what I'm sort of taking from that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're all vulnerable in the same way i guess we're all vulnerable to alcoholism and, and but some are more vulnerable than others but we're all potentially at risk the 20-year run-up is a lot longer i think than alcohol or tobacco 
Um, um, and so there is the question of when do you know you've got a, a problem and indeed what local authorities and other agencies in this county should be doing to disrupt the run up. I think disrupt is the right word. Uh, with tobacco, there was disruption through um, taking machines out of pubs, debranding, uh, fiscal measures, um, going up to 20 um, uh, pack, uh, packs of 20 and so on and so forth, all of which helped. Uh, plus also graphic uh, representations on packets, which um, you know were, were difficult to avoid. And this is someone who is currently an ex-smoker. Um, um, so uh, is my understanding right? And, and, and what disruptions would you advise? Um, so three, three, three immediate thoughts, I should reflect on it at my leisure, but three immediate thoughts. One is um, um, uh, awareness raising for those on various iterations of the front line. They will see things a long time before mm. it becomes data that lands in a shiny, gra yeah. shiny graph on my desk. So awareness, awareness raising on uh, what frontline practitioners in various iterations of the front line should look out for and how they may raise the issue. In Again, in the same way that we've done with alcohol uh, screening and brief intervention, di di ditto tobacco. And that has made a difference o over many years. Um, uh, we've done a little bit of that. There's more to do on that in Sheffield. Um, se second area on disruption are uh, is uh, are we doing all we can as a licensing authority with regard to the um the, the saturation of land-based gambling mm. um or whatever phrase we come up with it uh, whatever whatever phrase we come up for land-based gambling um the the number of bookie shops where they are um uh, and what they are doing in terms of the staff there to pick up people who are displaying what might be termed as problematic gambling and we've done a little bit of that with william hill actually and william hill were very very receptive to that and there's more again more to do in that space um third area which is arguably more difficult is um, the uh, the street hoardings and advertising. Um, if I walk up and down the, the, the moor in Sheffield, which is one of the main shopping streets in Sheffield, um, how, how many adverts do I see for gambling products of various types and flavours? Well, I did it the other day, quite a lot, actually. Um, and do we want to get into the space where we get into um, saying, to, saying to those that, um, that we have contracts with, no, we don't want gambling? Um, adverts on, uh, on 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 in the public realm. Um, do we get into a difficult conversation with with the football clubs um, around commercial sponsorship? And you know, is 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 this the is this the the um, the agenda that we want to set for our children and young people? Very much more difficult because there's there, there are there are uh, financial and commercial uh, aspects to that one. Um, but it's that kind of space that I would go in terms of the disruption. Yes, it's amazing how far we've come. I'm old enough to remember when uh, cigarette advertising was normal on TV. Yes. And cigar yeah. advertising. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, Dee Hart. Thank you, Chris. Um, my question is around the regulations. Clearly, the regulations need to be tightened up going forward, but I think it's bringing all different strands of um, our community together. So it's the NHS, it's public health, um, it's the Gambling Commission. I mean, clearly, we're not actually working together as, as we should. Um, I agree with you regarding advertising. I mean, the public are aware about smoking, how they can get help, how they can get treatment. The same with drinking and drugs problems. But most of the public are not aware of where they can go and access um, help for gambling addiction. So I think we need to um, do a lot more work with the public, make the public aware, but also we also need to try and look at the advertising because the advertising now just isn't on um, boards, etc. It's on the telly. They're sponsoring um, certain sports clubs, etc. So I think this all comes back to the regulations that need to be strengthened up going forward. Greg, it was a um, fantastic um, uh, sort of update on the situation. So thank you for that. Um, thanks, Steve. For what it's worth, I agree 100%. Um, I, I was talking to a, an Australian academic uh, who has expertise in this space a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Um, she um, she characterised the where we are on our collective approach to gambling and gambling harm as to where the tobacco in the tobacco approach was about 25 years ago and about where the Australian society was about 20 years ago. So we you know our opportunities to accelerate that, but I agree with all of the points that you made wholeheartedly. There's <laughs> nothing much of value I can add to them. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Jan Madden. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Greg, I'm just I'm interested in um, your comments about the uh, treatment um, of gambling addiction that um, and you said that it should be owned by the NHS, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. Um, and going back to what Steve was talking about very much earlier on, um, when he was telling us his story and was say, said that they went to the NHS and didn't get anywhere with that. Um, do you have any sort of ideas of what the NHS could do differently if they were funded properly for it um, to make it more valuable to uh, to people with gambling um, difficulties and their families? Um, it's just I, I'm just trying to align the two the two mm-hmm. speakers on on their views on yep. that. So, so I, I think the the current availability of treatment, care and support for those who have a, a gambling harm problem, addiction or, or, or otherwise, is very, very underdeveloped in lots of parts of the NHS. I can speak with some authority about Yorkshire, um, very, very nascent NHS treatment um, um, for gambling harm, gambling addiction in most parts of Yorkshire. We have a the Northern Gambling uh, the Northern Gambling um, um, Service, which is based in Leeds, it's what what will be characterised as a tertiary referral centre, does excellent work, really, really, really good work. Um, but Bob from Burngreave, who's a you know, few, few yards away from the town hall in Sheffield, might struggle to get to Leeds. So what the Northern Gambling Service have done is set up uh, online treatment modalities. So the pandemic has helped us because we've all shifted to online. That helps. But what we need is a sort of a primary, secondary, tertiary approach to gambling harm and treatment, which we don't have yet, but we will have by the time we've finished. And hopefully we can accelerate that pretty quickly. Appropriately resourced is currently not appropriately resourced, but making maximum use of all of the addiction expertise that currently resides in various bits of the NHS. Um, I think in Sheffield, I commissioned quite a lot of it in terms of smoking cessation and alcohol and drug treatment. So bringing all of the expertise together with the right resourcing and the right treatment system will stand us in great stead that needs to be accelerated fairly rapidly but currently lots of that doesn't quite exist okay i, I see henrietta's got a hand up may want to join in at this point so yeah leave it leave um, on greg yeah yeah um greg has done such a good job of summarizing it but i wanted to reassure people uh that uh, since uh, the, lo- the initial lockdown all services are mm-hmm. online as well and therefore anyone across the whole country can refer themselves uh, um, you know uh, as you say Matt's clinic is doing wonderful work uh, we, we are a national clinic we're commissioned to see people nationally we have no barriers to treatment the opposite we will see them immediately we'll have brief interventions as soon as they refer themselves so I think it's more about uh, apart I agree with everything Greg says there is a lot of work to build on what is happening now but uh, certainly treatment evidence-based treatment NHS delivery is available now to anyone in the country who is struggling in any shape or form or any relative of anyone who is struggling um, and they will be seen they will be treated uh, and there is no real issue there I think the, the big issue is that a lot of people still don't know the treatment exists and uh, or unless they go on google and go nhs gambling in which case we all appear uh, but if they don't do that and they don't have access to the internet or something like that it may be problematic for them to know we exist because some gps still don't know about us but generally speaking you know we are there is a much higher visibility now than even two years ago because of public health england's and nhs england's great work I'm just uh, thinking there's something emerging here as as as, as a piece of work for us in, in, in Hertfordshire. I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting again on, on tobacco. I think virtually everybody knows that there are NHS facilities for that. I didn't personally use them because I, I prefer the tur- cold turkey approach and it seems to work at the moment. Um, but that the, the barrier there is not shame and the barrier there is not ignorance. So everyone knows about tobacco and no one is ashamed of being a smoker, I don't think, in the same way they may be ashamed of an alcohol addiction or earlier on, and and, and the peer-to-peer contact about gambling is normalised, then um, the, the, we're probably not going to be able to disrupt that very easily at local level. But we could disrupt by making sure that every time you move, you see you know, gambling can be a problem. Um, don't be ashamed, you can get help. Um, then the barrier simply becomes of people understanding when they've got a problem. 
And again, I'm, I'm raised that on a number of questions as you've probably heard. And is at what point, I mean, it's boiling a monkey to some degree, isn't it? Or boiling a frog. Um, is what do, at what point do you actually need to know that you do have a problem? Is it, uh, and any final reflections on that? that? That would be good. I don't want to take any time of Greg's in his Q&A, but, but I do have a very brief thing to say. Sadly, some uh, products are so addictive that it doesn't take 20 years, it takes a few goes. Um, and I do have many, many patients who uh, went out with friends uh, once or twice. The third time they went, they, everyone went home and they stayed at the casino or uh, online, or they went back home, you know, and played on their own, and they were hooked pretty much immediately. So, so I think uh, with online gambling and the twenty four seven availability, the old fashioned, you know, very lengthy uh, road to okay. addiction um, is no not really something that we see as often, and I think that's an important harm message. That's why the harm the the harm product index is so vital i think um that everyone has mentioned today yeah well fix odds betting terminals versus a flutter on the grand national uh, off the end <laughs> spectrum i guess yeah yeah okay uh, one last comment from greg and then we have our lunch break very early 12 o'clock um, there we go <laughs> Chair, thanks. Um, so I agree with Henrietta on the tw tw 20 years. It was a chance, com chance, chance comment made to be man by Matt, actually. And, and I agree 100 percent. For some, it is 20 years. For some, it might be 20 weeks or it might be two weeks. Um, but but, but, but that's what the point is. It doesn't happen automatically. It's a pathway with many yeah, opportunities. Possible, to yeah. that. Uh, yeah. And I agree, I agree with you on the sort of the normalising the availability of We need to make sure the support is available, but normalising the availability of support. Um, my slight caveat to that is I wouldn't make it it's all about what we can do to help individuals because we need to have the right context and environments in which those individuals can make choices. And that does bring us back to product and price and availability regulation plus Thank advertising. You. That's fabulous. Thank you both um, very, very much um, for, I mean, and you're welcome to stay and watch and indeed occasionally chip in if that's uh, of, of interest to you, but no doubt also you're busy people. So um, we're now reaching the point at which we take uh, an hour for an early lunch for a massive session in the afternoon about uh, Hertfordshire uh, witnesses in particular. Uh, so uh, the uh, session will be paused by the officials in a moment, uh, at which point uh, I can switch my camera off.
Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Gambling Harm Scrutiny Topic Group of Hertfordshire County Council. We've had a busy morning uh, taking evidence from witnesses. And uh, just to launch us into the afternoon before we look at the Hertfordshire picture, uh, I'm going to bring in Natalie Rotherham, who's going to do a, a summary of where we've got to. Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, this is very much the morning was taken over by um, uh, giving the national background to this to to help members understand where Hertfordshire was in relation to other local authorities. Um, and you you commenced by hearing from the executive member for uh, community safety and public health, Maurice Bright, um, who um, was very pleased that this scrutiny was taking place and sees it as something that um, could be could be immensely helpful in identifying where changes could be made and where changes can be made in policies or new policies created um, and, and developing a system-wide approach. He made a comment that most of your speakers said, which is that they're not anti-gambling, they're actually anti-gambling harms. And that was uh, that was restated during the morning. And I think that that is something that will definitely feature in the report. Um, um, Morris was asked where he thought there might be barriers to gambling and um, Morris's view was it's actually where people are gambling and actually the pandemic accelerating more online gambling um, and be, it becoming an even more hidden problem in some ways because of that and the impact that has on um, other things such as hidden personal debt which people try um, and manage successfully or less successfully um, depending on their, the, the extent of their problem. Um, then looking to hear from the um, the um, user by experience, you heard from Steve yeah. Watts of, of GAM, of, sorry, you heard from Steve Watts, um, and I thought he made a really important point that um, when we look at the figures, um, that 5% of gamblers accrues 75 percent of the profits for for the industry so it's an understanding of sometimes we might be talking about small numbers but actually the significance of the size of those numbers is, is not to be underestimated um, um, and very much wanting to work um, with um, Hertfordshire as it as it moves forward in this arena and but also making a plea that lived experience remains central to the endeavours that um, any future activity uh, takes place. And I think that that's been loud and clear by hearing from some of the examples uh, this morning around the, how crucial it is to understand the impact that gambling can have on an individual and, and their wider family. Um, you, you heard from Anna um, about um, GamCare being the largest national channel charity um, um, in, to reduce gambling harms and again she talks about the small number but it's although it's a small number nationally that that rolls out into a significant um, number in in term in in in, gen, in total numbers especially when you include it affected others which are uh, children and family members um, she identified the three um, impacts key key impact areas for gambling which is financial harm relationship impact and mental health and well-being and again these were picked up by subsequent um, presenters during the scrutiny. Ronnie from Recovery From All um, I thought really helpfully shone a spotlight on one specific project looking um, at work with um, ethnic minority groups particularly um, South, South Asian um, and the fact that they're not generally reflected in the usual data sets because they don't come forward for help and therefore that hidden problem is even is, is even more hidden in those circumstances. Um, you heard a range of reasons for, for why that might be around um, you know, it's it could be cultural, it could be religious, it could be stigma, it could be the the local um, mores within their within their group that make this far harder to share within their family and communities, and far harder to reach out to services to help. And you also heard, interestingly, of gambling being seen as an economic opportunity where people perhaps are struggling to pay their bills already. They, they're making a decision about whether they take home the money that they've got in their pocket, which may not pay all the bills, or do they take a risk and try and increase that amount of money from some sort of gambling activity? In questions, um, Ronnie talked about a focus group that um, he'd uh, led, and this one was with um, women uh, from 
um, South, South Asian uh, community. And they were unconvinced that local authorities and I guess the wider public sector would really provide the understanding and cultural sensitivity and awareness in terms of helping them and their loved ones who were sub, um, um, subject to gambling addiction. So I think there was a real um, wake up call there in terms of how um, how reaching out to different groups within the community is managed. Um, also heard in questioning to um, Steve Watts about um, uh, um, education and, and how this is being managed in secondary schools or any um, setting at the moment is that it, it it's it's not being addressed at the moment. And I know we've got somebody from Hearts for Learning who will pick this up, but I think Steve made an interesting point that as an ex-deputy head, if it was part of the Ofsted agenda, schools would jump and would immediately begin to address this in a way that they're not doing at the moment. And he made a point which um, Henrietta also um, reflected on, um, as did Greg, about the need to have independence from the gambling industry in terms of funding, et cetera, on that score. In terms of thinking about the financial impacts, um, you were made aware that there is the immediate financial impact where people can't afford to pay their mortgage, they can't pay the electricity bills, etc. But also that can have legacy harm in terms of their future credit rating. So even if somebody manages to um, address their gambling addiction and decrease the gambling harm, the harm persists um, beyond that because of the, because of those, those sorts of um, effects that are that are occurring there. Um, Chris did a quick summary based on on that 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 uh, section there, and and he talked about the needs um, the need of, to involve schools um, that that the problem is being normalised, and actually we that in normalising gambling, we also then need to think about how we normalise destigmatizing treatment, etc., uh, uh, as a balance to that, and the need to involve parents and carers going forward. Um, Henrietta Bowden Jones talked about um, um, the the impact that gambling can have on the family in terms of family breakdown, higher levels of domestic abuse, and the direct impact on partners and particularly children um, was something that I don't think we'd be made aware of to this point. Was that children can be moved into multiple educational settings, and we know that the more disrupted a child's education is, the the impact it has on their learning outcomes, um, but that it can also lead to um, um, mental health issues for those young people as well. So there are costs around um, gambling harms that go beyond the immediate addict. Um, Henrietta made the point about the need for early identification being crucial and the need to have robust data sets that can be reliably interrogated to come up with high quality responses. And she also identified groups that weren't identified, that weren't picked up in some of those data sets. Um, again, echoing Ronnie around BME, um, prisoners and other groups because they're not willingly coming forward. So they don't appear within any any research or surveying. Um, a return to the plea for independence of the industry so that NHS treatment is funded independently, avoiding any postcode lottery. Um, and also she that Henrietta talked about data sharing, that there are parts of our wider system, such as banks, who have data on individuals and, and, and looking at mechanisms for having data sharing across the system to um, develop uh, appropriate responses and how um, interventions can be put in place to help people move off the path of addiction. Um, Henrietta welcomed the fact that there are, you know, ministerial references to gambling as a public health issue, which um, is, is great for scene setting, uh, but also around the need to perhaps look at the um, British Prevalence Survey and reinstigate those because the last one was conducted in 2007, which would give a, give a much um, more accurate picture um, of, of where we are with gambling harms. Um, and in questioning from, from Jan, um, Henrietta was talking about the need to ensure that this was cognizant of uh, where we are now in 2022, as opposed to 2007 in terms of ga gathering research findings and how those might be used. And that um, it doesn't seem appropriate from, in her thinking that um, the, the regulator overseeing the gambling survey, that there needs to be some clear water between that. Um, then we moved on to hear from um, Greg and um, he talked again about um, being anti-gambling harms, not anti 
gambling. Um, and he talked about um, a number of areas where um, changes could be made. And, and one of the, the, the one he identified as the key uh, was actually the one that he believed would have the most impact was looking at regulation and whether local authorities um, could have public health as the fifth licensing agency. And I, I assume that that is something that you'd won't want to pick up with Dan later this afternoon. Talking about treatment, that there needs to be a better system that requires significant improvement, um, that, that that's not going to move forward without that. Um, and looking at some of the other approaches that have been taken to handling addiction issues and what learning can be gained from that. Um, and then the final area we came up in this little list was um, that, um, um, it, this, that, that um, it should be statutory agencies, not the industry, who were driving this. Um, uh, his view was that the industry has significant power um, within within this arena and uh, has adopted similar approaches to other industries that have been adopted in the past and continue to be, for instance, around smoking and alcohol um, and, and how um, the pervasiveness um, can, can be, can, can undermine sometimes the outcomes that are being sought. Um, the echoing of it needing to be multi-agency, no one agency can drive this, it needs to be multiple um, uh, groups working together and that I imagine is the wider public sector, voluntary sector, um, etc. Um, and then looking at the disruptions, he was asking questions about what disruptors um, would be helpful and um, he made the, a plea for raising awareness among, um, among frontline staff on the basis that they're often more acutely aware of the problem earlier on than it gets into any data that, 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 we, that, that is used to inform this. Um, so raise, raising awareness, looking at the li licensing authority that whilst there seems to be a move to greater um, online gambling, there are still land-based gambling um, and local authorities looking at the number and location and how they manage people in need in those settings and how those are picked up. Um, where local authorities have any power over local advertising, street holdings, um, what measures are in place to um, ad address that so that um, those dedicated to gambling are perhaps more limited or where those hoardings um, are located are in less sensitive areas. Um, in answer to questions, um, he, I think Dean made the point about the, the public being generally unaware of the support available and how to access that. And so I think that goes into a wider awareness issue. Um, talked about the funding needs for treatments. Um, and I mentioned, I've already mentioned uh, Chris's, we need to normalise treatment um, and its availability to remove the shame. And I think that was quite an apt comparison, Chris, that, you know, Smoking doesn't seem to have the stigma that gambling, drugs and alcohol, but we need to kind of try and work out how um, in, in the public sector we can we can we can move on from that. So it, it seemed to me that just from this morning's uh, information gathering that you've been doing, it, it's it's fallen into five broad areas, which I imagine you're going to be building on this afternoon. So the one and these are in no particular order. These are just as I was making my notes, um, raising awareness. So, um, you know, raising awareness so that people know where to go to help for them for help for themselves or um, for, for somebody they know. Um, raising awareness among frontline staff so that they, they know how to signpost people and, and destigmatizing. So that's the first one of raising awareness. The second one was about uh, BME engagement and tailored approaches. And I'm sure you'll be coming back to that. Data has appeared in different um, guises during the morning. Again, you might want to quiz Jim on this later um, and, and sort of seeing where there could be more robust data sets, greater accuracy and how early identification to aid people earlier before they've got into problematic behaviour would be in immensely beneficial. So um, funding is the fourth area. Um, so that there's independent funding sources to um, support treatment, et cetera. And uh, the, the final one is that multi-agency um, angle. And that's that's um, me concluded, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, at this stage, uh, I, I won't take questions. I don't know why there's an echo. Hopefully that's gone. Yep, it has gone. Um, we will move straight on to the uh, afternoon schedule. Uh, we've, we've taken more of a national uh, and certainly non-local view this morning, although much of the evidence was relevant. 
We're now going to focus in on the Hertfordshire picture uh, and we'll run through first of all the NHS in the form of HPFT, um, then the County Council as Public Health Authority um, at around two, uh, looking at um, uh, policing matters and uh, criminal justice, 2.30 uh, citizens advice, uh, followed by hearts for learning, and then at around three, um, a district council point of view, given the importance of district councils in relation to licensing. So, um, Dr. Rakesh Magon, are you here? He is. Over to you, um, roughly 10 minutes for presentation and 10 minutes for questions, as you may have seen before. You're mute. Thank you. Um, so I think, um, uh, yeah, I've been listening to the other evidence provided uh, early this morning and um, a lot of the kind of background to the gambling and um, what, what it is and the prevalence and, um, you know, a certain kind of risk population, at risk population uh, has been covered quite well, specifically around the BME population, which we, we had a good um, level of discussion around ethnicity and race, the black Asian and minority uh, ethnic background being um, more likely. And I think if you look at the data, it's seven times more likely to have a gambling disorder uh, in, in, in terms of the ethnicity and race. So I just wanted to emphasize on that again. Uh, and uh, quite rightly put, uh, you know, to the to the to the panel in terms of the stigma and other barriers in accessing help for this uh, particular um, kind of uh, population um, uh, back people from BAME ethnic background. Uh, I think it's also important to think about the other risk uh, factors in terms of the population. Uh, male, uh, so being a man, uh, you are four times more likely to to have a gambling disorder. Uh, but we are also seeing um, from from the data that this is national data that there is a rise in the women uh, kind of gambling disorder as well. Uh, we don't know to what extent COVID has got uh, an impact on this, but we know that social isolation uh, and the lockdown in itself would have given uh, you know greater impetus to uh, this problem in terms of uh, people spending more time at home, lockdown online, and everybody has got smartphones and easy access to those uh, sites. Um, there's also something about um, a degree of um, you know work to be done at a much earlier level uh, at the uh, early intervention because we know that people who have family history, uh, of someone, the family has a history of gambling uh, disorders or the addictions, uh, and if they have seen the similar problems within their parents, you're more likely to develop gambling disorder, particularly if you have seen or experienced uh, a big win uh, at a very young age, uh, then you, you are, you're likely to really experiment that uh, in, 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 in the future. Um, one particular group I would like to emphasize on is uh, drug and alcohol. Uh, I can see we don't have representation from CGL here uh, or from drug and alcohol services, but uh, if, you, if you look at the predictors or the risk factors, two, two particular risk factors uh, are quite evident, which is alcohol, heavy use of alcohol, and also depression. Uh, those are the two kind of risk factors. Which one comes first? Uh, it's very hard to say, but we know that these are the two main indicators or main kind of risk factors. Um, and it's about um, being mindful about that. How do we really target our interventions uh, at the level where we are, people are accessing support for drug and alcohol misuse, especially heavy alcohol use? Um, and then uh, coming to the mental health, um, you know, the associated conditions are around depression, anxiety and personality disorders but depression anxiety seem to feature more and if you look at the you know research and there's one there's only one kind of big um, systemic review uh, and that's uh, in young people which is telling us that depression is quite uh, heavily associated with uh, with gambling disorder impulsivity uh, uh, traits um, we don't have similar level of data for adults but that's what we know so far um, and then also uh, knowing that certain physical health, well, not certain physical health condition, but just being having poor physical health well-being uh, is also greatly associated with um, um, with gambling disorder. 
So I, I think the reason I cited risk factor is because uh, it's about trying to understand that um, the scope of the uh, the problem, it's not just about having interventions at the mental health level, but also interventions at the public health, at the, um, you know, certain kind of target groups uh, to be uh, to be to be mindful about and also to not forget uh, people who are suffering with chronic physical health problems uh, who are also at risk of uh, gambling. Um, I was going to touch upon um, two things. Uh, one is about uh, the where are the barriers, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, again, purely from the clinical point of view, um, what barriers we are noticing on the ground. Um, I think the biggest barrier is recognition uh, at this stage. Um, uh, this has been talked about in the morning as well, in terms of what we need to do to improve recognition. Uh, recognition, not just at the healthcare setting level, but also recognition beyond healthcare at the community level. Um, so, um, you know, if people are accessing betting sites or people are accessing um, betting shops or uh, other places, community places, um, do they have obligation to really look at the risks or the uh, kind of early warning signs or sp spotting the signs and then really signposting them to relevant services? And do they have the skills to spot the signs? So how do we really ensure that there is training uh, at, at the frontline health level, uh, to support worker level, broader public health level workforce to recognize and to, um, you know, take steps uh, in order to signpost or steps to treat uh, the recognized condition. So recognition is a big uh, issue at this stage, uh, it, uh, not just amongst the uh, healthcare profession, but also beyond healthcare uh, at the public health level as well. Um, there are some, some screening tools have been proposed, and there are some there's some there's some research around use of screening tools in certain healthcare settings. But at the moment, we are not using any screening tools uh, on a regular basis uh, in terms of screening people for gambling disorders. Um, there is also um, a lack of um, you know understanding and lack of um, um, awareness of the treatment options available. Um, so it's about, OK, I think you have a gambling disorder. Do I actually know where to send you now next? Because there are no uh, kind of commission services within the NHS for gambling disorder as such. So you recognize then what to do next. You know, yes, you know, I think uh, a previous speaker was talking about uh, you could go on Google and you can try and find those websites. But it's not, uh, you know, a very straightforward way of looking at uh, the treatment options. So do the GPs, do the frontline clinicians, uh, does the community uh, kind of public health uh, workers, do they actually know what treatments are available? And if not, is there a need for developing a pathway? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, there is there is a, you know, within the current context of ICS, so integrated care systems, uh, we all of the healthcare organizations, voluntary sector, um, you know, and uh, social services, um, all statutory bodies are mandated to work together in an, using an integrated approach. And I think this is a very good opportunity for us to use uh, integrated approach uh, as a multi-agency kind, of, um, uh, kind of approach to deal with this very kind of um, uh, difficult area of where recognition is an issue and also treatment options are not uh, very well recognized, uh, not aware, people are not aware of them, and they are not commissioned uh, as such um, by the NHS. Um, <coughs> So, um, so, so those are the two things around recognition and uh, and the lack of treatment pathway or lack of um, kind of um, how do we get help for people. Now, in terms of the opportunities, I've al I've already touched upon that. Is there an opportunity to start thinking about um, uh, using um, gam recognized gambling screening tools when we are really working as a system as an ICS in delivering our pathways? So, a couple of examples I will share. Uh, we are currently you know, working as an ICS, uh, you know, as a mental health and learning disability collaborative. We are developing um, uh, pathways, for example, pathway for common mental health disorders like depression. Uh, and that, that pathway entails, uh, uh, you know, right from that point, a service user touches any services within the community, whether it's GP, whether it is, um, you know, at a school level, Everybody should have, an, you know, some basic skills of recognizing 
what are the uh, asking those two questions around depression, recognizing depression, screening for depression, and then signposting them to the right place. And we know that depression being a very kind of a, not only a risk factor, but also a, a strongly associated condition with gambling, should we be also really uh, introducing gambling screening at that stage uh, within that pathway? So that's an opportunity for us to look into. The other opportunity is about um, uh, thinking about um, uh, screening for gambling and um, you know identifying gambling disorders, particularly in at-risk population, people who are presenting a crisis. Um, so what we're seeing is there's an emerging trend, particularly in the light of COVID, where there has been an is, um, you know exponential rise in the level of mental health representations at the uh, at our ANEs. Uh, these presentations are not necessarily uh, from people who have pre-existing mental health problems. These presentations are with uh, some form of suicidal crisis for people who are going through difficult life circumstances. So they are presenting with uh, quite a lot of suicide-related dynamic risk factors which are stemming from the difficulties people have gone through over the last 18 months uh, of uh, in the lockdown and other financial difficulties they have gone through. So not necessarily presenting with any um, active or acute uh, mental health illness or mental illness, but with life stresses, uh, which is culminating into them feeling quite societal. And we know that gambling is quite strongly associated with deaths, uh, people entering into financial hardship as a result of gambling. And I think it's really important to factor COVID into uh, the whole kind of picture that how COVID would have increased the gambling in terms of uh, also increasing the risk of financial hardship, which in turn has increased the risk of uh, suicide, particularly in the male population where gambling is more prevalent. And we know that uh, middle-aged men are at high risk of uh, ending their lives by suicide. So is there an opportunity to also you know, thinking about screening actively uh, at, at that level where people are presenting with in crisis in the context of uh, life stresses and financial hardships, asking those specific questions around gambling uh, as a means to um, not only get them right help, but also reduce the risk of suicide. Um, the other areas uh, in terms of the opportunities, uh, there was a presentation on GAM care, and, uh, and again, that's been already talked about, that how do we make, um, we know that GAM care is not funded by the NHS, but there is plenty of opportunities for us to work uh, for working of GAM care and other services like um, Gambling Anonymous, uh, you know, as an within within the whole ICS as an integrated approach. So uh, we these these organizations should be working quite closely with the private with the public um, health, but also with the primary care as well as with mental health services. Uh, in terms of uh, aligning their goals and objectives and referral pathways uh, with these services. Um, I think I've already talked about the community-based recognition as an opportunity. And uh, and the other thing I wanted to just also uh, mention was uh, the role of social media. We don't have much evidence uh, as to what role social media is playing here in terms of uh, increasing the prevalence of gambling. Uh, but we do know that young people tend to spend a lot of time on social media. Uh, we know this from, from our data around uh, suicide. We know this from our data on other mental health disorders, especially eating disorders. And what learning we can extrapolate from those uh, learning is that uh, there is no counter on social media. Um, so there's plenty of, um, you know, uh, misinformation about um, you know, things like, for example, if I give an example of eating disorder, I've been working closely with, there's a lot of misinformation on eating disorder uh, and uh, how thinness and how being, you know, low weight being seen as a, uh, as, as, as something quite desirable, but there is no, there is no kind of evidence-based counter on social media that how this can actually be a significant problem if you, if you're not really uh, eating well and uh, if, if you are only uh, looking at those kind of videos or Information. So, do we have uh, do we have the information as to what's on the social media? What are these children actually seeing on social media? And do the, do we need to think about a evidence based counter on social media around gambling as well? Because we are seeing uh, that young people, especially people who are depressed and who are impulsive, they are and, and boys, 
they are at increased risk of gambling. So I'll stop here. Brilliant. Um, uh, Excellent. That really was fabulous. Um, I just wanted to see if I can pick some 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 su summaries out of that one. I, I, I think you emphasised a huge amount the degree to which uh, certain categories of person are, are are more prevalent, and and you know seven times in terms of BAME, is it four times in terms of male? Um, so I, I guess one piece of advice, generally speaking, is is given the fact you always have limited resources is to target them to to those groups which, which are much more likely to suffer. But I guess alongside that, there is the general disruption that county council, district council, other agencies on this call, as it were, uh, need to do. I mean, I hear what you say about social media, and that could be a role, I guess, for the county council's public health authority to be putting out correct sort of thinking on this sort of thing, uh, on, on, on gambling. Um, what struck me throughout the day is the degree to which it's difficult to tell if you have a problem. So putting out through social media and, and, and other means uh, warning signs. I mean, I think we, we, we certainly do that with uh, with alcohol. I mean, I've, I've, I've done a GP's questionnaire on that and, and I'm glad to say I was a long way off some of the warning signs, but uh, it's a standard list and GPs have a standard list for depression as well, uh, you know, initial sift. So we could be doing things like that. And if you if you are finding that you are looking forward to going to going online each night and uh, find yourself still there at two o'clock in the morning, you've got a problem and you need to find help. So um, I think there's a there, there seems to be sort of almost two approaches here. One is, is the as I say the general disruption, and the other is the targeted. Uh, is that is that a fair reading of what you've been telling us? Yes, I think uh, that's exactly. I think given the limited resources, it's about not forgetting those. We, from the evidence that there are certain groups who are at high risk and how do we target that population uh, and yes and then the general approach uh, but also um, social media is something which we are all really coming to, coming to terms with because yeah. uh, none of us are it's very hard to keep up with what's happening in, on social media um, I don't know what my daughters are doing on social media most of the time even though I'm someone who is quite paranoid about it and I keep a check on it but I still don't know so uh, you know so it, it's something which I think uh, we are learning more and more as we're going along that uh, what is the obligation from the social media and those services to, to ensure that our children and young people are safe Yes, I managed to ban my daughters from using social media at the dinner table, but that's probably as far as I got. <laughs> and of course, it is evolving. Um, you mentioned COVID a, a couple of times, and of course, uh, that put additional pressure on in terms of both it being a depressing experience, but also one in which um, people found they had time on their hands. So it was a, an opportunity to explore new new hobbies and vices. This is probably a step change, isn't it? I mean, you don't suddenly, once you've discovered these exciting gambling sites, um, you don't suddenly forget about them because you're back to work. So uh, this, 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 this may have caused us a, a cliff problem, um, I would guess. Um, uh, hmm. Yes, and also what we know is that, uh, you know, people who responsibly gamble, this tend to come from um, people who are employed and who are in a, you know, financially in much better position. But people who are at risk of problem gambling tends to happen in people who are unemployed. Uh, who are coming from more socially deprived areas. Mm. So if, if you want to really look at COVID, if that's what's fueling unemployment and financial hardships, then that is also increasing the risk of gambling in that particular, pop, uh, those people who are facing those hardships. It comes back again again to the same point, isn't it? It's, it's deprived areas and, 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 and I think minorities suffer more on all of these, on all of these things. One, one question I've got, which is, which is the concept of addictive personality. One of the reasons why I avoid gambling like the plague is that I have been, well, I'm permanently, but at the moment I'm off, off the weed, addicted to cigarettes. So I assume that if I uh, found an exciting looking website online uh, for gambling purposes, I could become addicted. Is that a, a, a meaningless concept or is it that we're all vulnerable anyway, regardless of whether we are more likely to take to the bottle or take to tobacco? So, so <laughs> It's a difficult one, but what we and I'm not an addiction psychiatrist right, and yeah. don't have specialists. But what we know is that, uh, interestingly, cigarette smoking has not been found to be as strongly associated with gambling, and even other illicit drugs don't seem to have the same association. Uh, for some reason, heavy alcohol misuse, heavy alcohol use, is strongly associated with gambling. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, well, they are, but although the uh, gambling disorder is now seen as an addictive disorder. 
uh, if you look at the previous uh, DSM-4s, uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Mental Health Disorders, they were uh, classifying uh, gambling disorder under impulse control disorder. But the latest guideline, DSM-5, is classifying it under addictive disorder, uh, meaning that it has got this, it, it follows the same etiological considerations and pathological, uh, you know, yeah. neurochemical basis as for any other addictive disorder. Um, so there is a shift change in terms of our understanding of gambling disorder as well. That's, that, that, that's, that's interesting, but I think you said also that the association with alcohol is clear, but you weren't sure which way around it was, or whether it's alcohol, uh, dependence on alcohol driving gambling, or the other way around. You th think it, because you could think you could actually construct an argument, could you, that you get so depressed by the gambling issue that you take to the uh, to the bottle. So, yeah. But you're not, you're not, you don't think the evidence is that yet there as to which way around it is. Okay, that's helpful. That was that was absolutely brilliant. We've been taking uh, copious notes of that. Feel free to hang around, but uh, uh, I suspect as uh, Deputy Medical Director of uh, HPFT, you've got other things you can do in an afternoon. <laughs> so uh, if you go, then thanks very much for your contribution, which is incredibly valuable. Um, that you. takes us to um, the County Council now in its role as Public Health Authority. I've got both uh, Jim McManus and David Conrad down. Um, and so it's uh, 10 minutes between them as a presentation and then up to 15 minutes for questions. Uh, welcome. Jim, um, thank you. I'm sure you have a few words. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to take no more than about three minutes and hand over to David. And uh, yeah. while we've been working today, I've created these slides of kind of summary points um, rather than repeat everything everyone said. So if we can go to the the first slide um, of points, and I can see colleagues of Fiona's put those up for us. Um, I guess for me, let me on full screen. It's quite small. Oh, it was even smaller in a second. Um, uh, if we if we can do slideshow and start, or Fiona, would it be easier if I shared them? Um, no, we want the next slide up, but we. I think sorry, we need... on my screen it is on slideshow, uh, but it's not now. Sorry, but it was. Um... There we are. That's there it. We are. That's is that Oh, okay, yep. it's exactly the same. All right, thanks. It sometimes does that. So brilliant. So I'll, I'll wrap through these. <clears throat> I think there seems to be some common ground that we're nobody's anti-gambling, but we want to prevent, reduce, and remedy the harms from it. And those harms are various and can be a light touch, but they can also be pervasive across lives and families. Um, it is a growing challenge uh, and a growing problem, but the data still remains patchy on some aspects of it, which David will speak more about than I will. Um, the data on both the extent of harms as well as the etiological factors is important. And I think the conversation chair that you just had um, with our HPFT guests has illustrated that relationship between alcohol and gambling, which one comes first and where do we intervene? Um, but we do have lots more evidence on policy and interventions. And I think one of the things that you have picked up as members is the need to reduce the stigma and normalise this as much as possible. There doesn't seem to be as much out there on the stigma uh, as perhaps there needs to be. I, I think it's quite clear that treatment alone is not sufficient, although if for some people it's necessary, uh, but nor do we have sufficient treatment. And um, the gambling industry's contribution is, uh, like all contributions, welcome, but shouldn't divert us from the fact this is a complex issue and as an industry, they have uh, interests. Um, treatment doesn't feature in the ICS strategy, and there is a, an NHS responsibility to commission that we need to address, um, and that needs to be part of the work going forward. And the powers sit across a variety of agencies, including district and borough councils, as well as um, the county council police and the regulators. Um, that leads me on to the next slide, which suggests that um, a public health approach is still a sensible one to take. Um, and you'll be familiar with this figure from page four of the background paper. The idea that we start by identifying the issue and quantifying it. Then we look at the risk and the etiological factors, then identify actions which prevent or mitigate the risk and work out whose role it is and then implement, um, evaluate and begin that cycle again. Um, 
some things are not in our gift. So Professor Bowden Jones was talking about um, the the need for regulation, the need for looking at advertising, but some things are. And we can distill those into some critical success factors, which I'll come on to in a moment. And we are trying a public health approach on drugs and alcohol and serious violence already in Hertfordshire. So to move on to the public health, uh, the critical success factors, the last slide, it seems to me those factors which we have in place already are the will of members to do something on this. Um, uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. And understanding that there is an issue and the dimensions of that issue. The synthesis of both the evidence and the perspectives from today, which this scrutiny will give, I think will be a powerful catalyst and that we can work together as a system. And from a public health perspective, the things we now need to identify include who leads, with which partners, uh, what governance do we need, um, and which level of ongoing scrutiny. Um, so I'll stop there rather than repeat uh, things other people have said and pass over to David, and I'm happy to ask, answer uh, any questions members care to ask. OK, I'll, I'll think I'll bring in uh, David first. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just, uh, just trying to share my screen if I can, so I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to avoid duplicating things that have probably already been covered, but uh, uh, probably what's worth me adding is, is just to flag that um, uh, we, ha we have done a, a brief report on our Joint Strategic Needs Assessment website looking at gambling, which just highlights some of the key literature, uh, research literature around, around this subject. And uh, uh, and we've done what we can with that, uh, using that evidence in terms of trying to estimate this scale of the problem for the Hertfordshire population. So uh, there's, we, we don't really have much in the way of, of, of actual data that is local local data that has been locally generated that tells us exactly what the what the scale of the issue is but the best that we can do is to apply uh, percentages from from national work that's been done uh, and research that's been published in the academic literature and look at what what that means in terms of, of the Hertfordshire population assuming that that you know, we work on the basis that roughly the same kind of uh, we're going to see the same kind of prevalence uh, amongst our local population and, and you know, broadly that, you know, we, we would assume that that's the case um, in the absence of, of, of more local data. So, uh, so I'll just kind of uh, briefly just flag up what, what we know. So um, there's an awful a lot more people gambling than there are problem gamblers. Gambling itself is, is you know, there's a very high prevalence of, of gambling activity amongst the general population. Uh, you know, it's over 50 percent, uh, you know, so obviously, you know, I mean, that equates to you know over half a million people for the population of Hertfordshire. Um, that goes down to around 40 percent if you exclude uh, playing the national lottery. Uh, but even aside from, you know, buying lottery tickets, there's still an awful lot of, uh, of, of people out there who are you know, engaged in some kind of gambling activity to some level or other. Now that might be you know, very occasional or it might be more frequent. Obviously, what we're mainly interested in is problem gamblers and uh, and people that are at higher risk uh, of, of developing a gambling problem. So we estimate that uh, that there's probably around 35, 36 thousand um people in Hertfordshire that would come into this category of, of being at risk gamblers um that's in the kind of low and moderate risk categories uh, and these categories are, are are based on the diagnostic criteria that the that the previous um speaker mentioned um in terms of the Problem gamblers. So these are people that that are you know suffering the most from uh, from the negative impact of, of, of gambling and you know and at the highest level of risk. Uh, that's around 0.5 percent of the general uh, population. So that equates to uh, 4,000 
700 or you know roughly uh people in in hertfordshire if we apply the same uh level of prevalence again to emphasize you know these are estimates we don't know exactly how many people are out there in the local population that that, that are in these categories but assuming that roughly that you know we, we would expect to see the same proportion as in as in the rest of the country that's the scale of of, of the issue that that we're looking at um you know that as i say i won't i won't duplicate probably what others have, have, have said but um you know, we have also uh you know summarized in this document which is available on the jsna website uh what is what is known from from the research literature so um so nice the national body that that um, puts out clinical guidelines uh, did a, a an evidence review fairly recently looking at um, looking at gambling and looking at, uh, uh, at, what, at what possible treatments there might be um you know there are um effective treatments for gambling um gambling addiction but uh they're working on some guidelines at the moment um for the management of pathological problem gambling but they won't actually be published until 2024 um so i'll i'll leave it there and uh, hand back over if there's any questions thank you um colleagues any questions uh jan madden Many thanks. Um, David, I was interested in, um, and it's been mentioned a few times today, about the National Lottery. Um, and you said that 50% of the adult population approximately in Hertfordshire um, do gamble from time to time. And if you take out the National Lottery, that's reduced to 40%. Is that, um, that 10%, is that the people who buy a the normal lottery ticket that's drawn on a Saturday night, or does that include all of the national lottery products like the the scratch cards? Because I would have thought that the, the scratch cards are a slightly different thing. Um, they probably concern me slightly more than the weekly national lottery that people put a pound on or two pounds on, whatever it is now. I'm just interested to know where what, what you're grouping into that, that sort of 10%. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's all of the national lottery products. Um, I will uh, I will pretty sure that that's the case. Um, certainly, what 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 we uh, you know what we do see is that um, uh, there are more people. Uh, a lot more people buying national lottery tickets than uh, than there are using scratch cards. So um, so we think around thirty six percent of of adults are, are buying national lottery tickets, around eighteen uh, percent using uh, using scratch cards. Um, and we also see a difference demographically between people that are buying national lottery tickets and people that are using scratch cards so uh, you see a higher rate of buying national you know playing the lottery uh, amongst the kind of uh, people in the least deprived areas whereas in the people in the more deprived areas you, you tend to see more scratch card uh, use so there are some interesting differences in that Thank you. Thank you. You froze just at the critical moment on my screen there, oh, but I, th <laughs> I think what you were saying was that there was a, a higher rate who play the, the weekly national lottery in Pe people the, in less deprived areas, and then in the more deprived area. areas. That's what I thought you were saying. Yeah, yeah. we've got a higher take of, of or higher use of, of scratch cards. Maureen McKay. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you, Chris, um, and thank you, Jim and David. My concern is about prevalence and the fact that it, this is an estimate of data, et cetera, um, and we haven't really got any figures on local data. Um, how can we collect this ourselves, et cetera? As, and we're a district council as well, so and we're looking to 
improve things there in our districts. But of course, this is a Hertfordshire one that you're talking about. And, and the biggest worry is that this um, prevalence is I'm concerned about who is running it and is it the Gambling Commission, etc. Um, that there are sort of mixture of questions in there. Sorry. Um, I wonder if that goes to the heart of the kind of system issue. Um, because as a public health authority, <clears throat> we don't have any levers to collect the data. Yeah. District councils have some levers to collect the data through the regulatory, but not all. Mm. The, the regulator has other levers, but you know the, the the data that David and colleagues got will be from the consumer data from the national lottery. So I think we almost have to follow the Sheffield model, which is one of the useful things for having Greg there of creating a data system. It is never going to be perfect um, because you're reliant on reporting systems to get prevalence and also people reported. But we do need, uh, I think this is one of those areas where you need tri to triangulate a range of different sources of data. And forgive me for jumping in and, and stealing David's thunder, but I think this goes to the heart of the system issue. We can't have a public health approach without good data, but we can't have good data without having a, a system willing to do it. And, and it's that kind of, we're at the beginning of that journey. And when we tried it a few years ago, we didn't really get very far. Well, yeah, so so the, the figures I've, that we've used in the JSNA, they're actually, um, or that we that we based our local estimates on, they're actually from from the health survey for England. So so that's a big a survey that's done nationally where they've taken a, you know they a sample of the population and those people have have, uh, have answered questions and completed questionnaires and um, and they'll have questions included in that which which measure you know, gambling addiction so so even even nationally that they, they are estimates based on a sample um rather than you know, you know data that's coming up sort of you know from a clinical level or something through, up through the system um so so yeah we, we are the, the data is 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 limited and uh, which you know which you know is a is is a limitation certainly you know it would it always helps us if if we're able to get um local data and um but but yeah that's 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 the best that's available even at national level it's it's just estimates based on a on a survey of a sample the other thing of course is even at local uh, level where we have got some information in some of the speakers we've heard today it's not shared as well so we have to get better at sharing our data that we do have thank you <laughs> Not your bell. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, just to refer back, obviously, um, David and uh, Jim's talked about obviously Greg and Greg's, uh, you know, good presentation earlier and about Sheffield. And I mean, Greg specifically talked about um, you know, the regulations, the most uh, important and most impactful. And then he talked about product safer, limiting access. And obviously, again, talking about public health as the fifth license and objective. So I think that's, I presume, what you'd want us to see joining up with the 10 districts in Hearts and as a li for licensing, bringing that in much more, that gambling should be part of the, much more part of the licensing where for all the districts. I know we've got a report coming up from Daniel and St Albans and what other, what the district's uh, environmental control and health uh, officers say. But I just wondered if you could just talk about that maybe. Um, uh, so that's the uh, that's the main thing, uh, and whether you've noticed when he also Greg says about too much gambling industry involvement or how that is come, whether you've noticed that as well in your role. Thank you. Um, I, I think in terms of so in terms of the gambling industry, you know I think we're talking about point not 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 one percent of their profits invested in. Uh, in in gam care and, and care and i think while it's useful um let's not pretend that this is doing anything to solve the problem and actually um the gambling industry fund a lot of the research into gambling and there is an issue about independence mm. so greg i think is right and i have seen that both locally and nationally i think greg is right to point out that we need to be very aware that industry plays tactics but i would also say 
you have to work creatively and constructively with industry because if you don't, um, then um, you kind of cut off your nose to spite your face. And it's walking that difficult relationship, I think, that you have to. Um, so I, I'd agree with you, Nigel, and I'd agree with Greg. I think on the issue of regulation, what we know from all of history is that um, regulatory measures for public health are always the cheapest uh, per unit cost per person changed, and they're always very effective. The the um, uh, bringing in changes to uh, moving from glass to plastic in Wales dramatically reduced the number of facial industries uh, injuries almost overnight in some places. The seatbelt change made a massive change. Um, smoking cessation is really important, but what caused the 14% drop in heart attacks um, over a three year period in England was at least partly the change in uh, being allowed to smoke indoors in pubs, for example. So you need regulation. I think I would strongly welcome uh, gambling as a or public health as a licensing objective for Hertfordshire. Uh, mm. That does raise the issue that, of course, um, licensees are very, very uh, good barristers and very, very good counsel. So I think we should look as a system at getting really good legal advice for when um, our partner council districts and borough councils revise their policy. We should make sure that what we do is legally as water site as possible. So I think this is a this all plays to a public health approach and a system approach, I think. Sorry, I've spoken too long there. No, no, uh, can we, can Thank we you. just follow that up? Because uh, to see what you have in mind, um, you, you mentioned um, smoking and not being allowed to smoke indoors in a pub and having a, a major effect. Is there an equivalent in relation just to pubs, which is obviously a very key part of licensing, but by no means the only part of licensing, or there are other things you have in mind? I mean, for instance, uh, you have you have machines in pubs which 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 encourage gambling. Is that the sort of thing that that you feel that uh, licensing authorities should be looking at, or is there something else? Uh, so I'd probably look at the concentration of uh, licensing premises and licensing machines in areas where there is highest level of poverty and highest level of problem drinking. Mm. Um, I'd probably want to work with the online gambling industry to put safeguards in place to say, look, if someone really is getting themselves into problems, that the stuff that they're already doing is ramped up. Um, in terms of what we do about pubs with ga gaming machines, I have to say I hadn't given it an awful lot of thought because uh, um, I, I think I'm probably more focused on how we get a, an approach that is not anti-gambling but prevents harm. And that for me, in terms of regulation, seems to sit much more in line with the sheer concentration of machines and gambling shops where people have problems rather than uh, rather than lead me to think about pubs. But I think one of the things that you're raising through the scrutiny chair is a whole load of issues that whichever partnership arises as a result of this, it's going to have to really think about yeah. and work out what's going to give the most important impact. So we should consider what you say carefully, I think. Mm. One final question from me is about context. I think, I didn't note it down, which I should have done, that the at-risk group in Hartford is, is 35,000. I think that was is that certainly that ballpark. Um, obviously, the, the clientele of public health in Hertfordshire is broader than that. So we, we're talking about pregnant teenagers and, 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 and gum and all sorts of things. Um, compared with the other groups, that public health for the county council worries about. How does 35,000 stack up? Is it a much larger group, the largest, or fairly typical, or what? Um, so I, I uh, don't want to steal David's thunder again. David, you might want to come in on this. I mean, in terms of people with living with HIV, yeah. um, that's about 1,500 to 2,000. In terms of people at risk of HIV who are on PrEP, you're talking about 30, 40,000. So um, uh, I think it's, uh, I would say when, it, when it's big enough to be of the quantity that David has estimated, it's looking you in the face and saying this is a yeah. public problem of, of serious proportions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you both, uh, both Jim and um, David uh, from the, the County Council's uh, Public Health Department. We're now moving on. Um, bang on time. Uh, probably spoke too soon, who knows, uh, to uh, police and criminal justice. So we've got, first of all, um, uh, Detective uh, Superintendent uh, Black, and then um, from Hearts Constabulary, and then Ertha Heptonstall from Gamcare's Criminal Justice Projects team. Um, so I'll just take you um, one after the other, and then again, uh, questions as appropriate. So uh, Superintendent Black, are you there? Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, can I just, uh, Chair, just for information, I'm just um, I'm on call, so if I get a phone call, I do apologise. Um, oh, we understand uh, that. Uh, yes. Police have well, duties, apparently. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, Doug Black, uh, Detective Superintendent for Hertfordshire Constabulary. Uh, within my portfolio, I have uh, local policing crime, which covers acquisitive crime, but also within my portfolio, I have uh, offender management department. So I manage uh, high risk offenders as well as the lower risk uh, offenders within the, uh, the county. I wasn't here for the first part of the morning, so apologies if I repeat some of this. No, no. Uh, but just picking up at your summary uh, just after one o'clock, uh, and I do apologise, we've got building work as well. Um, the five areas I, I noted were raising awareness, uh, BME, engagement, data quality, funding and multi-agency approach. And uh, so when I got to, when I spoke to uh, Natalie about coming in uh, for this afternoon, I did some uh, quick research around our own capability. And, and what I would say is, if I just quote Don, Donald Rumsfeld, is um, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And, and that's the sense I'm getting from a few of the other speakers before me. So um, I went into a performance data manager around gambling. And I'll hold my hands up. It's something that the force does not really concentrate on in terms of key uh, word searches. So in the last year alone, uh, we've not got one crime directly lin linked to gambling. It doesn't mean to say, and I need to put that into context, doesn't mean to say that, that gambling is not a, uh, a driver for some of the crime committed, but we haven't got a, a key word search. So I'll come on to what we'll do with that going forward. Um, again, uh, I just asked the uh, chief inspectors in the community safety partnerships, which there are 10 within the county, just a quick straw poll. I asked if there'd been any issues around gambling uh, for call for service. So had police been called to betting shops, a pub in terms of a, a coin machine, uh, domestic abuse uh, or illicit gambling? The quick poll said no. But again, it's not in terms of our, our thinking. It's not up there in terms of our threat and risk. Um, I went into serious and organised crime because obviously there's some linkage there with uh, gambling and illicit gambling around serious and organised crime. And, and within that, I went into the serious fraud and cyber unit. Uh, again, because it's not a key search, they've got nothing in terms of any jobs that I could reference to give some sort of evidence base for this, um, this meeting. Uh, I did some further research. Uh, I looked at the government, um, local government association, and forgive me because I haven't had much time to prepare. Uh, I'm just going to read this verbatim, but I wasn't aware that Cheshire Police had um, run a criminal justice pilot scheme, which um, the speaker after me may cover off. So forgive me if I take that thunder. But um, Game Care and Beacon Counselling Trust undertook a pilot uh, with the criminal justice system in Cheshire. Um, which was last year, uh, which 250 uh, individuals across the wider criminal justice uh, system were trained to use the lie slash bet screening tool. So these are police and other partner agencies uh, looking to use a tool kit. Um, out of the 760 individuals screened, uh, there were 99 positive results. 29 of those uh, 99 uh, chose to uh, volunteer for an intervention for their problem through gambling treatment services. Um, as part of that pilot, Cheshire have begun to uh, screen people for gambling issues at the point of arrest, which I'll tie into later in terms of a half perspective. And the police force in Cheshire have already, uh, already screened people for drugs or alcohol issues and now gambling. Um, and they have confirmed that since they've done that, the 13% arrested uh, as a total, um, they've confirmed that they've got a gambling issue, which is 13 times higher than the national average, 
but again, I need to put that into context. Not all police forces will record that, so it will seem quite a significant spike. But that I thought was quite interesting when I looked at the local government association in terms of um, peers, so something that I could look at uh, going forward with the group. In terms of opportunities, uh, I've looked at what we do internally. So um, gambling is not a, again, again, a key word. There, there are nudges to ask the question, but it's not highlighted as such. So again, I can take away this uh, from this meeting that uh, we can ensure that we do start to capture that data. So if I look at the assessments we could uh, improve upon, the custody assessment, is gambling an issue? And if, if so, you know, excuse the pun, but we have a captive audience and we can uh, try and uh, get people to look at that, assess whilst they're in custody uh, for opportunities to volunteer. And again, it has to be voluntary uh, for opportunities for signposting. The domestic abuse uh, assessment, it does talk about financial implications, but again, you can change the wording to nudge people to ask about the point of gambling. Is it, is it an issue? Um, missing people, looking at the assessment. I've dealt with a number of people who've gone missing because of a gambling issue. It's not been the main cause, but it's been in the background. But we, were, we wouldn't have captured that because it's not a keyword search. So something we can tighten up to help improve the um, the overall picture for the for the county. Uh, mental triage cars. Yeah. Again, you know, we've I've just heard a, a, from your previous speaker um, around mental health or previous speaker on mental health. I'm not sure we capture that. We will deal with the issue and we'll move it on. But do we actually capture the issue around gambling? I, I don't believe we do within the service. Um, I've spoken to a colleague who uh, is my detective inspector for the offender management unit. I've asked what does the referral look like for multi-agency, so from probation service coming into the police to uh, fulfil this cohort. Um, and again, gambling is not highlighted on there. So again, an, an opportunity for improving and nudging that data capture. So that will be taken forward. Um, also with our own IOM assessment forms and plans, we don't ask, we don't delve enough around the gambling asset um, addiction. We, we, go, we, we concentrate on the drugs and alcohol. So an opportunity there as well. And out of the 75 people on the uh, IOM cohort, we can only identify one person that has a gambling addiction. And that's not the reason why they're on the cohort, as in, is it why they went to go steal cars, et cetera? It wasn't, but they've just, they've just alluded to the fact they're a gambler. Um, so going forward, um, I'll link in with uh, other Athena forces, which um, is our crime recording um, system that we use here in Hertfordshire uh, and across beds, cams and hearts uh, and other forces, just to see if we can get a key keyword search available going forward. So I'll work with our data uh, engineers on that. Um, wider considerations, uh, I, I thought, have, are we, is the group going to link into uh, the IBAG? So the independent uh, advisory group, I, I'm not sure what their makeup looks like in terms of uh, betting shops or the gambling industry within that, but maybe that's an opportunity uh, for this group going forward. Um, Coroners, I don't, I don't, I don't know if the coroners are part of this this meeting, but ha, uh, is there any data from the coroners in terms of suicide notes or anything that may be outside of police knowledge as to why the cause of death? But there may be some data capture there, uh, and also just the um, community safety strategic board, so domestic abuse boards, drugs and alcohol board, um, the IOM, uh, the SOC board, adult and children's services. Is there? Uh, is there a way of just making sure that that is nudged to, to the fore when we're talking and dealing with certain issues? It's just a general question. Um, and then the final one is, is this on the community safety manager's radar within the CSP? So outside of the, the police's remit, is there an opportunity for the community safety manager down more at a local and district level to, to, to help with maybe that assessment? So I, I do apologise that I can't offer no know, evidence, not... but um, it has made us think about the issue and just made us start looking at our own internal policies and procedures. No, that's, that's very helpful. We'll come back to you potentially with questions. I'm going to bring in Eartha straight away and then we'll question you both, uh, if I may. Hello. And you're mute. Classic. Hi. You're not the first um, to know, so that, 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 that's fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, getting to 10 past two with no one on mute, that's pretty admirable. I have some slides to share, so am I, am I okay to share my screen? Um, yeah. Uh, I've yeah, got I it said, all done on my end. I, I, I said no earlier on, but uh, I've been a bit softer. Uh, how many slides are there? There are three. I can oh, do three, it for three's now. Fine. Three's fine. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, apologies, there's four, but... Uh, four, four is the right order of magnitude, as long as you can put it on full screen, because that's absolutely essential. Yes, yeah. you clearly know how to do that. Right, yeah. good. Fab. Well, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Eartha Heptonstall, and I am the coordinator at GAMCARE for the criminal, uh, Gambling Harm and Criminal Justice Programme. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Hertfordshire project that uh, we, were, we were running between 2018 and 2020. Um, as I said, I've got a few slides to take us through. I'm going to just summarise the project here and then go through some key learning, some key challenges, and then some sort of potentials for systemic change that we uh, put forward at the end of our two year project and which we've since been working towards um, in different ways. So the Hertfordshire um, project was funded by the Hertfordshire Poli uh, Police and Crime Commissioner. It was initially funded for one year and it was successful in securing a second year of funding, which meant it ran from 2018 to 2020. Unfortunately, the second year overlapped with COVID. So the last six months were incredibly different um, to what we'd, we'd hoped. But as you'll see, we, we achieved a lot. We, we learned a lot and we continue to use uh, what we learned today. So we embarked on a whole systems approach when we when we were doing this program in that we wanted to work with all of the, the criminal justice settings right through custody suites, point of arrest to courts, prison, probation, voluntary sector organisations and any other organisations that were working with uh, people in contact with the criminal justice system. Um, so the speaker before me mentioned that Cheshire Police Custody Suite, GAMCARE and our partners have done um, work in the criminal justice system prior to this program, um, but none in such a way as this whole systems approach uh, working with everybody. So over the two years, we established a network of 13 uh, criminal justice organisations. This included um, lots of different probation teams. At that point, it was CRC and NPS, the prison there and the teams within that prison. Uh, the police custody suites across Hertfordshire and the voluntary sector organisations that were working there too. Uh, by virtue of the money coming from an innovation fund, we were able to be innovative. We were able to work with those criminal justice settings, asking them what they needed, what they wanted, what they could accommodate. And we were able to um, work with that. So we designed a suite of client facing resources. This included leaflets, posters, screening cards and towards the end of the two years, videos, uh, 45 second videos to be played in sort of um, communal settings for both prison and probation settings. And these evolved over the two years as we learned more and uh, spoke to more people and understood the topic uh, more so. We did a lot of training. Um, we trained, I trained over 500 professionals, again, working in prisons, probations, police settings, voluntary sector organisations, court settings to raise awareness of gambling, problem gambling and the links between gambling and harm, and also to raise people's or increase people's confidence in talking about gambling um, among gambling harm amongst their service users um, and people on their caseloads. We had a lot of conversations about screening questions. Where can we get a screening question into current processes that will enable gambling harm to be identified? Gambling harm is also known as the hidden addiction. So without sort of methodical and explicit reference to um, an experience of gambling harm, um, it can lead to people sort of being missed um, as there's still a lot of stigma and taboo around putting your hand up um, and saying, I've got a gambling problem and I need support. So we developed a single question screening tool for gambling harm and we implemented this at 11 key points across the criminal justice system in Hertfordshire. And from these key points, we set up referral pathways into GAMCARE's support network. In the fifth, with the fifth um, sort of column here in this infographic, we then, for those people who were referred into our service, we delivered some support and treatment to them, most commonly on probation and whilst in prison. And this is through a combination of one-to-one -one sessions and providing our brief intervention in-cell workbook um, that could be completed in-cell. So it was a really rich programme in terms of what we learn. So year one, we learned a lot about the relationship between gambling and crime, and we found that our findings supported the existing literature 
on the link between gambling and crime, as well as the offences most commonly associated with gambling. So those links talk to um, the fact that it can be a direct link. You know, you can clearly see that somebody's gambling leads they're offending. A co-symptomatic link, which often refers to there being a third factor, drink or drugs, which increases the likelihood. And then the third link, unrelated, somebody gambles, they offend, there's no link. But what ties those three links together is that identifying and then supporting somebody with their gambling harm has a real positive uh, potential for, for great impact. Then the offences linked uh, most associated with crime, we've got income generating crime, we've got the emotive crime, so any crimes that are driven by the high emotional state in the moment, such as frustration and loss, and then domestic abuse and interpersonal violence. Um, there are also sort of a growing body of evidence to, to speak to that relationship as well. We were also able to sort of dig into the complexities of the relationship and the fact that we're dealing with people um, with you know, a multitude of morbidities, experiences, past experiences, current experiences, which will which really does mean that every every person's experience of gambling crime will be slightly different. But we saw some trends when working with the guys in HMP Mount, such that some people's offending behaviour led to their gambling. So drug dealers, for example, with a huge surplus of cash, they would then spend that cash in casinos and by our metric system would develop what we would consider a gambling problem. Another layer in that, which is incredibly interesting, is that they weren't experiencing financial harm in the same way. So in the community, financial harm is a significant harm. I think about 70% of callers to our national gambling helpline report some financial harm. But because people were gambling with money that didn't have the same value, you know, if you lost a grand, you'd go out the next day, um, deal some drugs, commit a theft, commit a robbery, it's replaced. There wasn't that same experience of financial harm, which I'll mention later, uh, led us to consider the sort of um, treatment models uh, needed to be tweaked and amended to speak more directly to people in the criminal justice system um, experiencing gambling harm. So the second point there, a full system approach, the need for culture change. So this was quite evident from quite early on. Um, we found that the system itself wasn't quite ready for, for implementing um, this sort of new topic or, 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 or um, welcoming this new topic in terms of ways of working. Now, this isn't a blame game. This is about capacity. This is about resource. And what the previous speaker mentioned, you know what you know, you don't know what you don't know. So we really spent the first 18 months, two years raising that awareness, raising people's confidence. So other issues were often prioritised, such as other addictions, drugs and alcohol, mental health, um, which is understandable. However, there's an interdependency between gambling and other addictions, gambling and mental health, gambling and education, work, crime. And without treating both the gambling and the and the other issue, um, yeah, one can't be dealt with without dealing with the other. And it also speaks to the fact that each part of the criminal justice system, as they operate quite differently with different processes, will need specific um, attention as to how best to incorporate gambling harm awareness and gambling harm support and treatment options. So finally there, understanding potential gambling support and treatment within the criminal justice system. Um, so we need different cl clinical models um, for different parts of the criminal justice journey. So this is quite critical. So if you take um, somebody in prison, for example, um, what category prison they're in and what length of sentence they have will massively impact what kind of treatment is appropriate and relevant for them. If they're in the community um, and they're awaiting sentence, that needs to be taken into account. If they're in the community and on probation, that needs to be taken into account. You know, what other priorities are they working with? Um, and also, we really need to take into account how streamlined um, we need to be. The criminal justice system is stretched. Everybody's working at capacity and then some. So we really had a focus on how do we make our work streamlined? What can we do to make sure that what we're doing doesn't interfere or you know hinder the current processes how can we slot in so that really led to um, that single screening question I spoke to earlier about making things streamlined and easier to embed so well, in year two three or long or long. yes sure yeah. uh, so year two was a lot of reinforced learning um, as I said six months of it was about uh, was impacted by COVID, but it was really talking about um, continuing to develop, develop our knowledge base, feed that into our products, our resources, our training, our conversations, etc. 
And um, it became clearer and clearer that there was a culture change required such that gambling harm needed to be treated with parity with other addictions such as um, alcohol and drugs. So some key challenges were difficulty in engaging frontline criminal justice professionals. Uh, as mentioned, very stretched, very busy, couldn't attend those key training sessions, which were crucial for increasing awareness and increasing confidence. Um, and then which was a sort of vicious cycle because by not attending the training, they didn't prioritise it um, and it sort of went round. Systemic barriers in terms of um, then introducing screening questions and re making referrals into our support system was compounded by the fact that they weren't able to access our training session because they were so busy. So they're not, not necessary allowances being made there. And the third point, so challenges in engaging service users, um, a complex cohort, very busy, um, chaotic lives, um, you know, not again prioritising gam gambling harm support treatment for themselves, um, perhaps again linked into the fact that their probation officers, police officers, prison officers themselves um, weren't aware of the sort of importance of uh, prioritising. Again, not a blame game, this is about uh, increasing awareness and increasing confidence for everybody. So a few influential factors towards this, again a co complex cohort, so there are other comorbidities as I touched on before. Little pre-existing thinking about problem gambling, you know, this is still a very emerging area in the past sort of two, three, four, five years. This, this topic is growing exponentially. Um, so at that time in 2018, there was even less uh, conversations and less understanding than there is now. Um, and gambling activity is normalised. So gambling activity is very normalised in the community and in prison. It's technically prohibited, but it's a cornerstone of prison life, as is in the community. However, what's not normalised is reaching out and asking for support and help and that awareness of what, what is out there. And working within a stretch and a stress system was sort of a reoccurring um, challenge to us um, in that staff as I said, don't have time to attend training sessions, don't have that confidence then to make a referral um, and have change fatigue in terms of voluntary sector organisations coming in and out. So the final thing I want to share with you and which I am aware is very small, but I can uh, share a link in the chat to a report that we've produced that has this on the back page. But it was a diagram we put forward um, as part of our submission to the Howard League on uh, potential for systems change. So the purple rectangles are the core system change, the circles are potential actions, and then the green boxes are improvements following change. So I'm not going to go through this point by point as, as we're sort of constricted by time, but I encourage everybody to have a look at this in their own time and would be able to see what we've put forward and, and then what we've already actually achieved and not just ourselves, but the conversation in terms of probation reform. You can see that in the top right hand corner. Gambling has for the first time been included as an offender need within the probation reform, which is fantastic. Um, asking the question, you know, we've got lots more people asking that question at key points of the criminal justice system. Um, and we're working harder and harder on getting that one to one um, slash group support to people in contact with the criminal justice system who are experiencing gambling harm. So I will leave it there. And yep, I'll, as I said, share the link. Well, we'll need to reshare that. Okay, that's no problem. I'll share the link with you. Right. Okay, so I've got the questions from Z Hart to begin with. Thank you for that. Uh, very interesting um, presentation. I'm interested in what you have talked about your one to one sessions. Can you tell me, is there a maximum uh, how many times um, somebody would actually engage with these sessions? Because everything naturally has a, a budget implication. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. So GAM Care Support and Treatment uh, is free of charge. We don't charge anything for um, delivery or sort of provision. Um, GAM Care operate on a, on, a, on a basis that is led by the, the service user. So for somebody, we'll meet their needs. So for somebody, it could be one session, it could be two sessions, it could be 10 sessions. The average is six to 10 sessions once a week. Um, and then every, say, three sessions, it will be an assessment using our metric systems to assess the individual's gambling behaviour and then their um, sort of wider well-being 
um, needs and then you know they'll assess it with the treatment practitioner on a case-by-case -case basis um, and then leaving that service there's an aftercare system where they're getting uh, in, a practitioner gets in touch with them at three, six and nine months um, to touch base, see how they are. And just to remind them that the door is always open uh, and people can come back into treatment as and when they need. Can I also just have a quick follow up question for that. Um, it's about um, the way professionals are trained to interact with people. What sort of training do they actually receive? Yeah, so our training covers introduction to gambling, problem gambling and gambling harm. We look at statistics and data and research and evidence about gambling and its links to crime. We look at risk factors. So then we look at identification, how professionals can identify gambling harm amongst their service users. So risk factors, triggers, um, warning signs. We look at the screening question that we developed and have conversations around where that screening question can go and therefore um, identifying that gambling harm and then we look at depending on the length of the session you know there's longer sessions and in these longer sessions we also explore motivational interviewing techniques and we use something called frames um, which is um, it's a acronym for for sort of ways to shape a conversation to unpick someone's relationship to their gambling and then we look at what support options are available to people both in the community and in custody um, and then we talk about how those referral pathways can be set up or how signposting can be made. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thanks, Dean. Well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for Eartha and also the, the detective. And it's interesting that the detective, um, this is no disrespect to him, but it's good that he was honest and said that, you know, the gambling didn't come up on their radar when he searched everything and when they looked at everything, it's all all the other crimes, um, obviously the crimes of violence and other crimes, but then obviously you're obviously working particularly with people who are already in um, the crime situation and in criminal justice system and you're saying, well, it's, it's that obviously it's the hidden addiction, as you say, gambling harm, and that almost all of them, and there's a culture anyway in prison, in, in um, you know, whether it's youth uh, detention, and then when they get to prison, the whole thing in prison is about, it's part of the, the culture of gambling, it's the thing they do to pass, and also they, they to make money within the prison and to stay in with people within the prison. So you're using that. So it's very interesting that, and then you talked about, you know, often it, it means less to some of those who are, if you like, long-term criminals, drug dealers, who suddenly, you know, are having a, a ward of a thousand pounds going and blowing that in a casino or somewhere else is not such a big thing for them but i'm just wondering if the techniques that you're using and the way you're using because you're particularly talking to people in the criminal justice system can that be used outside because we're talking earlier about that you know people don't want to come forward to say that it's a shame uh, it's a shaming thing they don't want to come forward to say they've got a gambling addiction and, and i'd say that the majority of people we're talking to talking about are people who are um, not, not to be nasty, but people who are, are norm, so-called normal people, I mean people who have not been involved in the, the criminal justice system as such, or the majority of time, you're dealing with people who are, can we be able to learn from what, how your techniques in talking to those in the criminal justice system who clearly you can see that gambling is, a, is an issue, and mm -hmm. the police haven't seen it standing out, not that it's that it's there behind. Can we use some of your techniques and what you found to deal with the majority of people outside and even people that um, Steve Watts earlier would have come across, so-called ordinary parents? Again, I'm putting the word ordinary in quotes. Do you know what I mean? What I'm trying to get at. What, you've, what you're using, the techniques you're using, the people you've talked to who are in the criminal justice, and how can we maybe use some of that and learn from that to deal with the so-called the majority of people who are likely to get to being it. If you see what I mean, I'm hard to get there, but I think you get what I mean, maybe. When you say techniques, do you mean um, when we're delivering treatment to people in contact with the system, the different, cons you know, the, that financial harm, we have to take into consideration that they need a different approach, those kinds of techniques? Yeah, yeah, but is the stuff, you, things you can take from that to also link to people outside or people who've maybe never been involved in the criminal justice system, system at all, but it's the things that you've learned that you're putting across from your funding and that we could use for, the, if you like, the majority of people who are going to be affected by um, gambling crime. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure our learning can be taken from the system and applied to people in the community, because I think there'll be people who are in the community who aren't necessarily in touch with the criminal justice system, who have had similar experiences and have similar challenges. Just because they haven't necessarily been arrested or put in prison doesn't mean they'll be experiencing the same, perhaps, um, the same challenges or the same experiences. So I think there is so there is definitely scope to lift some of the learning and apply it to, to people in the community for sure. Good, that's what I wanted to get. Thanks, thank you. Cheers. Okay, um, I think, yes, we, we're just on time. So I, I may come back with a couple of questions I want to uh, raise later. Um, uh, because we need to move on to Citizens Advice now uh, with Melanie Belhage. Are you here, Melanie? Yes, you are. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Is that you, Melanie? Uh, yes, hi, sorry. I'd, yeah. I'd missed that yeah. last bit. <laughs> hi. Um, so if I... Um, Melanie from Citizens Advice in Stevenage. Yeah, yeah. five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, ran a project. Um, it's kind of just specifically focused um, on gambling harm and um, sort of reducing the impact of gambling related harm. Um, so whether that was on the individual who uh, was gambling or a family member or, or friend who was impacted by it. So that project ran from 2019 to um, 2021. Um, and it wasn't just a Stevenage based project. So we employed um, a caseworker that worked across the southeast. Um, and so the aims of the project were to provide training, um, obviously, to other um, professionals who um, would um, be sort of having um, meeting people who might be um, impacted by gambling related harm um, to um, provide help directly to individuals um, and um, to, pro you know, to provide, um, it, I think the main kind of focus was to identify those individuals first, because I think that was a um, particular sort of difficulty um, and to raise awareness of um, gambling related harm and the services available. Um, so we um, introduced within Citizens Advice some screening questions. Um, so the first year that the project was um, operating, we were able to operate a, obviously a face-to-face -face service. So when clients visited us, it didn't matter whether it was, um, they didn't have to identify um, as approaching us for advice related to um, a gambling um, problem. We were asking all clients um, the screening questions um, so that we um, you know, would hope to identify any clients that um, sort of were um, sort of suffering from gambling related harm um, or had family members who who were um, and then offer the appropriate um, sort of help and support after that. Um, the second year of the project, obviously, we were, it was coronavirus and we weren't able to to sort of do that. So it wasn't as easy to gather the um you know, do those sort of screening questions over the, the telephone. They were sort of much easier in person. Um, but we did carry on um, providing the training sort of both within the Citizens Advice Network, but then to um, other partner organisations and sort of stakeholders as well. So that um, that all sort of carried on. And obviously there were refer referral routes um, into our service within the um, Citizens Advice Network and again with partners. Um, and obviously once clients had been identified, um, then there was lots of support um, and help available. We worked really closely with an organisation in Cambridge called Break Even. Um, also worked with GAMCARE because the project, sorry, I forgot to say at the start, the project was funded by Citizens Advice and GAMCARE. Um, so we worked really closely with Break Even, GAMCARE, and a Stevenage based organisation called The Living Room. Um, what we did find was that once we were able to identify that clients, um, you know, were at risk of gambling, gambling related harm and and wanted advice um, that there was lots of support available. The difficulty was identifying clients in the first instance. What we found um, with our 
of the support available um and like i said there was lots of support available but um for um clients who lived in Stevenage where we were referring them for example to the living room and and we had really good referral pathway and could often get them seen sort of the same day or the next day um actually um what the clients had a problem with was sort of turning up to the living room's office and being seen to be going there. Um, I think it was probably because that organisation is um, particularly known for um, giving advice to people in relation to sort of drug and alcohol um, problems. So in, in from that point of view, I think even before um, we all had to kind of go digital and be doing everything uh, via Teams and Zoom, um, we were referring a lot of our Stevenage-based clients to organisations where they would be getting help virtually um, or over the telephone because I think um, the clients wanted that sort of anonymity. Um, so that was that was something that we kind of found that came out of it, um, of it for us. Um, And obviously, once sort of clients were within the Citizens Advice Network um, and they'd been given kind of appropriate levels of support and help with um, gambling um, addiction, then if they uh, quite often um, other issues of debt, housing, benefit issues um, will obviously be highlighted and we could then refer them on for help um, with specialist caseworkers who um, who could then help them, you know, to you know, get a sustainable budget in place and um, apply for additional benefits if if they're eligible um, and that kind of thing. Um, so it was a really successful project, uh, but unfortunately that ended um, last year, the funding for that project. Um, but we still do gather um, via our um, sort of client database, we still gather um, evidence where gambling is identified um, and um, so we gather some sort of soft outcomes around um, the gambling issues that they're facing um, and we still, um, still, us locally at Citizens Advice Stevenage and Citizens Advice nationally, are, you know, still regularly um, on their social media sites, um, provide information and advice about gambling and gambling related harm to clients. OK, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Well, I'm waiting for colleagues to chip in. I keep hearing about screening. This is starting to become an afternoon theme, isn't it? Because the uh, previous speaker mentioned screening and I think my inference Doug was talking about screening as well uh, at a crime site. This, this clearly is a major issue that we need um, to look at and emphasise in, in, in our deliberations. Yeah, I think often with clients, particularly we, you know, there's, there's a big link with debt and, and, sort of, and gambling harm. Clients often don't come to you and say the reason for my debt problems is X um, and, and they're often very unlikely to say it if it's something like gambling that has caused them to be in um, you know, significant amount of debt. Um, so I think the screening questions um, help people, you know, they don't have to vocalise that no. they've got that problem. Yeah, um, Although one thing that hasn't been mentioned, I, I was going to mention before you came on, had there been slightly more time in that section, was the issue of fraud. Um, um, as from my accountancy training um, years ago, uh, we were one or two types of people to watch out for. One, one um, with gambling problems, which was difficult to spot, and the other was uh, uh, managers who didn't take holidays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> up, but uh, fraud, uh, fraud is something which can be triggered by uh, by debt, is it not? Uh, yes, yeah, I guess so. Uh, Maureen. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm just, um, I'm obviously from Stevenage and I wondered about the data that you um, mentioned. How, do you share it with a local council? And I, I'm talking anonymously um, about gambling harms, etc. Do you share any of this data? Um. The honest answer is I don't know, but if we were asked, there probably wouldn't be any reason not to share it because there's lots of other data that we do share um, with the with um, both the local authority and Hertfordshire County Council. Um, and unfortunately, I I'm fairly new in post, so I wasn't here when the project was sort of running. Um, otherwise, I'd be able to tell you 
off the top of my head that yes we did or no we didn't but um i know we wouldn't sort of in our annual report or kind of normal reporting report to the council specifically but there wouldn't be any reason if they wanted to you know we work really closely with them so we'd be more than happy to share any data that we had no it's not an automatic thing but it you do share it with the local authority that's what i wanted to know thank you yeah I mean, the one of the issues about data is trend lines and and you know maybe to new imposed be able to comment at this point is whether whether there's actually an upward trend that you can observe in terms of uh, gambling referrals to systems advice um it's not data that i've got at the moment but it's something that i i can i am definitely able to get if it's if it's needed or requested yeah, i think i think it might, yeah. be, might be useful and, and know that our officers will make a note of it. it's a couple of other things i'm going to suggest um uh later at well, once must was just now uh, the other is uh, um, a reference earlier on to coroner's uh, inquest reports as to the degree to which there is a suicide prevalence that is changing or noticeable, whether it's constant. And that, uh, I suspect, is in the public domain. Uh, colleagues, any further questions or shall we let um, uh, Melanie stand stand down? I'm not seeing anyone coming back at me. So thank you very much, Melanie. Hang thank you. Again. Um, and um, bringing on Kate Stockwell from Hearts for Learning. Welcome. You are. Thank you. It's Kate Stockdale, actually, not Stockwell. There was a, a, a really? tiny. You're a Dale, are you not a well? I'm a Dale, not a well. OK, yeah. So um, I'm very pleased to be part of the meeting today. I'm wellbeing advisor at Hearts for Learning and Hearts for Learning, just to give you a little bit of context, is a not for profit company and we work really closely with HCC to ensure that all children in Hertfordshire get a great education and an education to help them thrive. Um, and as part of the wellbeing team, we support schools in all facets of pupil and staff mental health and well-being so that remit today considering the harms of gambling certainly falls within our work um, with schools so my key, key area one of the key areas is um, supporting schools deliver the statutory relationship and health education curriculum this is part of the broader pshe so personal social health and economic um, education and this, the, the statutory health um, curriculum in particular has got a really strong focus on online behaviour and harms, which I think is really pertinent um, <clears throat> to our agenda today. And my work as wellbeing um, advisor, so it includes delivering centralised training for schools. So schools might come to us and we deliver to a group of schools or bespoke um, school based training consultancy support for schools and this is training that's delivered to staff to governors to trustees and we're also um, involved with delivering workshops for parents and um, carers so our training you know it's really prompted me today thinking about what we include in our training around this gambling um, agenda we certainly highlight um, the harms of gambling as part of a much broader online risk agenda. So we've not to date delivered specific training on gambling harms, but it would be something that we would be very, very interested in working with other agencies, other groups to offer a package of support to schools and families, as we've done in the past successfully around drugs, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, an alcohol education. And colleagues today have, uh, you know, many colleagues today have highlighted the importance of early educational intervention. So making parents and carers aware of dangers of potential dangers of gambling and that spectrum from the sort of the safe, harmless gaming towards that dangerous, addictive, um, harmful behaviours. And also enabling parents to know about, and school staff too, to know about where, where the support is in our county. And certainly as Steve uh, Watts said earlier, you know, many children through their own, the ownership of their mobile phones, and this is from children of quite a young age, have got that potential for a casino in their pockets, you know, and all children potentially vulnerable to the, to the dangers 
of gambling. So lots of opportunities within the curriculum now, the, um, the statutory curriculum for us to talk about and to help ch children understand the risks that exist for them both online and offline around um, around gambling in primary schools you know we st of course start in a very age appropriate way so in primary schools we're talking about the risks of excessive time spent online we talk to them about the peer pressures that come from their friends and also the techniques that are out there to persuade them to hook them into something online and the techniques to keep them scrolling on a game for longer and longer. And we've got things like loot boxes, haven't we, in gaming, where although there's no monetary interaction when children are younger, there's that addiction perhaps to, to having a go, chancing their luck. Uh, what's in the treasure trove for example and you know that learning deepens as they get into secondary school and you know then the health curriculum there definitely talks about um, helping children understand about the accumulation of debt um, and relating that to to gambling addictions and I think it's important too, as part, you know, aside from the curriculum, important for members to know that the latest updates to the statutory um, government safeguarding guidance for schools, keeping children safe in education, that's really ramped up the importance of online safety. So the guidance now includes, a cat includes the category of online commerce as a potential risk to our children in, in, in schools. And it highlights online gambling as a distinct risk um, to children. Um, so I think education, we know quite rightly, has been highlighted as one route to reducing harm. And I think we need to start this education to um, from a really early age. And certainly Hearts for Learning would welcome any opportunity to support with any initiative um, to look at how, can, how we can reach out, work with schools, work with teaching staff, uh, governors, trustees, and certainly parents and carers on this agenda around gambling harms. Um, and, you know, we would welcome a key part in, in in being on that journey with Hertfordshire um, to to raise that awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the landscape of education is a lot more complicated than when I joined the County Council in 1993, where uh, um, there were schools uh, working to uh, and with the County Council and the rest were independent schools. Um, will academies make life more difficult to, to reach across to children? My, my assumption is yes we it's the thing that stops academies do um just as other schools as maintain schools are part of our training package so our work is with all schools across the spectrum but i think you're potentially right there could be a more of a difficulty reaching those you know the funding is an issue for schools time for teachers to attend training is is a pressure um but yeah yeah, I think you're quite right on that point. I mean, you mentioned that, that how, how important this was in relation to children. Is it the most, is it your biggest worry about the, the challenges facing children? Because we hear of others, of social social media pressures, we hear of uh, online pornography, uh, uh, you name it, all sorts we, of things. It's no. bigger or smaller than those? I think it needs to be as big as. I think it's yeah. an area that hasn't had the spotlight on it in, you know, in the same way as, like you said, Porn online pornography and grooming and um, you know yeah. inappropriate going on to inappropriate websites the content that's around there the contact so that they could have with strangers online but I think it needs to be I think it's an area that we've you know missed out on because of perhaps a, a lack of education on our parts really knowing you know and being here today has really in my mind mm you know, given me the um, the sort of push to make sure that when we are delivering training, that this is certainly um, emphasised more than it has been in the past. OK, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's interesting because it's not dissimilar, if you think about it, to my question to Jim McManus earlier on. No, about, no. Up in relation to other yeah. 
challenges, which is yes. right there in the middle of them. Yeah. Um, Nigel Bell. Oh, so really, yeah, mine's now a comment now, because really you've covered it there. I was just going to say that PSHE obviously now has online gambling harm as one of their main um, things they, they, they're they teaching and kids and that. So with you highlighting that there, yeah. you're yeah. making sure then that that's going to be part of your your um, what you're going to do in the future as well. You're going to make sure that it's up there along with other things. But like I think we need support yeah. to make sure, you know, teachers, you know, with, with the best will in the world, you know, don't always have the um, the information that they need at their fingertips around online gambling. It certainly wasn't certainly wasn't part of my training as a teacher. You know, other yeah. risks, yeah, are. But um, you know, we need to make sure that staff understand their responsibility in terms of safeguarding for um, our young people in in schools. So you will highlight it. Good. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult, isn't it, for teachers, well, for all of us, I guess, um, keeping up to date. I'm just thinking. It is. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm now uh, staring at a, a, an Apple Mac and having a meeting, indeed chairing a meeting, where none of you are in the same room. Uh, when I when I was at university, uh, there was there was apparently a computer somewhere in Oxford, um, and um, there were plans for having one in every city. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, uh, it, 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 it is difficult to keep up with a phenomenon which has probably developed um, yeah. because of the internet and also because of smartphones. That 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 issue has come up a number of times already today, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just the last thing on that, which I think is pertinent, just the importance of pupil voice as well. You know, what are our pupils telling us that yeah. they need? Mm. Um, are in this field of education, you know, children have said to me quite a few times that they 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 think the education that they get around commerce and um, monetary um, things are not enough. And they were talking thinking about terms of taxation and mortgages. You know, are we putting enough emphasis into the curriculum about, um, you know, gambling addiction and their finances and well, yeah, risk, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking as someone who used to train accountants, um, um, the, the, yeah, I mean, there is fundamental lack of even <laughs> brief lessons on on checks, paying bills, mm. that sort mm. of thing, elementary budgeting, you name it, which would be useful at school. But that's possibly for another topic group. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I want to be on that one as well. Um, D, uh, last question. I think we're probably on last question. Then we're going to have a, a five minute comfort break and stick to time at, at, at three o'clock. Hello, D. My, 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 my legs have lost um, contact with them, like the rest of me. Um, okay, it's not a hint. Not a hint no. I'm, I'm really interested on the training you do with um, staff, governors and parents going forward, number one. Mm -hmm. And if a child um, asked for help, um, would you sign that post them to help regarding a gambling issue or would you leave that to a member of staff? Um, it would we would be enabling the school to be the um to be the expert so it would be it wouldn't be me that a child would come to for uh, support it would be that we were able to um upskill if you like the teachers and the schools to be able to do the signposting so you, you so basically you're the facilitator exactly. yes we are we are the facilitator. yes and, yeah. and from your point of view as a facilitator can you see the rising numbers in younger people actually being addicted to gambling or getting more involved in the gambling situation? I, I really don't have that um, knowledge at my fingertips at all. It would be something that would be interesting to find out from schools, you know, to to be asking our young people about their, um, you know, their, their gaming habits we ask them about. I'm not sure that children in school are currently asked at about gambling and that term gambling is actually you know used with children but I wouldn't have a sight of that sort of um, day to day. Brilliant thank you very much for your time Kate thank you. And, and one, one last thought um, is, is presumably there is a parental denial problem here and the, the, uh, as far as I understand it's a classic problem with drugs isn't it of course my, my, my child wouldn't do drugs and and that that's the school wouldn't do drugs because it's full of nice middle class kids um, uh, and so on and so forth we've all heard it um, I would guess we, well, there is an education of parents issue here as well. I'm sure yeah it's no problem here you know we're in leafy this that or the other town and yeah it's not um, not an issue for our children yes yeah, so that is yeah. You know, getting information across to parents is is certainly crucial. Yes. 
including I mean, going, going back to sectors, those those in uh, academies and also the independent sector. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just because we don't, uh, we've never had a history of in being involved in that that particular education system, it doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about them in public health terms. No, no. Okay. Well, that's that. That's very fabulous. Thank you very much, Kate Stockdale. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, we're going to have a five minute uh, break or about six, actually. And we'll resume exactly at three o'clock, which is, uh, means we're still on schedule. Uh, so literally legs can be stretched or anything else you, you wish to do uh, in six minutes. See you shortly.
Enjoy your life, Chairman. Welcome back after a very, very brief break uh, to what is our last uh, witness session. Uh, so we welcome uh, Dan Pattenden from Snorbus District Council, just declaring a, an interest to that uh, as a district council and leader of Snorbus District Council, um, but here obviously chairing this meeting solely as a county councillor. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and it was probably wise to have a five minute break before I started talking because there's a lot of information to be about, about to be delivered. Um, so just a bit of background on myself. Uh, my name is obviously Daniel. I am the St Albans City and District uh, Business Compliance Specialist Officer. Um, in most districts, that would be a senior licensing officer. And I have been in licensing for just over nine years now, and I've worked in three different um, authorities, uh, one in London, two outside. Um, so I've got a broad sort of understanding of gambling and all those years of working in licensing. So <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do is take you a little bit through the Act. Obviously, I'm not going to get bogged down in it because it's a big piece of legislation, but I'll just try to give you a brief outline of what it all is. Uh, and then I'll also talk, talk about what I've um, spoken to the other Hertfordshire authorities um, before this um, and what how they see harm and what how they perceive harm. So the uh, Gambling Act 2005, um, the powers in it are largely split between local authorities and the Gambling Commission. So local authorities generally deal with local issues. Um, that's licensing premises, doing betting shops, gaming machines, small lotteries, and also the enforcement of those premises. Gambling Commission are generally the larger things, uh, your national lotteries, your national operators. Now, there's always a bit of a link because for you to apply for a premises license in a local authority, you must have an operator's license from a gambling commission. So the two things kind of work together. You can't have one without the other, except for when it comes to like small lotteries and things like that. The Gambling Commission um, also have the responsibility of issuing the codes of practice, which um, talk about how to do gambling in a fair and open way, um, and the local authority guidance. Sorry, my slides didn't move there. Um, so the Gambling Act, like most licensing acts, has objectives, and I know I've had heard people touching on them today about how public health could become an objective. Um, but there currently are three of them, and uh, one of them is the Prevention of Crime and Disorder. It's got a much longer title, but I won't read it, but it essentially stops gambling being part of crime and disorder. Ensuring gambling is conducted in a fair and open way, and protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed by the exploitation of gambling. Um, so that's kind of more probably what we're looking at today, the gambling harm side of things. But again, it talks about it in vulnerable people and in children and not the wider aspect of harm, um, which probably could do with some updating. And um, obviously, we talked about um, today, several people have mentioned about public health becoming a objective. Um, it's not something that we can just put in, unfortunately, it is a piece of legislation. So to have an additional, additional objective, the government would have to change that. That said, most local authorities, I know ours certainly does, and I know East Heart certainly does, has a public health section in their statement of principles. So generally speaking, we do consult with them. Um, so local authorities have a lot of powers, um, mostly around licensing um, these activities. But we also do obviously have the powers to enforce. Now, um, if someone was to undermine one of the licensing objectives, we have a number of powers available available to us. We can obviously powers of entry into investigate. We can seize any records we deem part of an investigation, and ultimately we can review the license with the aim of potentially having it removed. Um, obviously, there are a number of options when we go to a review. A committee can either revoke, suspend, remove a condition, or add additional conditions. Um, something else that local authorities generally do is um, risk assessments. So it's fairly regular because we have to do every year, we have to do a return to the Gambling Commission on how many premises we visited and their, what their risk assessments look like. So we generally obviously concentrate on your betting shops and things like that um, for the risk assessment side of things. So harm in gambling for local authorities as well. This is a difficult subject for us because local authorities really struggle to be involved when it comes to harm. First of all, the guidance um, talks about the fact that harm is primarily dealt with by the commission. So it kind of takes a little bit away from us as a local authority. But it's also not only that, but we don't get a lot of information on it. Generally speaking, we don't get any sort of credible evidence to act upon. We very rarely get complaints. Um, we find that certainly in my time, I've always found that betting shops in general tend to police themselves. So um, going on to what Douglas was saying about earlier about crime reports, um, I've always found that if a betting shop has someone wreck a gaming machine, i.e. goes in, vandalizes it, they won't report that to the police. They'll just replace the machine. Um, obviously, I don't know the reason for that, but I would imagine it's obviously to keep us from getting involved and having a look into these kind of things. Um, so you're, you, it's easy to go as well. If you go to YouTube, you'll find videos upon videos of people smashing up gaming machines. I know because someone used it as an objection once in a case that I dealt with. Um, 
So we don't get a lot of information and therefore we're not ever able to really truly get involved and have a look at what harm is in gambling locally. Um, so local authorities have a statement of principles. Um, it's essentially, for all intents and purposes, a policy, but it is a requirement of the law for us to have it and update it every three years. Now, part of that is that we have a local area profile. So what we need to do is look at our area, look at where our gaming machines and gambling terminals and all those kind of bits and pieces are. And if there's any evidence that there's harm and whether we need to do special things in certain areas and, and it asks people who are applying for those licenses to look at that and consider that when they're making their applications. Now, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So you've heard a lot of people talking about stories in the media and, and th things like that. But in the truth is, we simply don't get any credible, credible evidence to use or to strengthen our statement of policies. Um, so what I did was I went out to the Hertfordshire authorities and asked five questions that I thought would help identify potentially where the harm is. So the first question I asked was, how many betting premises do authorities have? Now, previously, betting premises have been the area of concern with the, F the FOBTs. Obviously, we all know that at one point in time, you could lose £10,000 in an hour. It was that easy. But obviously, with the recent gaming machine changes, that concern has sort of leveled off a little bit. Um, and we're seeing a lot less gaming uh, betting premises because obviously they can't really maximise the use of those machines now. So in St Albans, we have five machines. Hartsmere, uh, it's not five machines, it's five, five prem betting premises. Hartsmere has eight betting premises. Welling and Hatfield have 13. East Hearts have 15. North Hearts have 12. And Watford have 16. Now, in my experience, what you tend to find is betting premises are either in areas with obviously people with low income, low deprivation, um, or in areas of high footfall. So um, I can only gather to St Albans not having it because we actually only have two town centres. Outside of that, we don't have large footfall areas. Um, I know previously in Barnet, where I worked, I would have more game uh, betting premises in one high street than we do in St Albans. So, you know, but that's made up of lots of big high streets and obviously areas of low deprivation as well. So, you know, that all kind of combines. And also there's also a cultural side of thing as well. Um, next question I asked was, does your authority get many complaints about betting premises? So I wanted to see if other authorities were seeing the same thing I was seeing, and generally they were. We don't get any complaints. I think uh, I reported none, Hartsmere reported none, well, in Hatfield reported none, and that goes on. A couple of them reported that antisocial behaviour, but then ended up not being related to the premises. And then there's been a few complaints about um, High Stokes poker in pubs, which, again, is a completely different subject in terms of where we're sitting right now. but they're allowed to do it to a small level. So then I asked a big question, where do they perceive gambling harm? Now I won't go through all the responses individually because it's a lot of text, um, but overall the, the general consensus is that it's online and ad advertising, which to be honest, hearing from everyone today, that seems to be the general view of things that is mostly online gambling is where we're seeing the problem, um, which obviously local authorities can't really get involved in because um, that does sit with the gambling commission. Um, but generally, that's where we see it. Um, myself personally, I also see it. Um, and again, the previous talker actually mentioned it, and that's loot crates and gaming um, for children. And I think that's where you'll see the prevalence of it in the future, because that's almost like the let's call it a gateway drug, like like marijuana and stuff. That's your gateway. That's how people start to get involved and get that excitement of opening something or, or doing something. Now, the Gambling Commission are looking into this. They have started talking with game companies about that. The game companies are obviously arguing that you always get something, so it's not gambling. But generally, the Gambling Commission is saying, well, someone's after something special in those boxes. Um, and obviously, some of it's free, but other gaming platforms, you have to pay money for these things. So there's obviously a com commerce side of it as well. Um, so I foresee that as a quite a dangerous place for um, people to get into gambling, because they'll see that as an exciting thing. So then the next question I ask is, what do authorities feel with regard to working more closely and how licensing can help tackle harm? And again, lots of text, but the general feel is that we're not getting any intel as a local authority licensing team. We don't know what's going on out there. Um, so we feel like there needs to be more information share and we need to be more engaged with the authorities who potentially have that information. Now, generally speaking, we will we consult with a lot of the authorities when it comes to new applications. But in, in all honesty, most authorities, will, most licensing authorities will, will tell you that we don't get many applications for gambling because they got made back in 2006, 2007, when the law came in um, to effect, and nobody's really got any more since. So we don't get many applications, which is kind of what we have already. Um, but generally speaking, no intelligence in this matter, uh, and it makes it hard for us to be involved if we don't know what's going on. Uh, and as someone said earlier, you know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. Um, and then um, I asked the authorities if they've done anything 
in relation to the gambling for harming gambling. So if any licensing authorities had done their own sort of projects in the background, most of them had done little bits and pieces. So obviously our standard risk assessments that we always do, um, most have updated their sort of their statement of principles to cover add pub, a public health element, updating our local area profile. But again, due to a lack of data, we're not able to give that any um, any real legs, any any meat to the bone, as they say, because a lot of it's just we're taking the guidance from the Gambling Commission, but actually we have no real local area information to add to that. So where do we see this going next? Well, I, I think it's a key to identify if there really is a issue gambling locally with gambling premises. I think it's really important, especially from a licensing aspect. It's important to find out if we've got a gambling problem in gambling premises, because part of the risk assessments, part of things we look at is how they deal with those gambling issues, whether they are signposting people to the gam care and the gamble aware and things like that. Um, and also if they're doing proper interactions. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see if anyone's got any data that says that gambling premises are actually causing this issue. Certainly, as I said before, there certainly needs to be better information sharing. So there needs to be a lot more engagement. Um, and the way I potentially see that being done is a lot of uh, all um, local areas have a joint advisory group or JAG. Um, and this normally consists of people like licensing, police, ambulance services, um, trading standards, housing, uh, a lot of authorities who may have anecdotal evidence that if you bring it all together actually helps paint a picture of whether there's gambling harm and if there's any engagement that can be done. And ultimately, it's the Gambling Commission getting engaged as well because they deal with online harm. So if we're saying there's a lot of online harm in Hertfordshire, obviously that's going to be a national problem, but that's something that the Gambling Commission need to get involved in and look at the advertising side of things and things like that as well. So that's just sort of a brief overview. Um, I've tried to leave as much time for questions because I know there's going to be some questions with relation to law mm. and bits and pieces. So far away from any questions. No, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I've got some, some some questions. I mean, I was very struck by the fact that St Albans district, this district, I mean, if that's happening and as yep. well, we've only got five premises that, that compared with everyone else was on uh, easily double figures, weren't they? Yes. Um, the demography of St Albans is not so different from the other districts as, as um, I mean, it's different obviously from say Watford and Stevenage, mm. but not so different from from say Hartsmere uh, as, yep. as to, as to uh, answer that particular question. So mm. it is odd, isn't it? And um, I wonder whether there's, there's, there's planning policy behind this as well, but I don't know whether you've got any further thoughts uh, on that. Uh, I mean, I, I know I know someone mentioned obviously about licensing authorities stopping the proliferation of gaming establishments, yeah. betting establishments. We don't have that power. It, no, simply, no, no. it simply doesn't exist for us to do so. So it would have to be a local planning um, matter yeah. with regard to the proliferation of gaming places. Um, so they, there may be something locally, or it may just be that it's not as profitable in St Albans as it is in other areas. Yeah, uh, you yeah, know, okay. there, there may be something in terms of, like I said, you do tend to find it in the low income areas. Um, St Albans generally as a whole as a district has quite um, a high working um, in London sort of group. Um, so I think you, yeah, you may yeah, find, see true. a higher income in St Albans than you do in the other authorities. That might that might play a part. Obviously, I, I haven't gone deep enough into it to, to give you a solid answer, but that, that would be my one of my first views on that probably. It's not, it's not, it's not cafe society that's driving people out <laughs> of the betting shops. OK, yeah, that's for another day as well. Um, I, I, I'm getting the, the message, I think, from you that uh, you, you would welcome engagement from other authorities, particularly those which hold data. Absolutely, uh, yeah. uh, especially when we're consulting on our statement of principles, because um, that's when we need the most information, because our statement yeah. of principles is, is basically our document that says to people who want to come and apply yeah. for some gambling in our district, um, you need to look at this and you need to have consideration to this. And if we've got more evidence, we can give it more teeth, more, more yeah, muscle. Yeah, you know, it makes it a much easier document for us to use and, set and to direct people to and say, well, actually, we, you know, you're in an area where we know we've got these gaming machines. We know we've got this gaming problem. What are you doing about that to address that problem? And that's what the statement of principles lets us do. And then finally, before I bring in a couple of others, I mean, uh, I think one of the things that struck me this afternoon with the, with the candor of Doug Black is that um, the police are not collecting this data at all, uh, which is which is um, I don't think it's particularly a negative commentary, but it strikes me that um, um, it might well be easy to collect, given that you're asking you know, when you've just made an arrest, you ask them all sorts of questions. One more question on, uh, you know, have you been on the GGs or whatever it is that's uh, mm. caused problems or been online before you started uh, the domestic violence might well be uh, useful data for us all. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, so, uh, OK, uh, bring in Jan Madden now, please. And then Nigel. Um, thank you very much. Um, I might have to apologise here because you might have said this, but the doorbell went just at exactly the wrong time. 
and I had a really important delivery. I'm so sorry. It's fine. Um, that's, that's what the comfort break was for. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, if only they'd timed it at the right time. Um, your slides, I was, I had a, a look through them yesterday and um, you've got six um, local authorities listed there. Um, do you have data for the other four? I, I, I got Broxbourne's back yesterday. So Broxbourne, of, uh, I can briefly tell you what Broxbourne said. They had no complaints. Uh, they had 13 betting premises um, and they had no concerns of perceived harm in betting premises. Um, generally agreed that online was the issue. Um, and again, said about engagement for their statement of principles. So it was very much the same thing. The other ones haven't replied. In fairness, I only found out I was doing this last week. So I only sent it out on sort of Thursday afternoon. So I gave them as much no, time so as I could. Um, no worries. Yeah. No worries. OK, I just wondered that, you know, I noticed that there were six out of the 10 there. So lovely. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. They, they were the ones who managed to reply to me in, in the time before yeah, today. Yeah, No, I really appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question about complaints, actually. As I don't recall, I've not been a councillor since 1993. I don't recall ever having had a complaint about a betting premises. As I said, I, I've worked for three authorities and I've never had a complaint about a premises, a betting premises in my nine years of being a licensing yeah. officer. So it's it's just rare. And like I said, I think part of it is also because they're self-policing. They don't want complaints because they don't want you going in and have a look at them. So like I said, we very rarely hear about anything in a gaming machine. But if you go look for five minutes online, you'll see YouTube videos of gaming machines getting smashed up in premises in the UK. But they never get reported because the, the betting premises just replace them. Um, so yeah well, it's not surprising is it i mean mm. if in in one sense i guess things like pubs are, are the same I and mean, some some mm. come across your desk more often than you would like um the majority you, you, you probably don't hear of one end of the year to the next yeah yeah right. no um nigel nigel bell uh thank you chair and thanks daniel for your presentation obviously i'm from watford and obviously i can see they've got 16 betting shops but again from the uh, the officers obviously replied and said that, that you know there's been no complaints mm. and that they don't they don't, just don't have the uh, data or the uh, information uh, but the, what they what he or she has said on there is that it would be interesting if they could if there were any trends out there if they could be passed on uh, and that we could use in our local uh, area profiles could public health maybe collate and distribute i mean i know that they're he says that um, this may be seem like um, naming him shame, and she didn't didn't mean it like that, I suppose. But you know, maybe public health to compile data for all councillors and publish this amongst ourselves. Yeah, you know, doesn't want it to be like naming shame, but then we'd know about problems in the area and and, and what it's come from. Um, even just a comparison she says, against an average across the county could help so maybe that would help i don't know but again still saying that the main the main issue is obviously online as we as we've uh, gathered today yeah yeah and i I, I, it's, I don't think it is about naming and shaming and i think there's yeah. a again it's also about breaking down that general perception so the general perception will be for a licensing officer who doesn't engage with public health on a regular basis that they have the information and just not sharing it but actually hearing from public health today they don't have the information either so yeah. they can't share what they don't have um, so maybe that again, that's something we need to look at and how who's gathering information, how we're gathering information, because there's lots of people that we've heard from today who might have some information that's you know useful for all the authorities. Um, and it's about it's about just working out how we're all going to share that uh, and do it in a way that we can use it effectively. Um, and as soon as that starts happening, you'll 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 see statement of principles step up there from the usual like i said you could probably look at most statement of principles in hertfordshire they probably look very very similar not only do we all steal each other's stuff from each other but also we all work together and we all work off the guidance so we yeah. to get more than the guidance we need that information to support it because if we put something in outlandish like gaming uh, betting terminals in this place and need to be limited to this only a as you've said someone said earlier these big companies they have massive legal departments they'll just come down and say we're not doing that and here's our legal representative and we're challenging your policy or your statement of principles and then we have to go through the legal battle and yeah. then uh, ultimately we don't have the evidence to back up what we're saying so we need that evidence to change our statement of principles to have that effect and and drive that standard up um and like i said it's difficult for licensing to be involved in harm because it is the guidance kind of does point to the gambling commission dealing with harm but there's no reason why we can't where we identify people mm. at risk why we can't engage with betting premises because obviously most betting premises have a self-exclusion policy but actually you know i take take pubs in, as an example we have pub watches so all the pubs gather together and they have discussions i'm part of the pub watch police are part of the pub watch and we often talk about people who have caused damage in another pub or been 
drunk and disorderly and, and they get barred from the pubs so yeah. there's there's no reason why we can't maybe introduce something like that for gaming premises like a betting a bet bet watch you know where all the betting premises come together and they say okay yeah well we've had him in and he's been a problem gambling and i know the self-exclusion problem policy as well don't often jump between different betting companies so you know ladbrooks may not engage with william hill and so someone might self-exclude from ladbrooks but then can then go to a william hill and still bet or still spend money on the gaming machines so it's just potentially also getting those people to engage with each other on a local level as well and have them say okay yeah we've had them in here and they've caused or we can say well we've had this person identified to us by the police as somebody who has a gambling problem it's forced them to be in debt they've started burgling places we need you to not allow them to bet in your premises they need to not come in and, and spend their money because yeah. this is now i'm not sure how much i would have to get a sort of a legal point of view on that but i don't see why we can't encourage them at least to do that side of things it's good yeah. for them to do that kind of work so there's there's that kind of also work and interaction that we could also do in the background but um, as, as you probably heard earlier on um we're not at the point where we know that that's happened are we yeah it's not recording it um, yeah. but uh, it caused a domestic incident uh there wasn't the slightest chance of you ever finding out is there um no. and we have to do this yeah okay okay yeah. thank Quite you for message Sorry. um any other questions oh yes uh no 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 uh i see no further questions from my colleagues daniel that's fabulous really helpful particularly the research you did in the background in so little time um yeah we were sleepily starting the new year a little later than we should have done wasn't helped by the chair um decided to contract COVID to celebrate Christmas. Um, but oh, yeah, Got to do it, yeah. Well, you know, got to be a, a, a mystery shopper and these things, haven't you? Um, okay. So, um, colleagues, before um, the, our, our various witnesses go, we move into a sort of member-only session. Are there any further questions to anybody who happens still to be here uh, that you would like to raise? Chairman, would it be helpful if the remaining witnesses put their cameras on so you are actually aware of who yeah, was that would be, yes, in the virtual okay, group? Yeah. Um, so, so witnesses, that's... if you don't mind, could you stick your cameras on? That would be grand. Just, I'm just seeing four, is that right? Um, um, so Nigel's got a question to Steve. Oh, yeah, so Steve, and thanks for your contribution earlier. I don't think I said, but just wondered as you've probably been here most of the day, do, what do you think is the most important thing that, that you've got out of what we've uh, discussed and what you know the witnesses have said that we could maybe take away? Um, there's a lot. There's a lot been discussed there. The education um stuff is very very interesting to me um i've got a a, a view about that and anyone yeah. who's done ever done timetabling in a in a secondary school mm. realizes and understands that pshe is probably the last thing that gets put onto a teacher's timetable yeah. so yeah. the challenge the, cha the challenge that you've got of asking people who have got no real interest in gambling to then teach it on very very sensitive subjects mm. is extremely challenging um so for that i would proceed and i used to be a timetabler in in my time and it was normally nqts it was filling up timetable where people are under under hours so that approach training the teachers to teach something like gambling harms is it does come with its its risks i i would say um when we're talking about what daniel's just talking about um if you're talking about what you could do hertfordshire based if you're talking about land based and, and as councillor white says it is it is all about online as well but there are still harms going on in land based um, sites and if hertfordshire could somehow come up with a, a scheme that when you when you try to self exclude from a from a from a, a land based betting shop it's really really it's it's like a chocolate fire it's a waste of time because it's basically if, if i put a mask on in current situation or put a hat and glasses on it's down to the uh, the people behind the counters uh, recognizing you but if you could come up with a scheme that all of the local land-based operators bought into that anyone in hertfordshire could multi sort of uh, exclude from i think that would be uh, it would be wonderful i don't know the answer to that maybe a membership scheme i don't know we're probably getting into territory that's beyond our remit but mm -hmm. but that would be great if we could do something like that and it's just it's just making sure as i said right at the start in my in my presentation is if you can involve lived experience uh, at all levels uh, to, mm. to 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 inform and 
and it's just making sure that the decision makers in all of these areas have got the full information. Um, and sometimes some of the information does feel uh, is a little bit behind the curve where we're talking about reports, empirical reports that are five, six years old. It's 2005 was the last time that the Gambling Act was reviewed. We've got a new review coming up in uh, this year, hopefully. And, and Minister Philp is, is, seems to be very, very proactive in in, in what's going on. And, and hopefully, if, uh, if Hertfordshire can work alongside, you know, Manchester as well in the work that they're doing um, then you've got a real opportunity to make a difference and again Hertfordshire is close to my heart because uh, obviously we ex we access our support in Hertfordshire through our Gammon and uh, GA so whatever we can do at GAMFAM to support you we would uh, we'd be delighted to be part of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, 2005 it was a different era wasn't it that was when yeah. we were talking about regional casinos and uh, yeah. other such things it was it was that's the whole scary thing. isn't it it is really yeah How and just can i just make one point as well um Natalie mm. referenced a quote that i said earlier about figures it's that five percent of gamblers contribute 60 percent of overall profit yes. but yeah. when you take it online it's over 80 percent and that was from the house of lords select committee as well and i think that's probably when i when i talk to people outside of the gambling harms community who have got no real interest and haven't been impacted by it that's the figure that i think that really resonates with people and hits home so you know that's why it's important that any interventions that we do are independent of any industry influence yeah the, the other thing that struck me in 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 in, uh, in the evidence is, is the need to reach out to parents i was, I was particularly struck by dr magan's very almost throwaway remark about the fact that you're more likely to be gambling addicted if you have observed as a child a big win. Um, I think that I think everybody's everybody's story is unique is what we've got to remember. Yeah. But what we have to take into consideration is is the is the addictive products, the nature of the advertising. So we talk about vulnerable people. We've all got vulnerabilities. You know, we talk about addictive personality. I'm not necessarily saying that everybody's got an addictive personality is going to gamble, but we've all got certain vulnerabilities. And mm. I think these products that are designed to be addictive, that's a played in isolation for extended periods of times, 50% of people who play online slots of casinos become addicted to them. And mm. also, also as well, the other thing that we're battling with at the moment is that during COVID, again, different 50%, I guess, but it's 50% uh, of people have returned back to their addiction, whether that's alcohol, drugs, shopping, any process addiction, gambling, whatever their their choice of addiction is, is they've returned back to that as well. And I think that's a, a worrying statistic as well. So the landscape has changed. And, um, you know, it's great that that, that you guys are, are yeah. addressing this and dedicating a whole day to it as well. But we don't we don't we don't try and shield kids from this. I mean, we, we shield them from alcohol in all sorts of ways. You know, the, the, the 18 rule, which of course applies to gambling as well, but, but in effect doesn't apply to online gambling. Um, but it, it, it's, it's like having um, wine on tap, isn't it, in, in your house? Uh, and we shield them for cigarettes, or some parents do at least, and, and hope to shield from drugs. And I just think, I think there's a danger still, the gambling scene is the, as the okay one. And, but the and, difference uh, is with gambling, the, the, the chap at the off license isn't going to be knocking at your door at two o'clock in the morning with, with four cans of lager, whereas you're getting bombarded yeah, with promotional absolutely. adverts and offers. 24 7. just as necessary if not more so and i think that's the message we may want to push out to to parents who, who are going to be key to this not because they're the villains but because they're the innocents i guess and i think the real challenge is bringing it to the landscape of people who have not been directly affected by it who are not really that interested in it at the moment but it's understanding that you know everybody understands the the dangers of gaming but the gateway that can lead to gambling as well and, I, and as i referenced in my a uh, short presentation earlier on, the Paul Merson documentary was groundbreaking because it brought it to a completely different audience. And I know when something's done that because people message me and say, have you seen this? Have you read this? Uh, and unfortunately, it, it doesn't go beyond those people that have been directly affected. And, um, you know, what we're trying to do is just try to raise the profile of that and uh, and support people through their recovery. And those affected others are, are, are you know, often the people that reach out first. Yeah. Sorry, I've probably... No, no, not the, uh, at all. No, this, this, this slot is actually for this sort of general wash up um, and, and, and comments. Colleagues uh, uh, who are members of the topic group, are there any further questions? This is really your last call, as they say in, uh, in airlines, um, before we let all of our witnesses go and um, potentially have another break. Um, one's from Jan. No one's coming up. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to thank the remaining witnesses. I'm obviously thankful that they've had to go off. Uh, as well. Um, I've learned a lot. I've, I think some, some staggeringly 
qualitative uh, high quality presentations. So thank you for all, all, all of you here and elsewhere for that. And we can now start formulating a, a proposed policy. Um, uh, Natalie, do we want to have a pause so that you can actually get your thoughts in order ready for the summary in the member section which follows? Yes, please. OK, so uh, we will pause now. And when do you want to resume 15 minutes? Can I just check if there is somebody in here from Democratic Services? Because this is the bit where I'm, I need um, that uh, expert guidance about if we if if the if the meeting resumes before the scheduled time in the um, programme, are, are we legit or or we can are, we are legit, Natalie? Also, you, you quite clearly said on the programme that it's subject to to changes anyway, yeah. so it's absolutely fine. So if you be absolutely fine. Let's do that's that. Let's resume at uh, quarter two, and uh, um, uh, so that's fifteen forty-five. I'll see you then. Cheerio.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, thank you uh, very much for returning from your breaks and thank you for whatever it is that Natalie is going to present in front of us in a few moments after a very rich day, I think, in terms of evidence uh, from our witnesses um, who were well chosen. Clearly, we could have had more. We could have had someone from uh, probation, <coughs> oh, excuse me, probation, for instance, but uh, there are limits. So um, uh, do you want to... Um, Take us through where do you think uh, we, we, we may have got to so we can start deliberating on our recommendations. Uh, yeah, with pleasure, Chris. So um, I'll just do a quick run through the key elements from the presenters that you have this afternoon and then where the where, how that fits in with those broad areas identified after lunch and then what you might want to do with those. So I'll run through the summary first. So um, hearing from HPFT, Dr Rakesh Mogan, I, th I thought what was interesting was this example he gave about family history, especially if there's been an experience of a big win yeah, in I the that, family, because yeah. I thought that was really resonant of what we know about smoking and drinking, that if children grow up in a household where that's prevalent activity, it's already normalised for them as, as something they might participate. And particularly the excitement if you get a big win, you know, that makes it seem, a, you know, an innocent, innocent activity. So I thought that that was something um, certainly to feature in the report. Um, as something that was interesting, and the 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 definite he um, Rakesh identified two key risk factors, which these have been talked about um, in the morning. But I think it was it was great to hear them from a mental health clinical specialist to say alcohol and depression are the two key risk factors. There are others, but the link between alcohol and depression is really um, clear in terms of gambling um, so that that's that's something to feature in the report as well. Um, he talked really helpfully about the um, uh, the ICS Mental Health and Learning Disabilities Collaborative and that they're already um, developing pathways for other other conditions and addictions and approaches um, and I, I took from the way he was describing it that it wouldn't be too much of an ask to um, see something around gambling harms, gambling's addictions also being part of that. But clearly that would need to have commissioned services supporting it as well. Uh, it's no use having a pathway if at the end of that there's, there's no service to in order to deliver it. Um, he talked about the role of screening. And again, I think we were talking about data collection, quite key questions, screening. I mean, for me, they were all falling into a into the same area because it's all about data and identification and enabling people to say, actually, I've got an issue. You know, I've now been asked this 10 times and finally I'm going to actually disclose that to to somebody. So he talked about the role of screening being an improved. Um, and uh, he was talking about that within the context of um, um, the health community. So, um, you know, community health, so that's, you know, um, district nurses, etc., um, public health, GPs, um, because if, if they're not aware of the question to ask, we're not going to get any closer to the data, but also complementing that with ensuring that they're aware of what agencies are out there to support somebody if they do disclose to one of those one of those professionals that, that they've got an issue. Um, and, and developing a, a list of warning signs. I, I think that that would be something, again, the constabulary we're talking about, we, that we don't ask those questions. There's no reason we, we can't ask them. But I think it would be helpful that if going forward, there is this group that we, you know, loosely would like to see them developing a strategy from, from the way that you're speaking. I think that that almost be, ought to be one of their first activities is, is how do we get that out there? So just to help get that, that tranche of data coming through. Um, Lots of information from from Jim and David about local data, but also uh, hands up that the local data is often based on national data, which is based on a sample. So it's all estimate numbers until we can to, till we can move beyond that. Um, and uh, Jim's focus on um, a multi agency approach to address this and, and maintaining a public health focus on this to ensure that all of the um, composite elements are, are picked up within that approach and all agencies work together to to deliver on that. Um, very honest input from the from from the police, which yeah. I, I thought was quite refreshing. You know, he, he was very candid about what they don't know, but also talked, I thought, really 
eloquently about you know that he'd done some quick research found out what came uh, Cheshire Constabulary were doing and how successful that had been and actually um, that had um, been, a, been an indicator that if you ask the questions you're going to find out a lot more about the extent of the problem within your local area and very supportive um, around how they could ask some additional questions at different key points um, uh, within 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 their service around um, finding out um, whether the whether one of the motivator or one of the contributory factors to this um, behaviour is actually due to gambling. You know, it might be alcohol, might be depression, might be mental health, but actually we, we heard from Rakesh that there are key factors. So there's almost like a, a step on question, but the police need to be made aware of that. Those linkages need to be a lot clearer for some, some of the agencies in the field. It's trying because I wanted to ask a question, but um, shall we say another speaker meant that we ran out of time on that section. It didn't strike me that this was actually going to be very difficult to collect. Mm. It no. sounded like one, one more question. Yes, yeah, it sounded like an easy ask, and I think yeah. it would be great to to get the police involved early while they're still at this point of yes, you know, this is this is this is going to be straightforward for us to do. We're keen to do it. We want to be part of the part of the solution in resolving this problem. Um, the thing he didn't, no one seemed to touch on except me was fraud. No. I'm in trouble with the economic crime, it's dealt with by City of London Police, which is, is a mystery to all of us. Um, and um, he, he, if the connection between fraud and, and gambling is, is well known. But um, I mean, if someone picked up for, for fraud, particularly in the workplace, that, that may again be caused. And again, that, that information is not known. So on that note, although you haven't had evidence about it, what 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 I can do within the report is to suggest that um, there is um, contact by the Nebulous Group um, with with um, the Shared Anti Fraud Service at the mm. County Council, because that might be that might be a source of data in terms of why why people are trying to trying to defraud local authorities. You know, there are multiple. It's, 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 it's only, I mean, the, the thing is, you, you, you're short of money. So what you start doing is teaming and lading, which is the classic, the most classic fraud of them all, uh, which which is where you divert, divert money from a debtor into your account. And then you cover it up by diverting money from the next debtor into the account from which you diverted it. It keeps moving. Um, that's why you can't go on holiday. Because if someone comes along and says well, none of these things match, but it all sort of makes sense, that means that that fraud has been committed. It, it, it is a bit of a classic. Um, so that's sort of desperate. I mean, and it's and it's seen um, uh, by those who need to justify it to themselves that this is actually just you know tidying me over, borrowing, and I will pay it back eventually. But of course, that never happens. So I'll include that. And then one of the other um, data sources that I think you, you also mentioned, Chris, was um, the trends from coroner's reports, you know, in terms of understanding the, the link between if they've been um, somebody's taken their life and whether, whether yeah. when, the, when the coroner is in, investigated that, whether there is a linkage to um, to 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 gambling there. Um, moving on, you had another input from Gam. Gamcare, who talked about the project, which was obviously very closely modelled on the one uh, at Cheshire, um, but 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 this time took place in Hertfordshire. Again, um, talking about a whole system approach, um, using a screening tool. And what I thought was interesting with that one was actually one single question be, being asked on multiple occasions at different junctures. And I think it is that um, point where people aren't willing to talk to me about that, but they might be willing to talk to you about it, or they might be willing to talk to another representative uh, 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 to disclose that information. So I think that that was something that I think would would be worth putting in the report. Um, there was learning from the report, and I again I thought well quite an interesting example about financial harm issue that you know we we'd heard in the morning about the you know the, the terrible plight that people find themselves in you know being stigmatized not wanting to disclose that they can't pay their rent they can't pay the food bill they might be losing the house and then you've got um criminals who kind of are walking around with money falling out of their pockets and losing a thousand pounds is 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 nothing to them they they're not stopping financial harm but i just thought that was quite an interesting um take take on that uh, I also thought an observation that, again, other people had talked about was that the activity is normalised. There's an acceptance of that. We've all heard that today. But less normalised is actually the um, ability to reach out and ask for help or to say, I've got a problem. That's not normalised. And that's that's a, a very odd um, a, a way of setting things up. Um, 
Citizens Advice talked about screening, saying it was much easier to have those kinds of conversations face to face. I think we're all aware of that, but actually a virtual environment might mean that somebody is more willing to disclose that because they're not in, you know, they might be able to go and take that call away from other members of the family or their friends or etc. So there's pros and cons to um, face to face and um, virtual approaches to that. Um, Hearts for Learning talked about the support that they can provide for schools and that's governors, parents and school staff. Um, and that the statutory guidance is there to help because there's a strong evidence, um, strong, sorry, strong emphasis on well, well, the well-being agenda. But I think Steve made the point that you know this this can often be quite low down on people's agenda. So I think that this, from a um, uh, school's perspective, may be a slow burn until um, there there is a, a directive from central government or Ofsted to to pick up on that. And again, uh, Chris, I, I, I thought your parental denial was was an important one because I think that um, you know we, we've already talked about the the big win at an early point in somebody's life in the family, parents not denying or or not necessarily knowing where to go for support on uh, for for some of these issues. But there's also the shielding issue, as yeah. we shield them from all sorts of things, but this is regarded as okay. Yeah. Um. I had got that, Chris. I was going to. I was going to mention yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, again, it's changed. I mean, it was it was absolutely okay to smoke in front of your kids and and be in the same room as them. That was normal, just one generation ago. Mm. And then Daniel had an awful lot to share, and I think he did brilliantly to to cover the amount of detail that he did, because um, I think he gave 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 a real overview of where the legislation sits and what um, local authorities can and can't do but I, I think he also talked about where he could see um, improvements being made and, and he came up with some quite I thought thoughtful um, instances of how how to move it forward um, so I, you know his view was we can't change the licensing legislation but um, there is something in the in the statement of principles to add public health it's updated every three years so there's a regular review of that and by bringing data together from different agencies, it can strengthen those principles and um, improve them so that they are more effective and more individualised to reflect the community that that licensing uh, committee um, is going to be is going to be working with. Um, talked about, you know, again, emphasise limited information, need for greater in engagement. And I think there does seem to be, from what you've heard today from witnesses, is, you know, a real willingness to actually, there is a problem there, we all need to get together. It's just, it's just needing yeah, some no, no catalyst yeah. to bring yeah. that together. Um, and he talked about um, something similar to PubWatch, where you bring uh, the, the betting establishment uh, managers together to say, OK, we've got this problem person, let's make sure they don't get access to, 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 to you. And then Steve talked about something which was, that's trying to ban the people who are problematic. But then Steve was talking about something quite similar, Steve Watts from GAMFAM, about where people are trying to manage their addiction and uh, behaviour by self um, uh, excluding themselves from shops. Um, but that there isn't a, a way of doing that at the moment. And it just struck me that what they were both talking about could be two sides of the same coin, one to get rid of the nasties and one to protect people who are trying to, um, you know, to sort themselves out. Well, we um, don't do that with alcohol either. Think about it. OK. Think about it. I mean, you know, so you, this, you, this could be a break, then you can go into an off licence and uh, buy a bottle of whiskey and then you're done. You know, you're, 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 you're uh, off the wagon or on the wagon, whichever the expression is, and and because uh, um, that, that's, that's the nature of alcoholism is that uh, once you've um, tasted the tasted the, the the blessed spirit again, then then you, 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 all all the progress made is gone. Mm. Uh, so there is a general issue here. Yeah, and and it, I, don't, I don't know, Chris. I mean, it could could it be that if it was trialed in for gambling, um, and it was you know it seemed to be a successful model, is that something that? Well, yeah look at uh, that so you, you know you might be a bit of a leader on that one then group um 
Absolutely. Uh, Steve then talked about decision makers uh, being fully informed, but also using up to date information that even surveys and research that are five years old are not necessarily reflective of, um, you know, where where gambling is now and the explosion of online gambling over the pandemic period. You know, it all needs to be a lot more recent, say, information that people are um, are working on and need to show your children. So. Um, based on that, um, then just going back to those areas that um, I identified after lunch, which were raising awareness, BME engagement, data, funding and multi-agency. It struck me that raising awareness, um, that was about um, um, provide, you know, signposting so people knew what help was available, how they might access it, making it much clearer and easier to, to access. Um, and making and I did mention as well uh, after lunch about raising awareness among frontline staff so that they can kind of have in mind those key questions, those key behaviour indicators that might suggest that all is not well in that area. Um, and, uh, you know, to help destigmatisation. But it also struck me from the afternoon's conversation that it, it is raising awareness, not just among frontline staff um, on the job. It's also among professionals. So that's among the NHS colleagues, it's teachers, etc. cetera. Um, because, again, if they're aware of that, they can work with said individuals or make sure that their service design is reflective of that need. But also um, um, just putting that in front of them is what that agency, what that individual can do um, by making them aware. Because I think there was a sense today was like I've learned a lot by just sitting in and listening to the people that I wasn't aware of. And I can now take this back and use it with with um, with 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 my own uh, organization and and you got um, stuff there from um, the ICS about the pathways uh, that HPFT were talking about raising awareness among parents from HFL GAMCARE talked a lot about that as well um, and and Chris talked about raising awareness um, individually then BME engagement didn't come up again this afternoon but I think you'd actually got the content of what you wanted for that within this morning's presentation. Oh, I don't know. I think it did because it came up with Dr. Magon, didn't it? It did. You're right. And he confirmed everything we've been told by um, uh, the speaker this morning, who was Ronnie. Yeah. He brought it up. He brought it up a lot, and the stats are horrendous. Yeah. They're absolutely yeah. dreadful. Yeah. I hadn't realised. So uh, if, if you want to go ahead with that as an area, I'll make sure I that think, I think we should really there. should. It was very, yeah. very stark. Yeah. And then the other area that I think uh, was uh, reiterated this afternoon was around data accuracy, early identification. But then you got a lot more stuff about, you know, having a data system, which is what Jim and David were talking about. The constabulary talking about how they can flex what they're doing to provide that. you got screening comments from a number of contributors, HPFT, Citizens Advice Police again, GAMCARE, coroners as a, as a route of information um, and data from districts. Um, and I've got there the links to um, BME in terms of uh, understanding what communities um, needs are and how they might be approached on a more individual basis because you've got a decent set of data on which to mm. engage with them rather than just some rather bland thing or that they have to pick up um, with um, with just the same service. Um, there was also, yeah, the need to tailor. And then the the, four, the fifth area, I'm skipping one, um, is around multi-agency. And that's been implicit throughout the day that everybody's yeah. been saying, we've got a bit of information, we could possibly get more, but actually what do we do with it if we gather this information? Okay. And I think that at the moment there's a sense that what is the point of gathering the information? Because what you know, there's, there's no end product to it. Whereas I think what's emerged today is actually a sense that actually if all that was put on the table in one place, everybody could draw from that that would actually improve their own service delivery but also contribute to a much more cohesive approach in the county so my sense on that um, is that those are the possibly the four areas for your recommendations i think the one that kind of hasn't formulated as much information around it to generate a recommendation but could well be a conclusion is the funding thing because all the other things i've talked about the this area can do quite a lot to progress that the funding thing other than exhorting morris to go and bang on a few ministers doors is is, is going to be a more difficult ask 
And one last thing before I stop is including within the multi-agency, I've just spotted my note, is around um, industry and uh, its pervasiveness and yeah. how yeah. that can sometimes inhibit um, the, 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 the strategies going forward. So I will now be quiet. A couple of things. First of all, I think the context, when I asked Jim about the 35,000, uh, check that figure, um, this is not a minor issue. Uh, and the comparison, I think, with HIV was 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 exactly what I was after. Mm. Um, and that also was picked up, if you remember, with Kate uh, as to the significance of the issue in relation to shielding children from harm. So I think the context is possibly, you know, in, in a super early paragraph saying this is actually not niche. There are niche aspects of it. The BAME is very niche yeah. uh, and needs targeting, but it's not niche. Uh, the second um, question I, I, I tried to get an answer of, and perhaps I wasn't direct enough, is knowing when you've got a problem. Um, and it, it goes back to, uh, re, you know, where you can get help, but most people don't think they've got a problem. Uh, and, it's, it, and again, it's quite an odd one. I mean, for cigarettes and, and, and drugs, you've got a problem if you're doing it at all, really. Um, um, but that problem, particularly for cigarettes, is, is, is up, up to a certain point. Uh, with alcohol, uh, there are certain tests, and, and, and I remember doing a, an online consultation, and I was absolutely astonished by the questions I was being asked, uh, just to put on file, is, you know, have you had an experience where you couldn't actually remember what you did the night before, have you ever woken up sort of somewhere where you wouldn't expect to, and that sort of thing, you know, way, it was a way down the track in terms of quite advanced alcoholism, which actually is wrong. <laughs> um, alcohol harm is at a much lower level. Um, and I'm wondering whether, again, with gambling, people don't know they've got a problem until it's too late. Yeah, so hidden. Yeah. Do you have a problem if you just did the national lottery? Or oh, probably not. Do you have a problem if you're putting 50 quid on the national lottery each week? Yeah, you do. Um, so uh, um, I, I, I never got an answer as to when you should worry. Yeah. That's I, I think I can guess, but it's me guessing as a layperson. Yeah. So I think that, that that's what needs to be in the leaflets and everything that I think we're essentially proposing should be going out everywhere. Yeah, it's the hidden addiction. Mm. And it's the fact the key point that a lot of people say is a lot of people still don't know that there's treatment and help exists, although we haven't got enough. But, you know, and that mm. needs to be getting there. A lot of people were saying, oh, yeah, but it's they just don't know where to go. Well, so it's Chris's point about when when does it get to be the problem but also yeah, a lot of people don't know the, a lot of people still say oh there isn't anything really for you know but we, we know now there is well you know if we didn't know before that there is help out there it's getting it out to people I yeah, agree. Big, people are losing their houses and their cars i mean that's yeah. just terrorizing isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry yeah, I'm, not, I'm sorry I, i'm not being funny but if there's a, a smoking issue we know there's um help available through smoking sensation etc we know drug alcohol we cater for that, but we don't cater for anything to do with gambling. Now, clearly there's a big problem coming up through the ranks with the younger people. Excuse me, I'll take that again. Sorry. No, oh, right. <laughs> Anyone else any comments while waiting? Okay. I've just got a couple of things that um, have uh, I've raised. Oh, do you want to carry on with D first and then I'll come back? I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, it's like everyone knows you're in a meeting, so the phone constantly goes. Um, <laughs> uh, what I was going to say was um, it, it's like with younger people, clearly there is now a bigger problem, but I think it, the, the issue is signposting, trying to talk about it in public mm. engagement and um, communication, not just with the schools, the teachers, the governors, and the parents. But with the younger people and probably, you know, all the ordinary people, the you know, the people that fall in the middle of the road, you know, um, it's get, it's getting public, it's raising public awareness and raising the bar that, you know, someone will help them and they signpost them. What do you do? Do you go to the GP? Now, we know at the moment it's you, you can't get GPs appointments for love nor money. Uh, is a GP going to give you 10 minutes of their time on the phone and get down to the nitty gritty bit? I don't know. But clearly we need we need to um, make sure well, get the help and attention that they need. Do GPs have the skills at all? I agree with you there, Chris. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, and they're the same position of the police, aren't they? This, this, this is, but what we're suffering from here is is a perception issue. You go back 50 years, uh, smoking was an excellent thing to do. It was sociable. It was what a, what a man did and so forth. We've moved a heck of a way from that. Drinking and driving was uh, certainly acceptable before the war and probably into the 50s. Uh, it's only recently that we've realised that gambling is an issue at all, as opposed to something that a gentleman does at the horse races or a granddad does uh, as part of his Saturday morning trip into town. And I think that's that's why the GPs are not on top of it, why the police have not been on top of it, because it hasn't just hasn't registered as a problem. Yeah. But clearly we've identified a problem, so now we've got to find a solution to a problem. Yes, we do. And that, that is partly an awful lot of this is screening, isn't it? I think that came yeah. up in one phrase or another in, in a number of witnesses. You've got someone presenting as depressed to a GP. One of the questions is, I don't know, you know, um, but one of the questions ought to be, yeah, do you have money worries? And is that caused by gambling? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, definitely a good way forward, Chris. I agree. So, um, Natalie, what do we do now? Do we uh, are you, uh, need through? to agree the recommendations? I think sorry, Jan. I oh, sorry, Jan. Through? Yeah, sorry, I'd forgotten. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just had a couple of sort of observations yeah. that I made through the day. Um, the, the the thing about self exclusion in the um, uh, in betting shops, I I, I don't. I don't know how aware everyone else is about this, but um, by the way, these are not directly related questions, but these are just observation, you know, things I've been thinking about as we've gone through the day. Um, online, um, you can you can self-exclude. So you can contact a company and get yourself banned from that company and other companies. Um, and I know a couple of young adults right. have done that. Um, which is very helpful. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, six months later, they decide they don't have a problem after all. So they try and get that undone and they can't get it undone, which is really good. They can't. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, they can't. Um, and then they get their friends to yeah. put their bets on for them. So you know, there's always a way around it, of course. But um, I, I just wonder whether we could, um, whether there's a way that we can lobby government on the um, regarding online gambling. Again, I, I don't know if any of you have any involvement with online gambling, but um, you could the, the bet, places like Bet365 and Skybet, they mm. literally um, they give they give the the well, it's not only youngsters obviously because they don't really know how old people are, but it's, this is becoming something I think that youngsters are doing more and more and more. Every single one of my son's friends has online betting accounts. I, d I don't know any that don't anymore. And um, my boys are very intelligent um, and they they get these five pound bets from uh, from the online companies like they, they put five pounds in their account. And then what they do, they go and they gamble it and they win a bit of money and then then mm -hmm. they put more money on. And it, it's a it's a very, very slippery slope. And I'm oh, I'm yes. worried more about online than anything else. Um, I appreciate that there's so much less that we can do as an authority with online gambling other than perhaps lobby um, our MPs, lobby the government mm -hmm. to try and do something about regulating it with these free bets and things like that because it's yeah. very, very dangerous. I, um, I, think, I think we should have lobbying because uh, the fix yeah. betting terminals outrage. I mean, it was, it, it was astonishing that, that we got to that position. And there was doubt as to whether, in fact, it would be reduced to two pounds, wasn't there? Which some of you may recall, mm. finally did happen, and has saved a huge amounts. So we shouldn't be afraid of lobbying. No, absolutely. And, and the only other thing that, that has occurred to me as we've gone through the day, and we're talking about, um, uh, and Doug Black talked about it about the right questions being asked when they're interviewing people. Yeah. Now, um, eleven years ago, I did a topic group. Um, with uh, drunk uh, alcohol related drunken disorder uh, alcohol related climate disorder in uh, when we did a site visit to Watford um, on a Friday night it was absolutely the most brilliant topic group 
Um, but part of that, we ended up at two o'clock in the morning in Watford General Hospital in the A&E department. And there was this amazing young woman called Gemma, who, whose job was to interview anyone who came in the door with a um, with an, any kind of injury into A&E um, on a Friday and a Saturday night where they suspected it was alcohol um related or drug related but um, particularly alcohol and she um was very highly sort of qualified and skilled in interviewing um and talking to them and supporting them and signposting them um and continuing to support them and almost mentor them i believe in in getting help and support for that now if that kind of service is still going is is this something that could be added to it because it as, as we found out today, when people have, um, you know, if they've got uh, drug and alcohol issues, it's very often because of gambling. So it, it's just a, could we add, get that service to also add that question in to to the work that they're doing? It's just thinking like that. They might not even do that anymore, but it was such a great, great initiative. Okay. That's just my thoughts. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Screening everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Okay, have we got anything more? What do we do now, Natalie? Do we need to agree uh, painfully word by word the recommendations? Can I just I, one thing quickly? I also think that the big problem here is advertising, advertising on the telly, um, advertising sports clubs, etc. And I, I don't think that's helpful to the course, to be honest. Mm. No, I mean, picked up. It's quite difficult to disrupt. I think there's a number of our witnesses agreed. Uh, I mean, yeah, it should be allowed. We wouldn't allow tobacco advertising on telly. It used to be yeah. there. Yeah. You know, and we can still recite the Hamlet ads, can't we? Remember those? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it wouldn't happen now. Yeah. Uh, so, Natalie. So, uh, I'd rather you didn't painfully agree uh, the word to every, uh, every recommendation, because I think um, that will take up uh, the next 24 hours, probably. Um, it's whether you are content as a group. I was um, to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's whether you're content as a group that those are the four key areas. So raising awareness, the BME uh, aspect of it, the stuff, all the stuff around data and the multi-agency that would pick up that kind of creation of a group and a strategy, which would actually be picking up basically the, you'd, you'd be handing the responsibility for the delivery of the recommendations to basically Jim, I think would be the, uh, the, the owner of these. So it's whether you're content with that and the uh, the, the information that I, I shared um, just a little while ago, plus some of the other bits and pieces that you've um, contributed now. And then Chris and I will get the words tidied up yep. and then the report will be, um, each recommendation will have all, all the evidence sitting underneath it where you've heard from the police or GAM mm. care or whoever it might be in terms of how you've arrived at that recommendation. So there's a very clear line and then any of the agencies that are referred to, even if it's not the witnesses that have attended today, can see why that recommendation was mm. made and actually it was based on the contribution and aspiration of that organisation because we know how things get passed between pillar to post in big organisations so it mm. might not land on the desk of Doug for instance um, you know it might end up with well, somebody else. Do, do we need to, to require a structured approach though do we need a body a Hertfordshire body which brings it all together is that part of our recommendations? Yeah. I think I was going to include that within the multi agency. I thought you might do, it's just how structured we want to be. Yeah, I, said, it, yeah. I think I think that, yeah. that saying to everybody, oh, you all need to work together. Well, they all know that. They need something silly. that's yeah. going to yeah. bring them together. So the multi agency would be everybody needs to work together, A, to develop a group that's representative of the stakeholders that have been part of yeah. today's scrutiny. Um, and actually the, the outcome of that would be um, a strategy on that yeah. score. And that and comes it's, to, on, Jan. Sorry, Nigel, now after you. No, I say it comes together for this thing about the fifth licensing objective as well, like all about working the 10 districts and the their licensing officers working together. I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll be pleased with that as well, yeah. So Chris and I will work on the words um, and then I'll pull together the draft report, which obviously you will get before it goes anywhere for comments so that if there's something that's missing or you think the emphasis is wrong, 
anything that doesn't uh, link to one of those key areas that I've talked about, but is obviously something that you have been concerned about, that's what I'll include in the conclusion section so it won't get lost. It's just that sometimes we haven't got enough information, we haven't got enough data ourselves to actually say very clearly that that is a recommendation that you as a topic group would want to put forward. OK, so that's that's the way forward. Well, la lastly, Jan, and then I just want to get your agreement on this, colleagues. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say that the, um, the multi-agency um, thing, um, if we could, um, if that's going to be in the form of like forming a group, um, like we did after the um, the veterans one where we formed a group which was a multi-agency group and we met once a quarter um, to, to look at what we were doing and how we're getting on and progressing it to, to, which really ensured that it didn't get lost um, and I just wondered if we do something like that um, would we have an opportunity to sit on that group? I think not actually because that's not how these things are done is it normally? Yeah. Well it was when we did the, that, yeah. the whole point of me asking the question was when yeah. we did the military one, it was. We that's were very unusual, it. actually, and that's because it was um, it was not so technical. This this would be one of the technical groups that, okay. that which which are a lot, there are loads of these, aren't there, for officers across the county? Okay. Uh, I, I mean, well, I think just, like on, just on just on John's point, and I know that um, we've we've had sort of um, um, just touched on this um, with Chris and with 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 Dee, I think, as well is. I think you you might want to take a view as to whether you think that um, actually you're content with the outcome of today and it's job done, let, let everybody get on with it, or whether you think that this um, would merit further, may, maybe a full blown scrutiny like this or a, a lighter touch um, down the line, you know, 18 months, two years. Oh, down. no, it'll be report, it'll report health scrutiny committee, wouldn't it? Mm. A bit like you get a report from West Arts Hospital Trust. Mm. Uh, and so I, so I can, the committee. Yeah. So what I'll do then, um, topic group, is I'll include something around that so that it's actually very clear that the topic group are saying, here are the recommendations, get on and do it. But we do expect um, these updates periodically yeah, um, to, to yeah. her scrutiny. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Is that agreed, colleagues? Yes, I'm happy with that. Everyone yeah. with everything that Lat is proposing as the way forward. We will be back in touch with the wording once yeah. Lat has crafted it. And uh, thanks for being chairing today, uh, Chris. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> really good. Thanks for all your contributions and questions. Really right. Good, well, guys. enjoy what's left of your day. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Some of us have got to go on to a big planning meeting next. Oh, I've got I've got yeah. meeting later on. I've yeah. got DC as well. Yeah. I've got uni. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, everybody.